practicing your mastery is to look at our potential and to begin moving into it in all the different ways that are possible, which also, of course, in alignment with what you said, in my understanding, is that we've got to wrap in that experiential wisdom with the intellectual knowledge. Without putting that really at the forefront, we're just going to keep spinning around. But I had a, get, um, a teacher, Robert Greene, he's an author, and he um, sp- you know, spoke about the mastery. His whole book is on mastery. And he said he really wanted people to understand about you know, when you have that inkling of what you feel passionate toward, don't just walk away from it. You know, and what I hear you just did is you straddled the boat because, like you said, you had to pay for your family, but you still opened the door to the other work that you were passionate about. And it's given you the extraordinary life that you've lived and the information that you've brought to light that no one else has in the way that you have. I, I think that's, that's true, and you have nailed it pretty well. I, I think this is one of the weaknesses of our present educational system. It's focused very much on mm, plowing over knowledge, um, having a channel of communication which is mainly knowledge-based, and there is almost no experiential development of self. I think that a properly balanced society would divide the time between experiential development of self and the infusion of knowledge uh, to build into the organism of the human being so that the human then can develop and plumb the deeper depths of reality. At the moment, our orthodox science, well, let me go back one step. I like to look at a picture of nature as it unfolds, as we need to build a ladder of understanding, which goes from sort of where we are at any point in time and the higher and higher levels of reality. And the orthodox science community, which began this path called the Logos path or the science path, um, about 500 years ago, uh, in the days of Galileo and Kepler and Newton uh, and Copernicus, of course, And that was the transition from a theocratic society to the beginning of scientific society. And the key reference frame for studying nature was distance and time. And we have done that for the last 400 years, basically. And we've been very successful. But the dilemma is that science and thereby medicine have taken the attitude that it was a distance time only reference frame and that everything in nature the expressions of nature had to fit into that reference frame which the work that I've been doing on the side for these last 42 or more years um, shows that that is not correct and that there are there's huge new physics to be sought out for adventure. Uh, right. Is this what you did with your um, with the white paper research and everything on the mythos and logos? Yes, basically that's, that's it. Ultimately, we'll get to the place where mythos and logos will unite. I mean, mythos is looking inward for knowledge. Logos is looking outwards for knowledge. We are well... We have reached the bottommost rung of the ladder. We've completed the bottommost rung of the ladder, and we are now reaching for the second rung. It's taken us 400 years to fill in the bottommost rung of the ladder, which is the distance time reference frame, and the science and medicine that we know are really all tied to that. But the next rung of the ladder deals very much with what we would call the physics of the physical vacuum, where the domains of substance that function there all seem to go faster than light, and none of our instrumentation can perceive that information. 
Yes, I want to go deeper into that because this is some of the this is some of the most important um, information that I have um, gathered from you that I think it's really really important for people to understand. But before we go there, I, I just want to go back for a moment, and if you could give me just the simplest explanation of mythos and logos, what do those two words mean? Stand for? Well, mythos is generally thought of as the mystical path, um, but in fact, it's the inner path. Um, let's say examples of mythos would be the, those we would call Christs who were uh, teaching us. We start with Krishna. We could go to uh, Melchizedek. We could go to Moses. We could go to Lutzal. We could go to Confucius, we could go to Buddha, mm -hmm. we could go to mm -hmm. Jesus, we could go to Mohammed, we could go to Abdul Baha, and many others. These right. are elder brothers for us who have walked the path and shown us the way. That, that basically is the mythos path. The logos path is the path of science. Um, the previous paradigm was an, uh, basically those the theocrats they had a particular vision or version of nature which they followed and they thought they knew everything because they thought they knew everything they wouldn't look through uh, Galileo's telescope uh, because if they had they surely would then find what mistake they were making and their prime mistake was, of course, that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth. That's kind of egocentric, um, but it was the paradigm of the time. And science very quickly showed, uh, through that work of Galileo and Kepler and Copernicus, uh, Copernicus, of course, didn't reveal it, or did, had made sure it wasn't revealed till after he was it passed on, uh, because otherwise he would probably be burned at the stake for being a heretic. Being a heretic. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. interesting word, isn't it? It shows up again. It is an interesting word. Fortunately, in today's uh, world, we no longer burn heretics at the stake. But you do. They do take laboratory space. We do mock them. You, you, you. They do make it difficult for you to get research support. They won't yeah. publish certain papers that you would like right. to have published in major journals because they say, oh, our readership is not interested in this kind of material. That's right. The, so, I mean, it is the way it is. So the Yeah, and it is the consciousness. It is the consciousness of those who aren't ready. You know, and in that same way, um, sure. you know, what I what it called me to think about on a very, you know, simplistic level in a sense is like uh, Orville, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Yeah, well, People said they, they were completely loony, you know, with their ideas. And yet they, you know, if they didn't, you know, push the envelope, we probably wouldn't be still flying around today. So it seems that those who are the head of the curve, you know, and I would say that a lot of people listening here have experienced that in their own lives, that they have found that when they get insight and they want to share it with others that depending on who you're sharing it with you could get a blank stare <laughs> or you know that there's still you know not that wide of an opening and yet it is changing all the time The unstated assumption since the days of Descartes by orthodox science has been that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment of physical reality. We imprinted consciousness into a little electronic box. Wow. And then we used the electronic box. We switched it on in a space where we were gathering background data, experimental data, and it had a specific intention. We did it from a deep meditative state, four people. We have an unimprinted device, an imprinted device, 
Um, we can separate them by 100 meters, turn them off electrically, and in three to five days, the unimprinted device picked up the imprint. Okay? And, and it could influence an experiment just the way this other one could. But boxes were off electrically. So there was no information transfer via electromagnetic radiation that we know of. Right. Right. So therefore... Therefore, there has to be another communication channel in the universe that orthodox science is not aware of. For the past 30 years, he has been pursuing serious experimental and theoretical study of the field of psychoenergetics, which he thinks is a very important part of tomorrow's physics. This is a whole new arena, and he's published over 100 scientific papers and two seminal books. With our prompting, and that's Robin and Cody's prompting, Bill has engaged the orb phenomena and will be lending to us the benefits of his research into both the physical and metaphysical aspects. He was a featured scientist in the film, What the Bleep Do We Know? And following uh, his presentation, he will be doing a book signing at the ARC and um, at the ARC bookstore in the next room. And there's a lot of other great authors there at that bookstore. So thank you very much. We we'll welcome William Tiller. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here uh, with you. And thank you very much, Lane. Um, oh, OK, I'll just use this. Good. Um, minor correction. The, in my conventional science, I have published about 260 scientific papers and three books. And in this new area, um, it's now about 150 scientific papers and three books out and the fourth one uh, showing in the bookstore, which will be, it's just being printed now, it'll be available in a month. So, orbs, are they a psychoenergetic phenomenon? And the thing that I find interesting is that if I look, if you look at the background picture, what you would see is, um, yeah, I am going to need a pointer. Um, oh, it's here. Pardon me. Uh, that's pretty fast, indeed. Right. All I have to do is figure out how I'm going to work it. Oh, it's that end. Right. Yes. The what you this. This model that I'll be, you know, you're not going to get very much of it because there isn't time. But the theoretical model I use to quantitatively assess these class of phenomena is something I call a duplex space, the two reciprocal four spaces, one of which is space-time, and its conjugate uh, is, a, is a basically a frequency domain. And so, because of the mathematical connections between such things, if you have a quality in direct space, as space-time, then you can calculate, in principle, a, uh, the conjugate equilibrium quality in the reciprocal space-time. So basically, I decided to do the situation with a series of gold dots in a spiral form in our direct space-time, and then calculated all this stuff in the background which is in the reciprocal space-time, an unseen domain for most of us. And it looks remarkably like some of the orbs that we have been talking about. So we'll get to that. Anyway, the thing you need to know is my personal bias as I enter this. It's always sort of been there. To me, we are all spirits having a physical experience as we walk the river of life together, or we ride the river of life together. Our spiritual parents dressed us in these bio body suits and put us in this playpen that we call a universe in order to grow in coherence, in order to develop our gifts of intentionality, and in order to become what we were intended to become, which is co-creators with our spiritual parents.
It's a very long path, but it's a very interesting path, and you will not be bored. So, so don't think of instant mm, manifestation of all these wonderful things that you will eventually all manifest and eventually all go through the same process. As you choose, it's free will. There's no growth without free will. Okay, the second thing I want to say, I was asked to speak at this conference by Robin and Cody, not because I had done great experimental work in the orbs, I haven't. I don't even, I don't even use a camera, and I don't use a computer. Others do it for me. My wife gets um, unhappy with me at times because I don't take pictures, but that's the way it is, so. <laughs> However, Jean and I have been walking this path for, well, we'll be 55 years married next month. And, and she has been my very valuable partner on the path. Not because she's scientific, but because she's loving and compassionate and she puts up with my crap. <laughs> but we've had a lot of experience of unseen domains as well as seen domains. And my science has tried to bridge these two. My goal in this lifetime is to build a reliable bridge of understanding that seamlessly joins with conventional science that we've learned over the last 400 years and bridges, passes through the subtle domains, the domains of psychic phenomena, it's also a forest of great entanglement of psychic phenomena, into, the, into and through the domains of emotion and mind and becomes firmly locked in the bedrock of spirit at the other end. And the goal is to build this bridge reliably and in a structurally sound way so that all of our family will want to walk across that bridge. So that's, that's my purpose. Um, basically, I'm going to break the talk at three points. It'll be the one at the last and I'll open it for questions and answers for five minutes only each time and I would ask you to be that your questions be relevant to the material and that they be concise because we, I don't have enough time as is um, and if that if you cannot follow that I will have to not allow any questions so be warned okay first thing is what is what is psychoenergetic science, all right? Traditional science is the place to start, and the metaphorical reaction equation for traditional science is this mass with arrows back and forth to energy, with the connecting link being Einstein, the main one, there are many, but the connecting link is Einstein's E equals MC squared. For the last 400 years, traditional science has basically, all of the things we've done can be somehow put into this equation in at least a qualitative way. And the unstated assumption of this since the days of Descartes have been that no human quality of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. Now, there has been abundant data for the last 150 years, practically, that there is something going on beyond this, okay? Um, the experiments that we've done show that in the vernacular of my Russian friend, it's Bolshitsky. But, but it, has, it has served a very useful purpose 
it has used, it served a very useful purpose. And for the last 400 years, using that unstated assumption, they have, the scientific community has structurally built the lowest rung of the ladder of understanding. The work I will talk to you about, about a little bit, is the second rung of the same ladder. And as we move forward, as we ride the river of life, um, through epochs yet to come, the various rungs of these ladders will be built and be built reliably and quantitatively by perhaps many of you in a future lifetime. So it's important to understand the perspective. I mean, this work was good work, okay? But because the phenomena we're talking about could not be understand, understood within the model that's presently used by traditional science, it's been more comfortable for the scientific community to sweep things under the rug, very much as the priests did in Galileo's time. They would not look through the telescope at the data. It's a very human thing, okay? So I'm saying that our present science is wonderful and inadequate to go forward, all right? So the psychoenergetic science, I think, is the next step. And the next step, in fact, is to take this starting metaphorical equation and add consciousness to it. All right? Now, the, our dictionaries have a definition of consciousness, meaning awareness, awakeness, so on. It's very, very small in, in that perspective. I think consciousness is much, much more. It's on par with these in terms of being something unique in the universe. My own personal definition is, my working hypothesis, let us put it that way, is that consciousness is a byproduct of spirit entering dense matter. And as we build ourselves to build infrastructure into the many layers of ourselves, now spirit can attach. And as spirit attaches, we become more conscious. And as we become more conscious, we see things and understand things that we never could see and understand before. And so this bootstrap process goes on. Self-building, more spirit enters, more conscious do we become, more do we see what is behind us, with us, and ahead of us, and so we go forward. Now, oh, I should go back one step, because basically, so I'm asking you, not so much to ask what consciousness is. You know, if you ask the question, what's an electron? We don't know the answer to that one either. What is space? We don't know. What is time? We don't know. So the issue is, instead of asking what consciousness is, let us ask what consciousness does. And as soon as you do that, you begin to see, oh, consciousness manipulates information. Whether we're talking about a, a sum of numbers or multiplication of numbers and so on, the manipulation of numbers, or whether we're taking alphabetical letters and assembling them into words and into sentences, um, and we see that information in those sentences, whether it's a set of symbols that a mathematician puts together to make a grand equation, like Einstein's E equals MC squared. There's huge information content in those things. And if you're like myself and my wife on a on a Sunday where it's kind of drab and dull, we pull out a table and, and get a jigsaw puzzle and put it on the table and start assembling some beautiful picture. So it's all the creation of information. So, and now let me describe why information is the important connecting link here. The, We have found, we've known for the last 60 years, since the days of Shannon and Brewan, that if there is an, in a process in nature, if there's an information increase, then what that means is that there is a decrease in entropy. There's a decrease in disorder in the universe. And if there's a decrease in disorder, it means you're restoring potential to the universe. 
It means that there's not going to be a cold death to the universe as people have thought because the potential once you create information okay in our lives in our processes then we get this quantity called a change in the entropy so that instead of entropy increasing in all processes in nature those that generate information the entropy actually decreases because you're making more order and it turns out that this change in information is a negative change in the entropy. It's given by Boltzmann constant and times the logarithm of the ratio P0 to P1, where P is the number of microscopic distinguishable states in the system. Okay, it's all complex mathematical googly wook. But nonetheless, it's very meaningful because it allows you to get to numbers. All right? And, and it becomes quantitative and therefore becomes very, very useful. Actually, you see, it isn't energy that drives the processes in nature. It is the, we've known for 150 years, it's the, ma the master, it's the thermodynamic free energy potential. So we've known this, the master potential is a function. It turns out it's in one of the great uh, men of the last uh, two centuries ago is Gibbs, Willard Gibbs and another Helmholtz. And they have, here's a representation of Gibbs this is energy, this is pressure times volume, minus temperature times entropy. So we see that in this equation, entropy is on par, when you take the temperature into account, on par with energy. So you can begin to see now why information is the appropriate next term in this expanding function. I'll just drop it in. In my view, the term beyond consciousness actually is love. That's the creative force. So, but we won't get into that today. Um, so the point is that in nature, processes can be driven by a change in the free energy. So long as in the process, the, we have a thermodynamic driving force from state one or state zero to state one, and it's greater than zero, then the process will occur. And so it can occur by changes of energy, changes of pressure, by changes of volume, by changes of temperature, or changes of entropy. And the analogy in your mind is think the following way. In the last century, physicists learned a tremendous amount about nature, fundamental particles in nature, by generating beams of particles and shooting them at targets which may be other beams going in the other direction. And there's huge explosion of, of new particles and stuff that they have to track. And out of looking at this fallout, they are able to learn a great deal about particle physics. All right, that's where we are now. And they went through that. But they really worked in this thermodynamic free energy. They worked the energy game. I'm saying now, as we come to the information aspect, and you go deep within yourself and in our processing we meditate and we imprint intentions into devices which then can make changes in the world. We, we can do likewise by going into ourselves and building infrastructure into ourselves, and then spirit enters etc. So that becomes information. So it's an entirely different way of trying to extract new knowledge of our world and other worlds. But it's, it's working on a different part. It's working on this S part rather than this E part. It's just another way of revealing things in nature, okay? Now, what we have done over the last mm, 10 years or more, um, we have we have looked at this unstated assumption and said, if it was ever right, you know, or wrong, it may be different now. And so now let's really check out this unstated assumption of science, that consciousness is not a meaningful experimental variable in our physical world. And so what we did is we designed four target experiments. The first one was to take the water of a particular kind, 
generally pure water was the easiest way to do it because you can purify it. Um, and the intention was to increase its pH, okay, in equilibrium with air with no chemical additions. And the intention was to increase it by one full pH unit. And our measurement accuracy was one one hundredth. So the intention was to have a result that was a hundred times the noise. That's a, you gotta have a lot of faith to do that. The second experiment was to take the same water and reduce the pH by one full pH unit. Okay, in equilibrium with air, no chemical additions. So up and down, same water, but, but a different intention, a different experiment. Um, and as you probably know, all biological organisms have an internal pH, um, well, at least in the blood. Um, but in our case, the stomach acids are very acidic. Other parts of the body are, are definitely not. So you have to be careful what pH you're talking about. But if you take the pH of blood and you increase it by a half a pH unit, you're probably dying or dead. If you decrease it a half a pH unit, you're probably dying or dead. So one pH unit is a lot, okay, for a biological system. And then the third target experiment was to take a particular liver enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, in vitro, and to, the intention was to raise its thermodynamic activity by just being exposed to, we'll call it a conditioned space, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, for 30 minutes. Um, and then it's analyzed. And then the fourth is to take a living system, an in vivo study of fruit fly larva, to, and the intention was to increase the energy storage molecule, ATP, in the cells of fruit fly larva, uh, compared to its chemical precursor, okay? And the fruit fly larva cells, the ATP and the ADP, the chemical precursor, are the same as in our, our body, okay? So, and the, and the idea behind that was that if you make the, uh, if you do that, then you make the larvae more fit. And if they're more fit, they'll have a shorter development time to the adult fly stage. All of these four experiments were done, and they were robustly successful. We um, increased, well, we, we did the pH of the water up, we did the pH of the water down, um, we did the uh, alkaline phosphatase, an increase of 25, 30% with an exposure of just 30 minutes to a conditioned space. And in the fruit fly larva, the increase of the ATP of the order of 20%, and we reduced the larval development time to the adult fly stage by 25%. And there appears to be a genetic carryover, which we're now studying, which is interesting. Now, how did we introduce the consciousness into the experiment, all right? We basically had, what we did is we took four meditators who sat around a table top and on the tabletop was a simple little low-tech electrical device. It contained a memory system, an EEPROM, and an oscillator uh, oscillating in the megahertz range, and a few, di a few diodes, a couple of capacitors and resistors, and a power supply, that's it. Um, and so we would plug the uh, energy converter into the wall socket and plug the, the converter into the uh, this device, which we'll call a UED, an unimprinted electrical device, and we would turn it on, and then the four of us would go into meditation. We would connect with each other and with the unseen, and we would mentally try to cleanse the territory of this tabletop and create a kind of sacred space, and when we felt that it was ready, um, one of us, usually me, uh, who had designed the imprint statement, I would state the imprint statement. And each of the members would hold it in their consciousness um, at that level of reality and would hold it for the timeline is the order of 15 minutes. And when I felt that the device was sort of cooked in a metaphorical sense, I would say, so be it, thy will be done. And Every, then all four would just release it, just let it go. And the, then there would be a subsidiary intention statement, 
which was designed to seal the primary imprint into the device so that it wouldn't mm, leak away so that we couldn't do experiments. And then we would usually do that twice, you know, just to be sure. Uh, the whole process for a particular one statement, one device, which we now called an IIED, Intention Imprinted Electrical Device. Um, we would do it twice. The total time would be maybe something like an hour to an hour and a half. Right? Um, and then what we would do, well, one of the things we learned very quickly is, when we did this is we would take an unimprinted device and an imprinted device, separate them by 100 meters, turn them off electrically, and see what happened. Well, they're off. There's no electrical energy in them, so there's no way they can communicate with each other, right? Wrong. <laughs> Within three to five days, the unimprinted device had picked up the imprint from the imprinted device, and we'd lost that control, which meant we really couldn't do any experiments that would make any sense. And I was having fits. And then I realized, wait a minute, there's another communication channel, information passage channel in the universe that we don't know anything about. Wow. So then one thought about, all right, how am I going to do experiments with this? And I reasoned that, all right, if, if indeed with it off electrically, somehow this communication is connected maybe with electrical, electromagnetic energy. So we wrapped it in aluminum foil to shut out any optical range of electromagnetic radiations. And we put it in an electrically grounded Faraday cage, which would basically screen out most of the gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz uh, frequencies. And we were stuck with a very low frequency range we couldn't do much about because in order to have a a Faraday cage that you could lift and move around, um, we had to live with that because it takes a heck of a lot of copper to go into that low range to really screen it. But we then found that by doing this, we could maintain the intention statement in the device for three to six months. Whew, we could do experiments now. And so the experiments were set up, in fact, in, in a laboratory in Minnesota, and they were running continuously to get baseline. And we imprinted the devices in the Palo Alto region of California, near Stanford. And when they were ready, we would wrap them in foil and do all this stuff. And then we would send them by FedEx, one day, not on, on separate days, to the laboratory in Minnesota. And they would just plug it into the wall and, and place the IIED close to the experimental apparatus. Could have been put anywhere in the room, but we thought, let's start with it close. And, and uh, then we got all these results. So that's the, that's the story there, and it says that at least at this point in time, if you do it at least the way that we did it, um, consciousness can be a very significant variable. And so what this boils down to is it looks like the following. If you're, if you're looking at, at the measurements from one of these experiments, the, uh, the properties, then you start at, and you're exposing it to this IIED. Generally, you, you have a baseline and nothing changes for the order of the first month. And then you start to see the trans, some transition, always moving in the direction of the intention. And so the measurement property is going up, and then it plateaus. Um, if you take it away before it gets to the plateau, then it very slowly decays. I mean, very slowly, months. But if you get it up to the plateau, then you can remove the IID and it stays there. It can stay there for years in some cases. Um, and so it's at this upper level, and usually the magnitude difference between this upper level and this level is very close to your intention, the quantity of the intention. So we see that we're going from our conventional understanding through this domain where things are mixed into a place where new physics is seriously entering. And I, I don't have time to tell you about it, but basically we then did a bunch of experiments to try to figure out what, what is some of this? What, what is this domain? What's going on here? 
And we learned three things uh, from our experiments, or at least the way we interpret them. First one is that we have somehow accessed magnetic monopoles. Now the world has spent billions of dollars trying to access magnetic monopoles, but from this state of the system, this one is a new state, and magnetic monopoles uh, can coexist with electric monopoles if the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state is raised. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a very important aspect. The second thing we found was that the phenomena, this change, wasn't in occurring in the atoms and molecules of this world. They were occurring at another level. They were occurring because of changes in the stuff of the physical vacuum where there are no electric atom molecules. Okay, so that within, if you look within an atom, okay, we got a nucleus we know of and we got electron shells and, and such, depending upon how you want to analyze it, whatever model you want to use. But the issue is there's a huge amount of empty space in there. The stuff that's in that supposedly empty space is what was causing this phenomenon. And the third thing we noticed was there was a kind of, there was really an information entanglement between sites that were at this new level of physics, even when they were thousands of miles apart. Okay? Those were sort of the three things that, that dropped out of it. There are more, but they're sort of secondary. So the bottom line, the way we interpreted this, was that there is a second unique level of physical reality. It's always there, but if it is not coupled to our conventional level of physical reality, we do not ph detect phenomena going on in that level of reality. All right? It turns out when you come to some theoretical considerations, it's because this stuff appears to be going faster than the velocity of light. And our instruments can only detect things that go slower than the velocity of light. And so if there's no coupling between these two, then it's invisible to you. So this is the beginning of the invisible worlds. And what we do by this conscious use of consciousness to create an IIED, that the IIED conditions the space to be at a higher electromagnetic gauge symmetry state, different than Maxwell equations uh, work on. And so, and, that's, and so are the instruments that are in this world. All our instruments are in this electric atom molecule world. But there is some stuff that becomes the coupler between these two. And once that stuff is present, it brings about the coupling, and it allows the instruments to access this faster than light phenomenon. So that stuff has to bridge between slower than light and faster than light phenomena. And I'll come to the postulate of, of that. And, and it's that aspect that is so important. Okay? Now, the second feature that is really important is we decided, well, well, this aspect is higher gauge symmetry state means it's at a higher thermodynamic potential energy, free energy, than our normal reality. So if we somehow could connect from that level of reality to our normal electric out, uh, level of reality, we could do useful work of all kinds, all kinds, mechanical, chemical, electrical, optical, etc. And so then I thought, what if when we're born in this bio body suit I talk about, into this realm, there is an organ or a system in the body that is at this higher gauge symmetry level? If that were the case, then human intention when I didn't say this, okay, we got these two worlds. Human intention affects this world, not this one, not our familiar one, or, or at least not much, but it can affect this one big time. And so if they're coupled together and the instruments measure the sum of those two effects, it can measure the intention effects. And so we did the same kind of experiment with respect to the magnetic aspect of in humans. We did muscle testing with a world-class expert, and then brought a, one of these little bar magnets into the muscle group being tested, and the south pole increased the strength, 
and the North Pole decreased the strength. Well, you cannot have that kind of behavior in our normal reality because all you have there are magnetic dipoles. So again, it's accessing magnetic monopoles, magnetic currents in the human body, which the intention of a human can drive. Okay? In my modeling, it drives and creates flows of magnetoelectric energy. The general other way of putting it, it creates an enhancement of chi and the flow of chi, which we've all heard about. And so this is what makes the great performers of the world. Right? They unconsciously work with this within themselves through their intention, through their desire, through their feeling state to make something important happen. And all the great performers of the world, I think, unconsciously do this. But now that we begin to know about it, everybody can do this. If we can bring some kind of biofeedback device and we have something on, on we're developing to do that, which you can set in front of you and you can look at it and you can intend and you can measure the increase in this energetic state by your intentions. And as you pump that kind of iron in your internal gym, then you change from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and from a master to an avatar. All of us have the internal apparatus to be capable of doing that. And in so doing, we will bridge these other domains because nature is radiating all the time on many, many bands. We have, can, are only really detect with our sensory system, the five physical senses and our instruments, the electromagnetic band and, and the other aspects of the four fundamental forces, but basically that band. But as you do this work within and you build yourself, then you begin to access these other bands. And of course, that orbs is all about that kind of stuff. Okay, I get carried away, so forgive me. I'm mean, moving on. All right, so the bottom line is that this is, this is the way I see it. I think this is the way it is. That relative to these two levels, we, any measurement, any quality that we measure is given by our electric atom molecule level, that's our conventional reality, plus this coupling coefficient, alpha effective, times the magnitude of, the, of what the measured value will be in this vacuum level of reality. And so if, if, if we don't have any coupling or much coupling, very, if this is very small, then you can just forget that. You just have your normal reality. But if you use your consciousness to create this stuff that becomes the coupler, then this term goes up to the order of one. That's, that's a bad, badly written thing, but, but basically the order of one. Then you access all of this, okay? So these are the definitions of the various terms. Deltron, I had to invent this substance from the domain of emotion and having the qualities that it can go slower than light or faster than light, and the slower than light part can interact with the electric stuff, and the faster than light part can interact with the magnetic information wave stuff, and that allows this whole system to work. And so that's still a postulate, but it allows us to explain all these phenomena that, that we are finding. Okay. Now we've also devised the uh, an experimental measurement system. We not only have a source that can lift the gauge symmetry state, we have a detector which will tell us how much the thermodynamic free energy excess is for the hydrated proton. That's just a hydrogen atom in water. Uh, but it reads it out to us. So we can begin to see that. We, these are, this is in some of the uh, sites around the U.S. that we've made measurements. Um, the numbers are they're relevant. They're in milli electron volts. I'll come to a more meaningful statement. Here's one from within our laboratory in Payson. Um, the, uh, this one, P, P7 and P1. And here's one uh, in England and here's one in Italy. Now, we've used this device to do measurements in, in various uh, alternative and complementary medicine laboratories. We've used it um, 
at Eric Pearl's uh, Reconnective Healing Workshop. We've only done it once. We'll be doing another more exact experiment in a couple of months. But in the one month, what the, we did do is that we measured, and it took place here in Sedona, um, we measured the increase in this excess thermodynamic free energy from the day that the process started and through we saw an increase to a peak and then it just decayed uh, after the the uh, workshop was was over i won't tell you all the details but the difference in the magnitude between the peak and the starting place was a doubling of the average energy in the space now what does that mean if I, if I were to say I had a normal space and I was going to increase the temperature, how much would I have to increase it to make that change equivalent to what was seen in this experiment? And the change was 300 degrees centigrade. Wow. And there was no change in the measurement temperature. So the thermodynamic free energy changed, but the temperature did not. And it was not in the usual form. It could be indeed entropic. We don't know those details yet, but it's a significant effect. We have in certain sites around the country, we've conditioned them to a place where it's three times the average temperature. So the equivalent of like 900 degrees centigrade, that, that quantity of energy that's in the, norm, in the molecules in the normal level of reality, because it's the temperature that is the indicator of how much kinetic energy is stored in the molecule. So it's a big effect, can be a very big effect. Well, I think I've said this, that basically the bottom line is that the human consciousness is capable of allowing us to couple to another level of reality. And this level of reality may have its own set of life forms. And we may be able to image them through things like digital cameras. Digital is interesting because there's much more information content in the digital than in the analog. So anyway, again, it's, it's this. Um, let's see, have I gone, oh, I know what I'm missing. Um, this is where I'm going to take the first five minute break so you can ask some questions, uh, if you wish. And there are microphones at the back. I repeat, make them relevant, make them concise, please. And uh, if you will cut me off in five minutes. So you're going to have to get up and come to the mic. You're first, so let's go. Uh, before the uh, uh, aluminum foil Faraday cage yep. um, solution to the problem, right. how did you know that the second imprintable device had been contaminated we, by the first? We, we looked at the water experiment. You can immediately know if it's conditioned, if the device is conditioned, because just in the behavior of the pH versus time curves. If, we, if you use an unimprinted device, they are really jerky and they they displace from each other over time uh, whereas in the conditional one they're just beautifully smooth rising and they're all over a number of days they're all sequenced day by day so we just we, we'd had that experience and that was our indicator and then basically we were able to do experiments like this with the unimprinted device and we got effects so there was a lot of that but in terms of you know down to the very nitty-gritty it was just so obvious to us that, that the conditioning had changed. Would you please define gauge symmetry state? Oh, this is very hard, okay. Um, the, I've laid it out in the various books. Uh, and these experiments, by the way, are, are written up in detail in Conscious Acts of Creation and also in some science adventures with real magic because it was the, the science adventures with real magic is where we did the replication experiment on the water uh, with the IIED uh, pH going up by one full unit. The, the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state going up is, one way to see it is in our normal reality, the undetermined parameter is the phase angle of the electron wave function. It, it can have any value in a circle, okay? Um, The issue is when you raise the gauge symmetry state from what's called the U1 to the SU2 level, where you have 
coexistence of electric monopoles and magnetic monopoles, you now have this elect electron, let's say, moving in this orbit. It has its phase angle. The, now you've introduced the coupling with the magnetic monopole. It takes a perpendicular orbit because now the two are coupled. So now there are two uh, un, undetermined parameters. And because there are two, that becomes the two in the SU2 gauge symmetry state. It's lifted to a level where now you have a much more complex dance of the charged particles. And uh, there are many other ways that I can say this, but that's the simplest that I've come up with. The, the way you can think of it is the following. If you look in that space between a nucleus and the electrons, all right, in an, in an atom, and you bring about the coupling, so the stuff in the, in the vacuum, the em supposedly empty space, the magnetic monopoles start to circulate. And now, with our present devices, we see the paths of the electron changing, or the probability of them being in certain places changing. And so you say somehow there's an attractor that's developed. And people call it dark matter and dark energy, but it really is the magnetic monopole in this vacuum stuff that's doing it. And, and so the gauge, it says you now have a system richer and it's a higher gauge symmetry state and it's more complex. And because it's more complex, it is at a higher thermodynamic free energy per unit volume. Thank you for saying that in the simplest way possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just drop it in. The, when I don't understand things well, I can only say them in a complicated way. When I eventually get to understand them well, I can make it simple. But this one is tough for anyone. Next. Let, let's take one over here. What is the response of mainstream science to this type of uh, mainstream approach? science are a reincarnation of the priests of Galileo's time. <laughs> they, they, they choose not to look through the telescope with an open eye. It would be wonderful. I would just love it if they would just take the time to seriously look. But they're, they're boggled by this. They're still stuck with the issue of the unstated assumption. And poor guys or girls, uh, it's, just, it, it's just the way it is for them. Uh, they will change. I mean, these things always change, but it may take 20, 30, 40 years. One funeral at a time. That's what, that's what Mock said. Yep. Mock was right about that. Sorry, say it again. In terms of the uh, words you were using, consciousness yes. and intent, yes. where does the body, brain, mind, mind, thought, and consciousness as you're using Well, them? the con consciousness as I'm using it, um, it's really outside of the electric atom molecule body, the layer in the bio body suit. Um, our unconscious, uh, that functions and is the dominant thing in our, in our bio body suit. It primarily functions at the magnetic information wave level, which is the layer inside the body. Uh, my, my view of the, uh, of the whole person is like a sphere with three segmented zones in it. The outer zone is made of two layers, electric monopole substance and magnetic information wave substance. And that's what we take on when we're born. That's what we shuck off when, we're, when we seem to die. Um, the middle zone is the soul self. That's really what's evolving. That's pretty much fairly indestructible. And that's the emotion domain, the mind domain, and, and an aspect of the spirit domain. And the core is the high spirit domain, the creator, or the God self. So we are all those things. And it's a question of developing the coherence of mm, information passage from one to the other. I mean, the outer, the bio body suit, the outer layer is well designed in order to interface with space time phenomena through the five physical senses, developed by the, really by the, well, there's a horse there now. That's oh, interesting. Just, Where'd that come from? Just, just close uh, that up. Just close uh, that the, up. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, close it, Josh. So, so in any event, the, I sort of lost my train of thought, so have I answered your question? <laughs> um, Bill? Yes. Um, I just want you to know that the five minutes five that you minutes. asked for is up if you want to. Sorry, I, I think I need to go on. Yes, because sir. This, you're, will you sit down and maybe you can be first up the next time? 
the next break, and you can ask your question then. But you may have more questions too. So uh, let me go forward. You know, we could talk all day, but we don't have time. The the model that I use to uh, is this duplex model, and the way I see it uh, or visualize it. And I'm only I had two pictures, but the the other one doesn't come out. So here is space-time representation of a quality, and behind it is the reciprocal space-time. It's a conjugate. So, and it's really a reciprocal space, so it's one over distance and one over time, and one over distance is number per unit di distance, so it's a spatial frequency, and one over time is number per unit time, it's a temporal frequency. So this um, bio body suit, the bio aspect, has two layers. We really only know about this one, and this other layer is waiting for us to get seriously in touch with it. Um, the, uh, and so if you have a frequency domain, okay, let me go one step. If you go back and you, if you have a quality, or like an object in direct space, it has an equilibrium conjugate information pattern in reciprocal space. And so if you couple these two together, then the, this pattern builds up in reciprocal space. Once it is truly in reciprocal space, you can access it from anywhere, here or Mars or Saturn or anywhere in the world, because it's in a frequency domain. Doesn't, it's not limited by distance nor time. And if the higher dimensional ones, which are behind this, this uh, duplex reference frame is embedded in a higher frame, the domain of emotion, the domain of, of mind, and an aspect of the spirit domain. So these are dimensions. This one becomes an, sort of an eight space. Not quite, but I don't want to get into the details. Uh, and then a nine, and then a 10, etc. These, if they're all frequency domains, then an intention from this level gives a pattern in the frequency domain, and, and you can have a resonance in this domain, and a resonance in this domain, and therefore a resonance in this domain, and if you have the deltron coupler, it's in this domain. So this is how, for with intention, can come from the highest aspect of yourself, the spirit level, and ultimately manifest in the earth. So, and I'm sorry I don't have the other one, but it basically is you can put this into a, um, a what's called a band diagram. But let me pass by. Let me give you an example of an individual with a remarkable human biofield. Some work I did back in the 1970s um, with a man by the name of Stan Ojak. He wasn't a doctor. In fact, the work that we did together, uh, he, he got a PhD for it in psychology at the International College in Los Angeles. Uh, so he was, has been a practicing psychologist for many years. He's retired now, too. This was the mid-70s. The equipment was he would sensitize a camera with his biofield. That is, he would hold it, he would take it to bed with him, sleep with it kind of thing, do this for a couple of days, and then he could get remarkable pictures. And this was not a digital camera. And so he put the camera on a tripod with a shutter release, he used Kodak film and Kodak processing. And then when I, he showed me this, and I thought, this is pretty interesting stuff. And so I said, okay, let's do a dual camera set of experiments. One which was sensitized and one which was not sensitized. So that we could get the normal and we could get the altered normal. I'm going to show you what these things look like. They're in the first chapter of my first book, Science and Human Transformation. So here we can see uh, people on the stage with uh, these things rising from the chairs and from the people. And here, is, this was a rock concert out in the air. And you can see these little, look like seahorses on, on contrails. Um, and you can see all this energy being generated. It basically was a dark system. So uh, if you, I guess you have to be pretty close to see the contrails, but I can see them here. And, and I thought they were very, really very interesting. And now I think they're very much related to orbs. Um, and here, so that was 30 years ago. Um, so basically, where am I? Here it is. 
Um, and then these were some other pictures that he'd taken. You, this and I think of that as an open book that's sort of flying in the room. And he's got uh, a friend. He's taking. It was a friend's birthday, and he, he was taking a picture of him in front of this. And you got all this other stuff. And here's more of the same. Uh, and by that time, I said, "Hey, let's do a dual camera experiment." And so the top, the one on the left, is the unsensitized camera. Unfortunately, it, we couldn't get the same kind of camera. They no longer made it of the kind he had, which was a plastic Kodak. Um, and this was a Minolta camera. So this is the unsensitized. It's a faster shutter than this one. But you can see, if you can look back here at, the, at this man, you can see right through his body and see the things on the wall behind it. And he's getting pretty transparent. If you go to the bottom one, here's Yuri Geller on stage with a couple of ladies and a blackboard. And here you can see some stuff going between one of these ladies and Yuri, and you can see through half of his body to the blackboard. And here, this was at a, a conference I was at with uh, Doris Kubler-Ross down in uh, Monterey. And uh, so here's the, the uh, uh, Minolta, and see, you can see the light wells, and here is the Kodak. This stuff, these beams, these bands, these ribbons of light uh, manifesting. And here in the bottom, uh, we take, he could take pictures uh, with a lens cap on the camera. And, and this, this is the, if this was in the, uh, the church at Stanford inside, and this was with the lens cap off, and this was with the lens cap on. Yeah. Um, very interesting stuff. And Stan's uh, primary intention was to reveal God's universe. He was a marvelous man of the Baha'i faith, and he, he was really built inside. Uh, and so his biofield, and, and he could basically, once he sensitized anyone's camera, then, and he passed it to them, then maybe for the first uh, hour, they could take pictures and they would get uh, good results. But the, the entanglement with other things it eventually leaked away. But when he was there using the shutter release, his biofield kept working with the camera and kept lifting its gauge symmetry state. That's how I see it anyway. And so, and I think, so he lifted the gauge symmetry state to this uh, SU2 level of seemingly an inert object in front of him. And that becomes very important when we say a little bit later about the placebo effect in medicine. Because they also assume that things are inert, inert, inert. That's also Bolshevsky. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, I wanted to say something about this, but basically I don't think I have time and I'm going to pass over it, but I, I think you should at least hear it. I'll read it. Every change in the human physiological state is accompanied by an appropriate change in the mental-emotional state, conscious or unconscious. And conversely, every change in the mental-emotional state, conscious or unconscious, is accompanied by an appropriate change in the physiological state. And this is why biofeedback works so well. And I had some three wonderful experiments and some interesting data, but another time. Um, so this duplex reference frame that I talk about, I want to say a little bit, just a tiny bit about it. Um, they are reciprocals, and so the coordinates are not distance and time. They are frequencies, and yeah, I can label them with numbers k. They, they would be wave numbers uh, in solid-state physics. Um, and there is a reciprocal mirror pins with, with this thing, that, and it comes through the mathematics, that there is a quality in one, and there's a reciprocal quality in the other. Um, which can be remarkable in the sense that from, let's say, here is the origin in, in uh, direct space and Alpha Centauri is a, a quite a distance away in direct space. Well, Alpha Centauri in the reciprocal space has a low frequency. It's very, very, in the very low frequency domain of reciprocal space and the origin here is at infinity in reciprocal space. So if you have that kind of loop you see, you gain an entirely different perspective on things. And ultimately, we have a sensory system latent within us, which allows us to access that reciprocal space. And we will do that as we go forward into our future. That's my working hypothesis. 
I, I'm, I, you know, I have these intuitive things and, they, and they're working hypotheses until I've proven them experimentally. And then I think we can accept them as, as being real. But that's a requirement, at least for me as a scientist. Um, so what we see are the subluminal electric particles in the direct space and the magnetic information waves going faster than light in reciprocal space. Now both of these come in when you want to talk about um, the Broglie's particle pilot wave picture, which was really the cornerstone of quantum mechanics. And so you have a particle and you have a, a pilot wave which is supposedly guiding it. He won the Nobel Prize for this concept and some of the mathematics that went with it. Now the interesting thing is when you apply simple quantum mechanics and relativity theory to this, you find that the product, mathematical product, of the particle velocity, which is always slower than light, and the wave components which make up this uh, pilot wave, that has to equal c squared, the velocity of light squared. And since the particle velocity must always be less than c, that means the magnetic information wave components must always be greater than C. All right? So that has hung there since the 1930s. And the physicists of the day said, oh, we're going to have problems with relativity unless we call them information waves, because information can't really do anything. <laughs> However, what I try to tell you in the beginning is that information waves make negative entropy, and negative entropy is in the thermodynamic free energy function, and it's the thermodynamic free energy function that governs all processes in nature. So they were wrong, but the magnitude of the effect is so small it couldn't be detectable in their instruments. But now, at this point in time, when we look at it, it says, hey, here is something which is going faster than light, and it has to be interacting with the particle in order to be a particle pilot wave. And it turns out people doing quantum mechanics, uh, Walter Harrison at Stanford, his book says, if you can assume the existence of particle and wave, you can calculate everything in today's quantum mechanics, all the predictions. And so the old concept in quantum mechanics is the wave-particle duality. That is that somehow this stuff can on some occasions act like a particle and other occasions act like a wave. Well, if they're simultaneous in this kind of format, and you bring in a coupler, now consciousness can couple with the coupler, and now you can see how consciousness comes into the rock bottom building block of, of the expanded quantum mechanics, and you can begin to see how everything can start to make sense. Slower than light, faster than light stuff, in essence what happens is the, the uh, magnetic information waves have to be coming in the, the components like from this side and they pass through this which is a moving wave packet that's moving at the velocity of the particle but the things that make it up are waves coming in to it, new waves and old waves going out that's the way it works so that's where we're going in the future and here's the issue of the just a little piece of this uh, mirror principle. So we have positive energy particle to the velocity of light. Can't go up to the velocity of light because it's got mass and therefore it takes an infinite amount of energy um, if, it, if it went that far. But the mirror principle part is the pilot wave branch, the magnetic information wave branch. Comes from minus infinity and keeps going. And, and it means that quality in one has a, one domain has a conjugate quality in the other. And so here you have gravity, there you have levity. So here it's positive energy, there it's negative energy. So there's whole kinds of things that we now can begin to explain or rationalize. It's not until there's experimental proof. Uh, you know, got to be careful. So let's see, what have I got here? I think, uh, all right, I think we've done that. Um, the issue of, we, we see in our experiments that when we have a part of our system, experimental system, uh, in, in the case of the water pH, we do an experiment in our laboratory. Uh, young people in Milan, Italy, wanted to do some work with us and we said, okay, set up, buy this equipment and set up this measurement system uh, for measuring pH. 
and we will not send you an IID, we just want you to do background for three months and then we'll send you one. Well, within a week of them setting up their apparatus, they began getting the same kind of results that we were doing in the Payson Laboratory, which was conditioned. So there was information entanglement over 6,000 miles. And the way that this particular thing is meant, what the way it's meant is, is that you can have, uh, should have, these are the two sheets looking at, at our electric atom molecule world in this one and the magnetic information wave world in this one. And you start with the measurement apparatus here and the measurement apparatus there, but this one will never have an IIED, but this one has an IIED with it, which now couple, produces coupling between these two, and so the information pattern gets into reciprocal space. And once it's in reciprocal space, it's everywhere. So it's right outside this one in Milan, and now thermodynamic equilibrium requires that because there is a coupling here, there's a trickle of deltrons across here, and then a tri trickle becomes a stream and then becomes a flood, and before you know it, this becomes a totally coupled region as well, and thus the information generated here goes 6,000 miles away. Doesn't have to be through space-time, doesn't have to be electromagnetism. The data suggests it's not electromagnetism. Uh, anyway, this is, if, we, if we happen to have some time, I'll get back to this, but you can, you can using, <laughs> oh, that's, that's even worse. Uh, but, the, but the issue is, <laughs> Yeah, the issue is that you can begin to be quantitative. You can begin to predict things. And, I, and it was to help you understand the placebo effect and a variety of other things. I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> but I realized when I was, I was going over my notes that I'm just never going to have try to explain it simply. But we'll see. Maybe, maybe there'll be time, but I doubt it. Anyway, there was an article in Science Magazine by the man by the name of Enserich, and he pointed out that in 15 years earlier, uh, Double-blind experiments um, with uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder uh, showed a placebo response of the order of 15 percent. Very, very little. However, 15 years later, in 1999, the same experiment done in many places had a placebo response uh, now 75 to 80 percent. And of course, pharmaceutical companies like the, they don't like this. and <laughs> and. Of academicians like to sweep that under the rug because it can't be understood easily in the conventional framework. Um, and so they did. But the, the issue is we have to ask ourselves, why has the magnitude of the placebo effect increased so remarkably in 15 years? In the same time frame, we might also ask, why in the last 15 years have we detected that there was acceleration out at the edge of the expanding universe not contraction. And why have we started to see dark matter effects and dark energy effects in the last 15 to 20 years? So the possibility is that the concentration of this coupler su substance is perhaps increasing in our local universe. And it's been increasing for some decades so that this coupling coefficient alpha effective is becoming larger. And as it becomes larger, everything starts to be linked together. We start to be connected more and more. And we begin to see the attractor aspect of the reciprocal space stuff on the direct space stuff, which because of the reciprocal nature, the mirror, mirror principle aspect, we will see the kind of phenomena people are starting to talk about. It's, it's nice to think about because it may be relevant very much to orbs uh, for us here. I mean, it's not, not proof, but it's internally self-consistent with the kinds of phenomena that, that has been occurring. Well, th this related to the mathematics I had. So the issue, though, um, well, okay, I, I'm going to say something that relates to, to this uh, double-blind studies because um, of an inert object actually, actually becomes a very dynamic thing through this information entanglement. And, uh, okay. Um, this is in the magic book, Some Science Adventures with Real Magic. I came to realize that the fundamental, the simplest communication system that we have, if you're a practitioner and you have a client, you think that's all it is, but it's not. 
You also may have a device. Um, you may be doing electrodermal measurements. Um, but you also have gauge symmetry state of the space that you two are interacting through. And you also have the unseen universe that may be involved or may not be involved in it. So the, if, if you're lifting the gauge symmetry state, you and the client are very much coupled. And the value of the effects that occur in that interaction depend very much upon the uh, phase angle of electron wave functions and magnetic monopole wave functions when you have lifted the gauge symmetry state. If it's not lifted, you're in the U1 state and you have less to work with. Let me say something about why this is so important. And I call it the garage inventor effect. Okay? There's this guy with a tolerant wife and he has a garage and he wants to do some free energy experiments in the garage to make efficiencies greater than one for a device. And his wife lets him go to the garage in the evenings and he works assiduously on this and he works on it for years. And because he is so intent and focused on that, he is broadcasting in his biofield into this garage. And after a couple of years, he suddenly gets, he starts to get getting the effects and he gets the effects and they're stronger and stronger and he says, wow. So he calls all his friends in and, and uh, demonstrates to them that it's real. And they think, this is terrific. Let's make a business. And one of them said, well, wait a minute. Before we rush to doing that, we need to, we should have this tested in a testing lab. Okay, and there's one in the next town. And so they send the equipment there to the testing lab. And a month later, the data comes back. And they, it's just normal. And the guy in the testing lab wonders, is, is this try, guy trying to perpetrate a fraud, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing they didn't, come, didn't realize was, in fact, that they did not replicate the gauge symmetry state of the space. In order for that laboratory to make any money in the real conventional world, it had to be a U1 gauge space. So it wasn't conditioned to an SU2, and the, and the gauge space is part of the system. Hal Putoff in Texas uh, is very proud of the fact that, that 35 individuals that supposedly these special devices with efficiencies greater than one that he's tested and none of them passed the test. And the reason is his laboratory is a U1 gauge laboratory, not an SU2 gauge laboratory. Makes a big difference. So if you're in this game of working in your garage with a, you have a patient wife, uh, you need to remember that that's a very important part of the system. See, the system can be remarkable at, at these levels. I mean, we found this by these Italian folks and the folks in England uh, wanting just to, to get involved somehow. But as soon as we agreed, they were part of our system. And because they're part of our system, they became coupled because of the reciprocal space aspect or vectors. And that's what's in the mathematics. Um, and, and that makes it very difficult. Because you, that's, you can see the information entanglement always is there when you're, when you're bringing this reciprocal space. And if you think in terms of a simple medical experiment with a doctor and a treatment and a placebo, the system is these three parts. Okay, in the reciprocal space aspects, you have an amplitude and a phase angle effect, but really what you can experimentally measure and what is manifest is the intensity. And that's the square of the amplitude. And in order to get that, you have to multiply the sum of these three vectors times the sum of the complex conjugate. Just same amplitude, but, but mirrored phase angle effect. And when you do, you get the kind of part, you get a mathematical thing with two terms in it. One, which is just what you'd normally have if they weren't vectors, they're just scalar thing quantities. But then you get a complex thing, which is the entanglement, information entanglement, and it's always the pair, the doctor and the treatment, plus the doctor and the placebo, plus the treatment and the placebo. They're multiplied together. And so you cannot separate the treatment from the placebo in this kind of duplex space that, where they're coupled together. And it's that as the coupling coefficient goes up, the placebo effect goes up. It just drops out of the mathematics. So 
That's important to realize, and it's important for everyone to realize that these five parts are part of the system. And I, I put this thing in with the device. For example, if, if you're a practitioner doing electrodermal testing of, on people, the biofield of the practitioner gets embedded, the deltrons from that get embedded in the device, and the device eventually has a lifted gauge symmetry state from this, and now these two things are a hybrid system. And they can access information in the universe that is not capable of being accessed in the, when they're in the separated state. Really important, and it really is relevant when we want to talk about orbs and the and digital camera. It's the same system, except now we have an experimenter and we have a camera and we have orbs as the client. And so the issue is that the camera, just like in Stan Ojak's case, can become potentized through the biofield of the practitioner or the biofield of the world. And digital cameras doesn't, doesn't take as much to make it happen. Okay, some people can see these things. Stan would be able to see these things with his eyes because his, his biofield is so tremendous that, that uh, he doesn't need uh, training wheels to see these things, experience them. And there are, there are a variety of humans that are that way. So it's a question of how far do things have to be pushed, you know, to, to lift the camera to the place where it can manifest in supposedly an inert thing, like a camera, something from another dimension, All right? which I think is what orbs are. And so if the, so the, the, the involved, of course, are the biofield of the individual, the biofield of the, the, the conditioning of the space, the help of the unseen, yes or no, etc., and the eventual conditioning of the camera you use so that it's easier to get the phenomena you are desiring. And of course, if you're dealing with a conscious uh, biological entity that wants to cooperate in the uplift of these slow humans, this world, uh, not very advanced, then, then of course you'll, you'll see all kinds of interactions. And, and down the road, the possibility of really doing meaningful things with that bridge, that is very likely to get traditional scientists out of the box. And because there, it's the issue of, of the information entanglement. So, you, so it, is, it is the two levels and the higher levels of reality that become coupled. And once they become uncoupled, then they're entangled. The mathematics of, of the dual or triple system, etc., cetera, is, is entangled. And now, with enough of the coupler, you can have instruments which can bridge. And so you can begin to see these things. And you can begin to become part of the whole, which is what we are at the core level. OK? So I don't think they're creatures of space-time. And I think when uh, Klaus shows you some of the dual camera experiments he's done, he will agree. I won't steal his thunder, but it's great. And, and basically because if I postulate that the higher dimensions are also frequency domains, okay, then you can have resonance. And so if you can have resonance and their frequencies, then they can be everywhere. They can do all these things we think about as these higher dimensional reality and these higher dimensional beings and UFOs and so on, who've learned the physics of how to deal between these things, um, then you can find ways to reveal them once you open your mind to the meaning of these things. Your unconscious will find ways to feed you kernels of information small enough that you can digest. Okay, um, and do, let's, can I have five minutes? Have we, are we done? Five minutes for questions, come on guys. As you join information systems, now it's a higher order information, so there's more entropy effect, etc. And as you do these things at higher dimensional levels, the reason it's a very small magnitude effect at the electric atom molecule level is because the change is multiplied by Boltzmann constant. It's very small. I think the next level is up at least 10 orders of magnitude. 
the corresponding one. And the higher level, still higher. So you go high enough that you now speak a word and you move a mountain. I mean, I think it's all built into this kind of system. Okay? Next. Hi. Um, one difficult experimental aspect of this is uh, measuring the amount of intent that you put into a device. Sure is tough. Would it be possible point? to uh, take photographs along the line of the orb photographs and Maybe. try to uh, put intent into the device through yes, orbs? And we're already talking about that. Monitor that way? Okay. Good. That Klaus and nice. so, so tune in to Klaus as time goes on. Yeah, thanks. Young lady? Um, on, in your study, um, I didn't quite get the, um, the act of the quartz crystal after you turned it to 90 Oh, in, yeah, that's very interesting because it says that quartz crystal was a tuner. In essence, that was I, what, what I pulled out of that. This is in Chapter 6 of Conscious Acts of Creation uh, book. And, and, the, and the thing we found was that, that uh, we had a line of measuring instruments that were measuring the, the oscillations in temperature in, in the room outside of a Faraday cage with, with a uh, water bottle and a measurement of pH and temperature in, in the water. Uh, and eventually, we, we, when it was at condition, we were able to remove that and we still saw the oscillations. They decayed very, very slowly. And they had a certain waveform. And as we put the quartz crystal in the place where the uh, Faraday cage had been, and it put, put the C-axis upwards, okay, whereas the line of thermistors were along there over an 11-foot dimension. Um, when you did this, it turns out that the amplitude of the oscillation increased slightly, and the decay rate decreased maybe a factor of five. So very slowly decayed, like over months. Uh, but then if we just laid it down, so the C-axis was pointing along the line of the thermistors, almost immediately the waveform inverted, the amplitude was reduced by a factor of two, and the frequency was increased by a factor of five, something like that. But it was instantaneous, and so rather than its normal decay rate, we, we came, I came away from that saying, we'll get back to this, and that's going to be a tuner procedure. So, anyway, next door here. A little louder, please. I don't think it's on. Oh, excuse me for my layman terms. But my brother-in-law has an earthquake machine. He uh, measures. Is that relevant to this, this yes. subject that I talked about? He measure. Excuse me. He measures earthquakes with this sensitive machine, and yes. I tried to ask him about measuring electromagnetic fields around person, but he says he can't. No. Is that because the instrument isn't the, the uh, advanced in, enough? Uh, no, the instrument is designed to measure uh, sound waves, basically. I mean, that's, that's what, it, that's what is, uh, propagates through the earth when there are earthquakes. So he believes so, people don't have them, so what would be my well, people, answer perspective? Well, the issue are two things. People, whenever an electromagnetic wave is generated in a person. You also generate a sound wave because most of the tissues are piezoelectric, which means that they, they electric, a, a sound uh, vibration will give rise to an electric signal, and an electric signal will give rise to a sound signal. So he can convert his instrument to make it also uh, measure electric uh, signals. So that, that would be the path he would have to do to follow, to do this, but it takes a, you're now talking about a lot of instrumentation and detection equipment. Uh, in principle... So it's just an adjustment of his machines and not a simple, detect, Not a simple detect. adjustment. Okay. I mean, if, if I were he and, and I could just turn a knob, I'd be happy, but I'd probably have to take the whole thing apart and rebuild it with the other intention in Thank mind. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how, uh, I just read it broken. A little louder, please. Not on? Is it on? Is it? Go ahead. Try again. Uh, matrix energetics. And I, I oh, yeah, matrix preface, energetics. I saw some pieces yeah, from right. that. So yeah, I wrote the form. Um, what's your opinion about belief system and intention, how it affects actually this uh, uh, invisible world? The limb system? Real. Belief system. Oh, belief system. Yeah, because... Belief uh, is terribly important. I mean, the issue is you've got to, we've got to come to realize that nature responds in three ways, or can it respond in three ways. What you get from nature is if you have no bias at all, you get a certain set of phenomena responses. If you have a positive bias, you get an expanded set. If you have a negative bias, 
your biofield is diminishing the effect and is changing it. So this is something we just have to realize. As you start bringing consciousness into it, you have to realize that the mindset that you hold, your belief system, is in fact being broadcast but from you in your biofield all the time and, and, and through reciprocal space part of yourself as well. So it, it, the ball game is different. And so in the, in the experimental design, one is to say, all right, we're going to do it this time with a neutral bias. No bias, just suspend judgment, suspend belief. And then we're going to do it okay with, with belief. And that can vary depending upon how strong your belief is. Okay? And then we're going to do it like Randy would. Okay? Be very negative about it. Just the Vogel effect is zero. You can't, can't possibly be tolerated, etc. These these next two questions will be the last. Okay, this lady is this next. This lady and, and, and that then lady I'll come to the to the red-haired lady. Okay, yes. please. I'll, I'll, please put it on. My question is about the uh, human biofield yes. and people like Stan who affect right. the cameras so right. amazingly. Is that genetic in your opinion, or do you think anyone can raise their Anybody. vibration through? Anybody. Well, there are genii in every field. We know that. We'll accept that. Uh, all of us have the apparatus to do it, okay? It, you, he had to work, he practiced and prayed and did all these wonderful things for many, many, many years of his life in order to manifest these abilities. So it, it is a possibility for every single one of us. Now, at every layer of self, we radiate. The easiest one for us to pick up in today's world with today's instruments is the electromagnetic part of the biofield. That can be done straightforwardly. Equipment is expensive and complex, but still can be done. The next level will be this magnetic information wave level. I call it magnetoelectric energy. And then, then there'll be higher levels. And they're all manifested in our biofield. People who are good at seeing auras will see shells around yourself, um, etc. So it's all there. It, we'll get better and better at it as we go forward. But you have to give these things meaning because it's the unconscious that does most of the work, okay? If, you, if, you're, if your mind doesn't give a thing a meaning, then your unconscious will not feed you information to enrich your understanding of these things, okay? Thank you. Last so, one. Uh, I wanted to ask you, have you done any experimentation with the concept of the multi-sensory human and the five-sensory human in, in respect to the right brain activity and the left brain activity. And when you're a multi-sensory person, you use right brain before left brain, and then you talk through the right brain to the left brain and manifest. That, that kind of thing is all beginning to be a doable thing. Yes. So people who become, who are expert in, yes. in that, as they open up, Yes. to this other level because the really the magnetic information wave yes. level is the template for yes. the growth yes, in exactly. the electric level and so we are now have the capability to meaningfully start doing experiments because to I answer your question. Because I work with this level yep. in yep. my daily work and what I've seen because I can see through the body yep. and I see okay. the brain and how it works yep. it's connected to the DNA Right. Uh, and the uh, energy uh, helix of the DNA connected to the two physical walls is actually connect the energy uh, well, e level in the right brain goes through the DNA okay. and then it goes okay. through the physical side. All right. That, that, that's, that's your theory. Yes. Um, and I accept theory. Right. The, but the issue is that the instruments you're using can only see the electric atom molecule right. aspect uh, of this. So truth is in the experiment. And where we can screw up is in our interpretation. So you, you have to be very careful not to get too far ahead um, of, of, that, of that circumstance. But I, I think we'll see in the next decade a tremendous growth in the possibility of doing the things you're talking about when you bring this other into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm certainly talking uh, to people involved with brain state management. And, and we're talking on uh, these levels of how to get at these things right. experimentally and how to get at them from a theoretical perspective. So we haven't gone very far yet, but it's, we've made a beginning. Thanks very much. All right. Let's give Mr. Tiller a hand.
We are now privileged to hear a presentation by Dr. William Tiller, who's a very popular Stanford scientist, and who spent most of his, his career uh, scientifically validating the phenomenon of intention intuition, which of course are the centerpiece of, of these tapes. Um, Dr. Tiller's presentation is necessarily technical. They might even use a few terms that uh, would be unfamiliar to, to many. That's okay. His presentation is quite clear and serves to punctuate the very important subjects that we are exploring within these tapes. Here's Dr. Tiller. Can we have a hand for Dr. William Tiller? I say, can we have a hand for Dr. William Tiller? <laughs> so popular, Bill. Oh, what an awesome group. <laughs> Part, which illustrates how powerful mindset is. And many of you will know about these experiments done in the 30s by Slater. Uh, so forgive me if I repeat them for the others. Slater built these glasses called upside down glasses, which are made of, of a combination of lenses and prisms tied together and, and uh, so that when you put them on, you see everything upside down. Uh, and he took uh, 10 or a dozen individuals and asked them to do this. And of course, that's a very destabilizing thing to see people sort of uh, hanging upside down on what should be the ceiling. Uh, but he asked them to stay with it and keep wearing the glasses. Um, and they did, uh, albeit with some difficulty. And somewhere between two and three weeks, one after the other, suddenly there was a flip with the glasses on. They saw everything right side up. And if they took the glasses off at that point, flip, they'd see everything upside down again. And they'd have to wait another two or three weeks before, flip, things would go back to normal and they'd see everything right side up. Well, I think that's a remarkable observation, one that should be taught to children in grade school, because it says our mindset and belief system is so strong that it creates a force acting on the neural dendrite system, causing them to grow in such a direction as to build an inversion lens in there, or prism. I don't know what the geometry is. but the body does it. And I think we do this all the time. And of course, these days, people are dealing with neural learning to try to get around various difficulties, taking advantage of that. But we're amazingly adaptive creatures. Okay, our bio body suits are. And this is how we build structure into our bio body suits. Right? And this is why the jail is so difficult for us to get out of, because we're building the bars by our belief structure. Now, the final example on this, which I found interesting, goes back to something that Darwin wrote about in his diary. When he uh, sailed his sailing ship, the Beagle, into the harbor at Patagonia, and the Patagonians were on the shore, and they could certainly see everything that was in the harbor, but they couldn't see his sailing vessel. Pretty strange. The shaman was there, and he could see the vessel. I presume he had more elevated consciousness. And so he spent some days, some time, talking to them, explaining this piece was like that in their experience, and that piece was like that in their experience, and this piece was like something else in their experience. And after doing this for a while, suddenly the beagle just faded into view, and they saw the beagle. Okay? So it says on this path of cognitive development for us, we need building blocks that have meaning for us. See, it's meaning that we, we deal with. All right? In order to understand something, we have to translate it into a meaning and a framework. So we, if we want to do movement in new domains of cognition, we have to lay a foundation. We have to build some structures, some little building blocks or toy blocks or something. The same kind of thing we do with, with children. We put them on the floor and we give them these blocks and we say, go ahead, assemble something. And in the act of trying to assemble some things, 
they gain cognitive development within themselves, as most of you know, um, and they build something. Well, I think that's the way it is for us with respect to these other domains. We are with the Professor Meritas, Dr. William Tiller from Stanford University. Welcome and aloha. Aloha to you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to have you in this state. Good. You have been very famous from your knowledge and research on intuition and intention. I would say that's probably true, but there was a time when I was famous for my orthodox science. <laughs> what is the difference? Can you explain the journey? The, the, difference, the difference is that orthodox science has a hangover from the days of Descartes. That is that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And that may have been true in the days of Descartes, but it is no longer true. Our experiments show that that is very, very wrong. It says that our science is very limited. It, it is able to do some use, some interesting things, and but it's missing the point relative to humans. Mm. Right. So this weekend, you will be giving a workshop. I will be giving basically a workshop, uh, a th certainly Thursday night, at Spalding Auditorium. Between what will that be about? That will be the same general topic, but trimmed down. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I'll be talking with Q&A um, for two and a half hours on this general topic, showing how our Orthodox science community uh, went astray and what is needed to get it back on track. How to change the paradigm to one that is more human oriented, uh, more consciousness oriented, and more hopeful and for the world. And will be the oriented. weekend? The weekend will now expand that picture to give chapter and verse. Much, much data, lots of explanations, how we're on the threshold of opening a door to a new universe of understanding. And it will be a lot of fun for orthodox science when they open their eyes and expand their wings into the new area. And, and will there be like some kind of exercises or practical application? The practical application is we have shown that all humans have their acupuncture meridian system at what's called a couple level of reality. The couple level of reality, there's two levels of physical reality which normally do not interact with each other. But using intention, it's possible to bring about that interaction. And it is the new level, which functions in the physical vacuum, that is influenced by intention. And thus it only enters measurement reality so, in real so, so life. Can you help us understand and yes. practically use our yes. intentions? Yes. Because I have noticed in my yep. work as yep. emotional freedom coach, I noticed with people that they really want to learn yes. how to use the secret yes. to manifest things, to grow. I think of the secret, by the way, as preschool. Of course. Yep. But it was very important yes. For, yes. for masses, the, the move yep. people yes. towards. I was surprised at how many people were there. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and so will this workshop that you will give us, will this help us in our life in some way that we can move if, to if the next step or learn the, the people, how to touch yeah. intuition? People, people already have the infrastructure in themselves. They just need to practice, practice, practice. And they can change themselves from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and from a master to an avatar. Is that All of us can do for it. everyone? Yes, but maybe not in just one lifetime. I will certainly put it in front of them in in very rich ways. Um, it's there for everybody. We all can do it. We have to care enough. We have to give it meaning. We have to be disciplined. And we have to practice. The we have been able to we build a device to measure the 
change in the energy state of the room when one of these conditioned host, intention host devices is operating in the room. And ultimately, we want to turn that into a biofeedback device. So excuse now, me, what is intention host device? It is what we do is with the intention, we imprint it into a little electronic box. Do you bring it to the workshop? Uh, I will show it. I didn't bring it. I'll tell people where they can buy one. Um, but they have to imprint it themselves. The, uh, um, and I'll show all the data. I mean, it's how we do it, how, how we imprint these things, how um, we put them to work. So there are many ways to do it. We have found a pathway which is very straightforward, um, good science, um, if one pays attention. And uh, as I say, from our measurements, everybody has the capability. And this is the pathway for our evolution over the next, we'll call it epochs of our evolutionary process. Um, because you soon get out of this space-time domain and into domains that are not temporal. Mm -hmm. And so you can't quite use time. But if you were to count it in time, it, maybe you'd be talking about the next several million years of your existence. You will change a great deal. Which is nothing. Which is nothing. From another perspective. It, from another perspective, yes. exactly. And, and will you be able to explain, maybe scientifically to people, how come that Reiki works? How come that no. tapping works? We, we can, what if, is the science behind it? If people ask the questions, I have, I will be talking about some of the healing work from the reconnection healing, the Eric Pearl work, because I've done measurements uh, on that and have very good data, very important. Uh, so it relates to all healing aspects. So um, I'm willing to respond to any question the audience wishes to ask, so if, if I can. Anybody, if anybody has a question related to your personal growth, related to techniques you are using, yeah. Come to this workshop on Thursday, Saturday, Saturday and, and Sunday, Sunday. Yes. all in UH. Personally, if I can ask you the question, how come EFT works? What is your research behind tapping? Why tapping works? Well, it's complex, but the issue is that tapping is producing a stimulus like succussion in uh, homeopathy, and you're tapping acupuncture points. The acupuncture meridian system is the template upon which the electric body is built. So when you tap the acupuncture point, you're going to the source of physical events in life, mm -hmm. of the body. So um, once you start and the, and the important point is that that level of reality is already at the coupled state of reality. And I'll explain what that means in the, um, not, not right here. I have in, to use in diagrams the, in the workshop. In the workshop. More time. But, yes. but basically, when you are tapping, you have an intention to make a change. Mm -hmm. And you are touching the source. Yeah, let's say for the headache. Right. You're touching the source, and so your intention becomes very strong because you're putting it into the acupuncture meridian system. And therefore, the intent, because that's the level upon which intention works in our devices, and therefore it gets yes. to Gary the body. Craig, Gary Craig said once, he said, it doesn't, the tapping itself, yeah. it doesn't make much right. difference as the intention. And he said, you will see in few years, yeah. Yeah. nobody will tap anymore. No, you don't need to. Because we will tap into inside. Exactly. You, you can hold, that's the whole point, is to hold the intention in your mind. Ultimately, we humans are the device. Everything gets built into us. We don't need training wheels. We have the capability, and when we build it into ourselves, build the infrastructure, etc. And when you build infrastructure into the body, more spirit enters.
my fundamental working hypothesis is. I think we are all spirits having a physical experience as we ride the river of life together. Our spiritual parents dressed us in these bio body suits and put us in this playpen, which we call a universe, in order to grow in coherence, in order to develop our gifts of intentionality, and in order to become what we were intended to become, which is co-creators with our spiritual parents. When I say co-creators, I mean big time stuff. But that's the way down the road. We are just babes crawling across the floor of the universe at the moment. And we have a long way to grow. A long, long way to grow. And the general public is starting to really work on it. And that's wonderful. And because they are, the Orthodox community will change with the data, the data that we provide eventually. Eventually, they will not be able to withstand the general public. So, we are, let me give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Take it, let's take a 60 watt light bulb. Okay, it gives a bit of light, not a lot of light. And the reason it doesn't give a lot of light is because the photons that come out of the light bulb interfere with each other. You get destruct, what's called destructive interference. However, if you could influence those photons so that they became coherent with each other, so that they come out riding on each other's back, then the energy density at the surface of the light bulb would be close to a hundred times the surface of the sun. We are like that light bulb, quite incoherent, mostly asleep, but we can be that coherent source and that's part of where we're going. Let me give another example. Um, a great physicist, um, Wheeler, John Wheeler, passed on now. Uh, astrophysicist, really great. He calculated that for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, the vacuum, the physical vacuum, had to contain an energy density of something like 10 to the power 94 grams equivalent of electromagnetic energy per cubic centimeter. Well, that's a big number. What does it mean? From astronomers, we can get an average density of electromagnetic matter in the cosmos. Cosmos is a sphere of about 15 billion light years radius. So you multiply the average energy density, mass density of electromagnetic energy times that volume, and you get a number, a very big number. Now let's take the Wheeler calculation. We take that number and we multiply it by the volume, the physical volume of a single hydrogen atom. That's like one over one followed by 22 zeros. When you multiply those two together, you get another number. And that number is a trillion times the other number. That is, it's a trillion times more latent energy than all of the electromagnetic mass in all of the stars and all of the planets and all of the cosmic dust in our entire cosmos. That is our future. That, in fact, is the coarsest level of that is what we are addressing. We are able to meaningfully touch that aspect of physical reality where things are starting to go faster than light. That's our future. That's how we're really going to go to the stars. That's how we're really going to help us become. And it is by learning to meditate or do Qigong as a, these are practices. These are practices that you do from deep within. The more you do, the more you become. And the more you become, everything changes and everything gets connected. There's mo there, well, for example, let's take the placebo effect in medicine. 30 years ago, it was practically zero, maybe 5%. In the last 30 years, it's become something like 95%. How can that be if a placebo is inert? Well, it turns out when you look 
at the connectivity that has been occurring because of these subtle energies. Then, and in particular, what I call the coupler, which lets us cause slower than light matter to interact with faster than light matter. When that kind of thing occurs, then it turns out you can't treat a placebo as inert because the mathematics shows you that a placebo, its functionability, its effect is multiplied by the doctor, the doctor's intention, it's multiplied by the treatment, it's multiplied by the patients. So that's why the placebo is getting close to the treatment result. It's because it's, it's a vector sum that is required. Mm. Can't be treated as a mathematical scale. Uh, so this is going to change everywhere. Controlled, double blind controls, forget it. It's not going to happen in the future because we are getting more connected. Everything is getting connected because this coupler is not just growing in our experiments, it's growing in the cosmos. That's what the placebo results are showing us. It's that coupler is growing in magnitude. Um, and we're on our way to some other great adventure. I love the word adventure because it also means stepping in this unknown. And we know that yes. once we step in this unknown, not just really not knowing, amazing yes. things happen. How did you yep. how do you put that together in scientific terms? How did you what is your research showing? Why, why, well, the why re is that so re magical? research is the research is showing that all the action is not going on in distance time. And orthodox science is distance time only. As I said, a second order differential equation is what is the best that quantum mechanics, present day quantum mechanics can do. I mean, it's not completed. Relativity theory is not completed. Einstein's limitation of the velocity of light is shown. You can begin to show that that's not the end. Once you have another level of, of physical reality. I call it the fine physical reality versus the coarse physical reality. That means that as you increase the energy up towards going towards the velocity of light, you don't have to go all the way to the velocity of light. It'll just tunnel through into the faster than light domain, which also responds to relativity theory. And if relativity theory fits faster than light and slower than light, there's just trouble at the light barrier. And if you have only the one domain, well, you would just treat trying to go to the velocity of light, which takes more energy, takes an infinite amount of energy, so it's never going to happen. And that's why Einstein said what he said, that you can't go faster than light. But as soon as you show that nature has another level, of, at least one other level of reality, and all I'm showing is the second rung of the ladder. But that's enough. You can tunnel through. So it means that if our physics community would open their mind to the possibilities and look at some of the data that exists, they can explain dark matter and dark energy. They can explain, they'll be able to explain why there's acceleration at the edge of the universe rather than deceleration, which is what is predicted by our normal physical reality. They say they don't understand what dark matter is, but all I have to do is to really go and look at uh, the de Broglie work of the 1920s and the uh, Dirac work of the 1920s, both who won Nobel Prizes. But they, he, he talked about and negative energy, see, they couldn't understand what a negative means. But if they think a little more, they'll find that they can. In fact, I've written about this. I should mention on my website, tiller.org, there are at the moment 26 free white papers, one of which deals with this Dirac work and shows how to understand, begin to understand negative energies. So, but again, it's this stuckness, you know, um, they're they're terribly committed to it, and uh, they're going to they will change eventually. But it's it can be either slower or fast. It'll be faster if the general public 
put some pressure on them. Mm, you you were featured in in what the bleep that a lot yes. of us have seen. Have you done a lot of other documentaries or work? I have I have done. Uh, I have two DVDs that are on my website uh, that are accessible on terms of the psychoenergetic science. Uh, one is a seven hour DVD, which was an entire weekend where I was the only speaker and I talked about the early work. So it's available for sale and there's PayPal so people can purchase it if they wish. There are four books now in, in that area and there are the 26 free white, 27 free white papers. By next week, there'll be 28. Um, what is that one about? Uh, that one is this broadcast to Germany, the 28th. The, the 27th is uh, towards a union of logos and mythos. Both were re rejected by orthodox science journals. Um, they don't get it. They don't want to get it. Um, so I put them up on my website. So they're free for anybody to access and print out for themselves or their friends or whatever. So this is all going forward and we're gathering more data every day. We don't have funds, but fortunately the two people that work with me, they're longtime city yoga practitioners and they're at the moment have been willing to work for nothing. So it's, there have been challenges, but we're making progress, real progress. Since, you know, with the internet, this is something beautiful and I love doing here on, on my show too, is, you know, how can we support you? Because there is some people, this this reaches people all around the world, Bill, and, and there, is, there must be some, uh, you know, who knows, this increases. I have, I, that I have on my website, um, a, uh, I think a, a, bu a button or something which which uh, uh, can take donations and if the donations are large enough then I can uh, well I have to be in contact with the person I can tell them how to write the check so that I can send it to uh, the Holos Institute for Health where Snor Sheely has and I have a uh, uh, I have an account there, so that if they direct it to my psychoenergetic science research, then uh, uh, Norm will write them back and they can take a tax write-off from it, but certainly people can uh, be part of this research. Yeah, and also I guess helping to share your white paper results also, yes. and the, the research that you have done, all of that also contributes. Yes, it does contribute. I have. I publish, I publish a lot of work uh, in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. They have been more open, the alternative medicine, because their work touches these new levels of reality. Yeah. So I'm, I'm speaking, it's, it's difficult for some of the, uh, of the folks to understand this because they're tied uh, strongly to the orthodox, but still, um, many do, they're willing to suffer a little confusion. Mm, I think so Dr. Dr. Larry Dossey also publishes yes. in there. Uh, yes, but, but there, that would be good if Larry was um, not the person that's reading the... If, if Larry was the person that was reading the, the uh, papers that are sent, but the person he has reading those papers is one who um, is... Uh, he has his own axe to grind. <laughs> Just put it that way. But I guess you're you're connected with Larry Dossey too, right? Uh, yeah, Larry and I uh, do once in a while communicate. We uh, uh, haven't talked to him in a long time, He's but we're doing Larry. work now. I'm I'm having uh, starting a program on information medicine, um, which is psychoenergetic science applied to medicine. Um, and working with uh, the Buddha relics and doing experiments on the Buddha relics to show that uh, they, uh, they're very much like an intention host device and they are left behind by these Buddhist masters and they have consciousness and we can demonstrate that experimentally. So it really answers, the, it is a answer to the question 
is there consciousness continuing after physical death? The answer is, is yes. This beautiful book. I can totally see that as a book in itself. Yes, it will be eventually. We're doing more work. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Professor, for this uh, moment. Well, it was fun. <laughs> and I'm glad we were able to do this, thanks to your friend, uh, Bill, <laughs> to do yes, this. Yes, yes. So I'm I'm glad to see you. When you when do you uh, take go back from your vacation? Oh, I'm not on vacation. I'm here to interview uh, several people here on Maui. Ah, and then okay. Kauai, and then uh, I'm going to the Quantum Medicine Congress in Honolulu okay. to interview Dr. Imoto. And, uh, It will be, uh, it's, a whole, it's a whole trip. Well, it is. I mean, quantum is a real thing, but quantum mechanics cannot deal with the real stuff of humans. Not yet. Anyway. Thank you so much. My <laughs> pleasure. Good. Be well. Hello and welcome to Conversations With, our monthly series of informal and enlightening conversations between the leading edge teacher and author, Jim Self, and some of today's most progressive and connected teachers, channels, and authors. Now, here's our host, Jim Self. Intention and attention are more potent never before because the consciousness and the applications are now much more available to us and becoming much more conscious to each one of us. When properly understood, clearly focused and attention allows for more dynamic creation to occur almost instantaneously today. As a pioneer of the original intention experiment, Bill Tiller, a professor emeritus at Stanford University, has proven the focused intention has the power to transform the pH balance of water over thousands of miles. And now in collaboration with pediatric speech language pathologist Susie Miller, their autism intention experiment is proving that focused intention can create meaningful alterations in the behavior of children diagnosed with autism. Bill and I are gonna talk today about 
40 years of research in psychoenergetics and the power of intention to influence change. So why don't you start a little bit and talk about how you got here. I mean, as a scientific professor focused in, in material sciences and physics, how did you get to consciousness and intention? Fortunately, I received some money from a philanthropist in 1997 for a three-year program, and I decided to put that money to work to seriously study the Descartes assumption of 1600. Descartes' assumption, which was really valuable at the time, it was that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit could significantly influence well-designed target experiment in physical reality. So this was and effectively the beginning of science. It, yes, exactly. And, and it was really a century after the beginning, after the, the Copernican Revolution, uh, all that uh, stuff that involved the beginning of Newton's work and Kepler and, uh, boy, like a senior moment, um, Galileo. It, others, Galileo yeah. was <laughs> what I was looking for. And in essence, it was necessary for him to make this assumption because it allowed you to discriminate between religion and science. Now, there's no way of knowing whether it was true or not, but it was at that time, but it was a useful thing. And the dilemma in today's world is that that intention has been unconsciously held by orthodox science and orthodox medicine for the last 400 years. It still took another 100 years after the Descartes assumption before people really were able to make the transition from the theocratic uh, mindset that they had uh, grown used to. So since in that, all of that time, the uh, last 400 years, this assumption had never been tested, and it, and it was dominant in, in the conduct of orthodox science. So I decided to test it. I mean, basically, orthodox science decided that everything had to be internally self-consistent within a reference frame of distance time only in the study of nature. And that was tough, because... Even from the mid-1800s, there had been a lot of very good work by people studying what in those days um, would be called parapsychology. Sure. And basically, the orthodox science community buried all of that because the data didn't fit their distance-time-only reference frame. So it became tough. I mean, orthodox science has done great work and the reason that I decided to take this on was I felt that the other work was more important for humanity. That although the Orthodox science community is still doing very interesting work, I don't believe it is helping humankind develop themselves in the way I think they are meant to be developed. And it doesn't really provide the foundation needed for, I think, the new epoch that is underway. It started. It's not fully blown yet, but uh, it's already started. And so I did... So let me I, put this in perspective for a minute. Yep, so, yep. so effectively, what Descartes did is he looked at how there was lots of extraneous influence, religion, politics, yep. and when you can remove the extraneous influence, you can come up with a pure scientific experience that basically has hypothesis and then can prove the thesis. Exactly. But in the process of doing that, what he effectively has done is created a new religion yep. that eliminates all other possibilities as a contribution to finding truth. Yes, and the, the limitation was that distance time only as a reference frame which, of course, it was a it was a great step forward from the, the theocratic yeah. view, 
It is a very limiting perspective of nature. Nature is broadcasting on many, many bands, not just uh, the one that is distance time only. Well, and, and of course, it's not distance time. The only part is what becomes difficult. Distance time is an important piece in the, the manifold expression of nature. And yes. we are now at a turning point to go and take the next step into a larger level of reality than just distance time. Yes. And distance time, there's many serious pieces of work that are problems that come from this uh, distance time only perspective. And all of them need to be recognized and needs need to be corrected and that yes. and that's really what the work is about is it's really dealing with these things recognizing where they have contributed and recognizing where they are a serious limitation in today's world sure and so you've stepped into this space by adding really kind of one of the most fundamental building blocks of creation intention and attention and, and, and the issue is that in term, at, attention, of course, is has always been with us. The we have expanded the orthodox today's orthodox reference frame to include both human intention as a significant experimental variable and human consciousness as a significant experimental variable. And this is going to change the future dramatically. And the work you're doing now is beginning to have scientific documented results that yeah. can be peer-reviewed uh, if can be objective. If, if it turns out that in the last 15 years we have shown that it's possible to change the properties of a material change the alkaline acidic balance of water, pH, up one or more pH units, or down one or more pH units from the same kind of water with no chemical additions. In the Orthodox community, that can be done, but only with chemical additions. Right. So in our case, there's no, no new chemistry added other than intention. So if I look at your results as a scientist, I have to either deny them as crazy or shift my own belief system. That is true, exactly. And, and, and they would prefer at this point to call it crazy because, yes. you know, when you work with something in a belief system for such a long time, you it's very difficult to shift or easily shift to another belief system to accept data that you've denied for centuries so it's a slow process and it's unfortunate it is the way it is but the data will eventually cause the general public to force the government to cause these very excellent scientists to get off the pot and get outside the box and look at what else is there and I think that's going to happen in a very important and interesting way. Basically, you know, we've had back in, in June the experience of, again, another senior moment, but basically the Higgs boson work that seems to have come to fruition after the last, oh, 40 years and it was proposed a long time ago, but that particular entity has been proposed to give mass to all the particles that we know about in nature, at least in the distance time only reference frame. Then that brings forth a kind of conclusion of the standard model of orthodox science, which in turn, me, and if that includes the Big Bang, but it, it deals with electromagnetic energy. And the thing we have to recognize is that all of our instruments, pretty much all of our instruments are based on electromagnetic energy. 
which have an upper limit of the velocity of electromagnetic light in vacuum. And our work seems to be indicating that as you go into the vacuum and beyond the physical vacuum into the higher dimensional aspects, all of these domains, the stuff of these domains, is superluminal. A superluminal means faster than electromagnetic light. And electromagnetic light is all subluminal, which is slower than the velocity of electromagnetic light. This is three times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second velocity. So what the Orthodox community are going to find as they move forward, they will find that they, although the faster than light domain, our work has shown that it is accessible and available to do new and interesting things, they will have no tools to do those things because the electromagnetic tools all go slower than the velocity of light. And the Big Bang aspect looks at the physical vacuum as being empty because, of course, we know that all our instruments, they look at physical vacuum and, and their tr physical vacuum is transparent to the movement of electromagnetic energy. And it turns out that all, at all frequencies of electromagnetic energy, they go at the same constant velocity, which and in our own eyesight, the vacuum looks transparent. So it's understandable to conclude that it's empty. However, there has been work by uh, John Wheeler, who's uh, passed now, but a very great astrophysicist, and he said that for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, the vacuum had to have a latent energy density of 10 to the power 94 grams equivalent of electromagnetic mass. Well, that's huge. So that's something bigger than what is known. That is bigger in the following way. If you take, if you take the cosmos as we know it, it's sort of a sphere of radius 15 billion light years, and you multiply it by the average electromagnetic mass density in the stars and planets and cosmic dust. And that astronomers give us a number for that. So if we multiply those two together, we have an idea of what kind of energy content is available in our physical cosmos. On the other hand, if you take a single hydrogen atom and you take the volume of it, the hydrogen atom has one proton as a nucleus, and it has one electron orbiting around it. But it's mostly empty space. If you take that incredibly small volume of empty space and you multiply it by 10 to the 94 grams equivalent per cc, then you find that that stuff within the vacuum stuff of the volume of a single hydrogen atom is a trillion times larger than all of the mass in all of the stars, and all of the planets, and all the cosmic dust in our cosmos of radius 15 billion light years. Wow. Interesting. Really yes. interesting. Okay? Let me give so you another more piece. going on. <laughs> another piece comes when Dirac did his work in the mid-20s to find out where an electron comes from. He said it comes from an energy C, a negative energy C in the physical vacuum. Now, he said the way this comes about is an incoming photon interacts with the stuff of the physical vacuum and pumps out an electron into a higher energy state beyond the gap, band gap of energy, but it creates, leaves behind a hole in this stuff. And that hole became the antimatter. It was defined as that, was experimentally discovered in the 30s. We now have antimatter particles for every other particle that we've, has been discovered by orthodox science. And the point I want to make is there would not be antimatter if the physical vacuum was empty. 
And then there are other things that show that it is not, the physical vacuum is not empty. And those calculations tend to show that there is stuff there, but it's going faster than the velocity of light. And so it does not interact with things going slower than the velocity of light. And that's why it, you can deduce that, oh, this thing is empty because it's not interacting with things. Well, it can't interact with it because it's going faster than light. Now, from our work, we have created what I think is a higher dimensional substance, which can go both slower than light and faster than light and can be a coupler between these two domains. And when you have the coupler, now you can begin to see the interaction. And thus you can begin to make measurements on things that appear to be going faster than light. Okay, so take, take that into the form of your experiment. All right, we did three, we learned eventually after say the initial 10 years of research in this area, we learned how to broadcast. We realized that we were dealing with what I call subtle energies. They are energies different than those found from the four fundamental forces in orthodox science. Those are gravity, electromagnetism, the short-range nuclear force, and the long-range nuclear force. So subtle energies I proposed and published a sh short paper on that maybe 20 years ago. These are all the other energies functioning in nature beyond those that are in our orthodox toolbox. So I did four experiments to prove the, or disprove the Descartes assumption. Two of them had to do with pH. One with pH going up, one with pH going down. I had learned how to imprint an intention into a little electronic box that you could put together from the kinds of things you would get at Radio Shack in the 1950s. Talk about that a little bit. So how did you do that? How do you put a, a thought into an electrical box? Okay, the, it turns out someone else had created this kind of box and I experimented with it. And I used four people who were longtime expert meditators. At this point, my wife and I have been meditators for almost 50 years. Uh, the two other people had been meditators at, at the time of those experiments also for 30 to 40 years. And so we would go into, well, first of all, we'd set up this black box on a uh, tabletop. We'd plug it into uh, an electrical plug. The electromagnetic radiation coming out of it was less than a millionth of a watt. So the place where we got the devices indicated from their studies and we would then go into a deep meditative state. First we would cohere ourselves as a group of four and we would have the feeling of connectedness also to a deep level of a higher dimensional domain of reality and that we would connect with these unseeing entities as well, these beings. We thought of them, I thought of them as uh, my higher dimensional colleagues. And so we jointly would cohere and I would then read the imprint statement that I'd created for the specific intention. And then we would hold that intention for uh, maybe, maybe a half an hour. And when things felt cooked at that level of reality, and we, we thought of it as a sacred space, and we were trying to co-create in that sacred space, I would say, so be it, I will be done. And tentatively come out of meditation, and then give a short intention to seal the prime directive into the device so that it didn't leak away. We later found it it was interesting. Once we'd imprinted with the device, we call it an intention host device, an imprinted intention host device. I took 
an imprinted device and took an unimprinted one, separated them by about 100 meters, turned them both off electrically, and just waited because to see if anything happened. And you would expect, of course, nothing would happen because the electric power is off in both systems. But within three to five days, the imprint had been transferred from the imprinted device to the unimprinted device. And yet, there was no electrical connection. I first thought, heavens, I'll not be able to do any experiments because I'm losing the control. But I, then I realized, oh, wait a minute, these devices are off, so there's really another, at least one more information channel in nature through which information can pass. And then I found that if I uh, stored the device in a fair electrical authority cage that was grounded and wrapped the device itself in aluminum foil and put it in a authority cage, it could keep it alive, the imprint intention could be kept alive for maybe up to six months. So it meant that I could do experiments and I could ship a device to other people so they could do experiments, etc. So then we did these first the two pH experiments. The third experiment was to condition a space wherein this kind of creativity could take place. And then I took a liver enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, and just put it in that space for 30 minutes, first of all, before that, measuring its chemical activity, put it in the intention statement in that case was to increase the chemical activity by exposure to a conditioned space. And then, so it was in there for 30 minutes, took it out and, and experimentally measured it, and indeed the chemical activity had been increased by almost 30% and the p-value, that is the probability that it happened by random chance was less than one, one chance in a thousand, which is really robust experimental results. The final fourth experiment was to take a living system, fruit fly larva, and to put them in a, an agar solution I mean, on the top of that solution so that they had food we were conditioning the space continually through the lifetime of the fruit fly larva. The goal was to increase the ATP to ADP, that is the energy storage molecule for the fruit fly larva. It had three phosphorus atoms, whereas the chemical precursor had only two phosphorus atoms, and that's our intention, was to add a third phosphorus atom to this ADP. And we found that we were able to do that to the amount of 10 to 15 percent, again with p values better than 0.001. And we thought that that would make the fruit fly larva become more physically fit and therefore have a shorter larval development time to the adult fly stage. And in fact, we found that we were able to reduce the larval development time to the adult fly stage by pretty close to 25% with p-values better than 0.001. So okay, those so let, four experiments me... were so remarkable, they proved unequivocally that in today's world, at least, the Descartes assumption is no longer holds. So the assumption is Descartes is correct in some aspect of it, but when you begin to inject another aspect of, in this case, consciousness and intention, you alter the foundation Ab of the experiment. Absolutely. The ball, the ball game is definitely changed. And yeah, whether the yeah. Descartes experiment held in the old days or not, we'll never know. But at least in today's world, mm -hmm. it does not hold. But it is still stuck in the subconscious of the Orthodox community, the medical community, in universities around the world, and in the supporters. What I know in all of the mastering alchemy work is that the barriers, uh, you know, some people call them the veils between consciousness, but as this third dimensional electromagnetic field that we've been exposed to forever has changed. 
we've moved out of that field. That's my work, my awareness. No, I, I, that, I agree. I mean, the, the other fields were always there, but they could yes. not be accessed Access. from, from yes. distance time. Right. So one of the really exciting things about what you're doing in terms of kind of scientifically proving it and, and moving the direction of science to begin to include a spiritual alignment, which will happen very yes. soon as this unfolds, and a lot of it is directly related to what kind of you're doing. But the scientific community in this case, just like the political community, the religious community, are usually the last ones to go. You know, they're the leader, and they have to now catch up to who they're leading. And so, I think but that's, the, that's exactly the case. Yeah, but the public is, and people who are listening, understand this in, in very clear ways because they're not encumbered by the prove it and the lines of restriction that that third dimensional reality has happened. And I think you're going to begin to see some really tremendous scientific breakthroughs that clearly have a component of something, the scientists would say, we can't prove it or define it. I don't know even where to look for it, but here's my results. If you enjoyed this highlight from Conversations With, join Jim Self live on the Awakening Zone Network. That's AwakeningZone.com. If you're looking for free tools for your personal and spiritual growth, if you want to be who you came here to be, visit MasteringAlchemy.com, where you can learn more about Jim, his work, and future guests. Our theme song is Hands of Love by Barry Goldstein. May you experience laughter and grace on your journey home. changing world. Off Hollywood Media presents a voice of truth and inspiration, resonating a vibration of love and understanding, illuminating new paths for new directions as we, as one, strive for higher and higher levels of consciousness, always remembering life changes. And now, your host, our MC, our master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. I am excited to be hosting this show tonight, in particular this night, because we have two of the smartest people uh, on the radio show. As a matter of fact, one of the doctors, Dr. William Tiller, is known as one of the smartest men in the world. And so I can't wait to bring him on. And that's Dr. William Tiller. And we also have a Doug DeVito on, who is an author and also um, one of the head of planning for The Reconnection. So I can't wait to bring them on in just a moment. So I won't, I won't have a long monologue today because I want to be able to give these two gentlemen as much time as we possibly can. But just to keep with the format of our show, I did have something to say. And I thankfully had a friend remind me of this particular subject just today. You know, I, I'm very busy right now, and I'm not boasting when I say this, because uh, that could mean that I'm not very good at delegating. It could mean that I haven't manifested or attracted the right people, or enough of them, I should say, because I've definitely got right people around me, um, enough of them to do all that there is to be done here at Life Changes. Or it could mean that I am, uh, let's see, unorganized. It could mean a lot of things. Or it could mean that we're just growing so fast that there's really a lot to do. And, um, and, and I know it also means, like, for example, I have about 
1,567, actually, exactly, emails that are waiting for a response from me, over 700 Facebook messages, and、um, I haven't even looked at Twitter in years. So, yeah, there's a lot going on, and plus, there's a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways that we are being bombarded nowadays、uh, between phone calls and, and emails and Facebook, which didn't exist not long ago. and And Twitter and, and whatever else is coming down the pike. There's a lot of information, and I'm sure we'll get maybe into a little bit of that because information is certainly important, and how we get that is important too. So I've been really busy, and so I have not had very much personal time, very much time to even get on Facebook. But every once in a while, I just, to me, it's like a little vacation actually to go on Facebook and check out what my friends are doing. All 5,000 of them, <laughs> literally.、Um, anyway, so I am on there, and on occasion, I'll happen to see that a really close friend of mine is having a birthday coming up in the week. So I'll write this friend on Once in a Blue Moon, I'll write somebody and say on their wall, Happy birthday. And a lot of times, too many times, in, for my taste, I get an answer back that says, it's not till Thursday, and it's Sunday. And I'm thinking, really? Does that really matter anymore, especially in this day and age? With so much going on, and as busy as we all are, and the fact that a, a friend who's busy or a friend who's not busy either remembers or happens to, to see that it's your birthday coming up, and they send you a note saying, Happy birthday, wishing you the best, blah, 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 you write back, It's not till Thursday. <laughs> and, and, A lot of these people probably are the kind of people that you know, you can't take them out to lunch the day before. It has to be on their birthday. It's like, well, what if another friend wants to take you out? And I'm thinking, people, there is so much information coming through. There are so many important things happening. And yes, we need to take time to celebrate each other and enjoy each other. And if we do that on a Sunday, when your birthday is on Thursday, or Christmas is on Saturday, or Or Hanukkah's on Friday. Any time that we reach out to each other and share love, share compassion, as far as I'm concerned, when someone does that to me, that's my birthday. So, of all, with, of all the friends that I have and the very close friends who I rarely get to talk to or see these days because I'm traveling a lot and working a lot and et cetera, et cetera, when they reach out to send me a voice message or a Facebook message or a text message or whatever, that's my birthday. That's as good as Christmas because it means that there's no holiday. Stevie Wonder wrote a song like that. I just called to say I love you. I just wrote to say I love you. And I think there could be a lot more of I love you going on than waiting around for Thursday's birthday for people to remember us. And I just wanted to say that. <laughs> and with that, I am happy to be hosting Life Changes with Filippo tonight. And I want to remind everybody that we. Are found at www.lifechanges.ws every week here on the BBS Radio Network. And today we have two guests. And ironically, we haven't had two guests before except a year ago. And that was the first time. And those were、uh, two guests from the reconnection. And, and here we have two guests from Mastery that is connected to the reconnection. It's all connected, actually, isn't it? So, our first guest is Dr. William Tiller, who is Professor Emeritus of Stanford University's Department of Material Science. Spent 34 years in academia after nine years as an advisory physicist with the Westinghouse Research Laboratories. In his conventional science field, he has published over 250 scientific papers, three books, and holds several patents. In addition, for,、uh, for the past 30 years, he has been pursuing serious experimental and theoretical studies in the field of psychoenergetics, which is becoming a very important part of tomorrow's physics. In this new era, he has published an additional 100 scientific papers and four seminal books. He is well recognized for his participation in the popular film 
what the bleep do we know? So welcome to the show, Dr. William Tiller. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you. And I'd like to go ahead and, and introduce uh, Doug DeVito as well, who is uh, head of planning for the reconnection. He is the first authorized instructor of reconnective healing worldwide. He has been instrumental in encouraging the research that is happening with world-renowned scientists Gary Schwartz, William Tiller, who's on our show tonight, and Konstantin Krokhtov. Um, uh, he sends uh, he he sends them the next level of healing for humanity. And validated by science from Rainbow News, I sent. I, you know what? He'll have to explain what that. And he recently <laughs> presented reconnection healing research findings at the ISSEEM conference with Gary Schwartz and Ann Baldwin. He's also an author and has a book coming out very soon that we'll get to talk about a little bit. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Doug Devito. Oh, thank you very much for having me on your show today. Uh, what a pleasure to be here, and also what a great pleasure to be on the show with you, Bill. I'm looking forward to uh, to catching up with you next week. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's Life right. is busy. We all know that. Yes. Well, and next so happy week, birthday for whenever it comes to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tiller. Thank you. I appreciate that. What they're talking about next week is indeed the... Uh, 8th Annual North American Mastery Conference, where they will both be presenting, along with speakers Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza, John Holland, Damian Brinkley, Catherine Brinkley, uh, Terry Cole Whitaker, and Eric Pearl. So before we get into that, let's start with uh, Dr. William Tiller. Uh, I actually heard a couple people say this, but uh, Doug DeVito was one of them who said, you're one of the smartest people in the world right now. How does that feel? Uh, well, I don't really believe it, um, and if you ask my wife, you'll find out that uh, I'm not, but that's all right. After 58 years of marriage, she's still putting up with me. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was actually, I have to say that I'm guilty this last weekend. I actually said that on tape, so, Bill, that's probably going to chase you, that I that I said that you're one of the smartest people on the planet. <laughs> well, as long as you say I'm one of, that's fine. There's no lots problem. of company. <laughs> What the exciting thing is is that you're both in good company and that uh, the company is is coming out to talk about what they know. And uh, knowing what you know, I understand that you have had resistance in the scientific world. <laughs> of course. Um, the Look, let's go all the way back to um, the days of Galileo, okay, when... Copernicus had set his bit, and Kepler was finding new results, and Newton was in the wings, and the establishment, which is most establishments get full of hubris, they wouldn't even look through his telescope at the experimental data because they knew what were the answers, or the mm. truth was, and of course they were very, very wrong. Well, that's a human failing that occurs uh, again and again over time, and it's the way it is today in orthodox science. Orthodox science, there are two issues that are very important. One is that the unstated assumption of science since the days of Descartes has been that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. Mm. And our experiments of the last decade or so have shown that that's completely wrong in today's world. However, the hubris is such that they don't want to look at the experimental data. And the reason that that occurs, and I've only begun to really understand it recently, is that science looks for internal self-consistency relative to its reference frame for viewing nature. And the one that we've had for the last 400 years uh, has been distance time as a reference frame. And the idea has come that that's all nature is, that nature expresses itself only through distance time. Well. If you look at the issue of consciousness, 
intention, emotion, mind, spirit, parapsychology, psychophysiology, love, etc. These are phenomena of nature that are not distance time dependent. And therefore, it is impossible to use orthodox science to truly understand these things. Can't use quantum mechanics, can't use relativity theory, can't use any of these sorts of things because this is a class of phenomena in nature that has been around since the ancient days of the Greeks or even before, but we have not discriminated the reference frame for viewing it properly versus the reference frame distance time with which we have viewed that category of phenomena in nature. And, and orthodox science has done a great job with respect to that. But relative to that, humans are just meat. And we all know humans are not just meat. The thing that makes life so special is humans. Conscious, loving, intentional, wonderful humans. So it's time orthodox science got off the pot and saw nature in a larger perspective. And that's what psychoenergetic science tries to do. Hmm. Uh, you know, Doug, uh, Dr. Tiller here has, uh, you know, the, the scientific community is, is looking at or not looking at and maybe even laughing at some of what Dr. Tiller is presenting here. Now, in our everyday lives, uh, you, uh, having also been in the sciences as a chemist, you are in the work of, of the reconnection are trying to explain to everyday people some of this work. These are not scientists, and yet even everyday people like us are saying that can be ridiculous, and some of us get it and some of us don't. How do you deal with that in your work? Well, I, I think the, the best thing for people to recognize <clears throat> is to recognize that today's magic and the mysteries of today are just tomorrow's science. And that while there's so many things we do know, for example, about how the human body works and how it heals itself, there's a near infinite amount of things that we don't know. I mean, we don't even know how a body heals itself after it's been cut. We certainly don't know all the functions of the brain. We don't know exactly how the DNA works. And, and if we can admit those basic things, and if the informed medical community and scientific community can admit that we know so little about basic human functions, then at least we have the start of a conversation that can allow us to recognize that there could be something more and for example when we talk about reconnective healing we're talking about the fact that the body responds to information and from that information and that vibration and that frequency that we work with in the healing context somehow the body intelligently responds and somehow the body then takes that information and then flows it into whatever channels it needs to to help to facilitate healings the fact that we can't explain it does not disallow it. And so that's where the conversation starts when people like Bill and I get together with Constantine and Gary is, is we recognize that, hey, that there's something here that bears a lot of further investigation. It's very real, but of course we still don't know all the answers, so let's go further. It is, however, very real. <laughs> mm. And Agreed. actually, talk about very real. This uh, weekend, you were talking about the biological science and the chemical science. And um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm going to have uh, Dr. Tiller talk about the energetic science or energetic sure. medicine. Absolutely. So, so part of some of the experiments we've done with reconnective healing is, is we've looked at the impact of the frequencies on things like uh, the immune system and the hormone levels and. And we've also looked at <clears throat> cell structure and we've looked at plant DNA and human DNA and how it responds to these frequencies of healing. And most, much of this research was done with uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz and Melinda Connor and, 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 and Baldwin and Mary Flores from University of Arizona and also Dr. Glenn Ryan. And <clears throat> the basic essence of the findings is, is that somehow plant DNA and somehow human DNA and somehow our own hormones seem to be responding to information medicine. And, and in the case of reconnective healing, what we're specifically talking about is frequencies 
are brought near someone's body or around someone's body and that somehow there's an energetic communication that occurs still on, on some levels that Bill could probably, I'm sure, can explain far better than I, but somehow the body simply responds to that information on a physical level, on a chemical level, and in, in many cases, sometimes in the form of a healing where disease states and symptoms just simply fall away. So, Dr. Tiller, uh, up until now, the, the biological medicine, uh, I, I think is what it's called, is, is, is what, how we've affected the body. We, somebody gets sick, they cut something out or, or something like that. Then the chemical medicine, as I understand it, is, is kind of the next step up where you could actually take a pill for something and make it all better. But now we're heading into something that I think you're terming or at least working in the energy medicine, correct? And so this is well, what I certainly have worked in energy medicine for a long time. Uh, I've been working in information medicine for a very long time as well. The metaphor that puts it together is what I call my silver colloid metaphor. Um, if you take a glass of water and put some bacteria in it and throw a bunch of silver colloid particles, these are little tiny spheres of silver then we know that it kills the bacteria generally, at least if they're the simple ones. And the idea that was developed was that physical contact between the silver and the bacteria was necessary to kill the bacteria. And that is what led to uh, chemical medicine. That's what led to pharmacological development. However, what wasn't so well realized was that if you take the same jar of water with the bacteria in it and you take a fluorescent lamp overhead but make the electrodes out of silver and have a lens outside which you focus some of this light on the water, then you also kill the bacteria. And mm -hmm. so what you see is that it's not physical contact. It is at least one of the photons of the electromagnetic spectrum of silver. Everything radiates a particular spectrum of energies, and, and the photons are the communication vehicle. Now, so that's what led to energy medicine. Mm. And the next step in the picture is that if you do what we've been doing for the last dozen years or so, is you take a simple electrical box and I mean, the kind of thing that you might have bought at Radio Shack, the parts anyway, and back in about the mid-1950s. So it's very low-tech. But you take that and you put it on a tabletop and you turn it on electrically and you have meditators sitting around it and they go into a deep meditative state and they imprint a specific intention into that box. And we find that when you after you've done all of this, you take the box and put it near the glass of water and turn it on, you can also kill the bacteria. And we have done a number of experiments that shows that this aspect of human consciousness, it's in human intention, allows you to, in fact, provide information to change the... Uh, pH, the acid alkaline balance of water, up or down, significant levels, levels beyond which if it happened in the human blood, you'd be dead on both ends, whether up or down. We've done it in terms of liver enzymes in the body. We've done it with fruit fly larvae. We've been able to influence the energy the concentration ratio of the energy storage molecule relative to its chemical precursor. Uh, but significant amounts, with very, very significant statistical probabilities that it is not likely to happen by random chance. And we found we've been able to reduce the larval development time to the adult fly stage by up to 25% with statistical probabilities one in a thousand that it could have been by random chance. So this is what we have done in the beginning just to prove that the unstated assumption of orthodox science is really quite wrong and so we so, go on from there we we use these things now to influence healings of people we use them to enhance the properties of chemical supplements 
the goal that I'm searching for is to bring these into industry so that people can make money out of them, and then maybe the orthodox science community will look through the telescope at the data. Well, I was going to ask you something, but as soon as you said making money off of it, and then I, it threw me off, because I was going to ask you, so when a mother kisses a boo-boo, if the child believes it could go away, there's a, there, there, that could happen. Of course. The, the issue, look, the thing that is necessary to understand, I think, is that when you look at the human unconscious versus the human consciousness, the information handling capacity is more than a million times at the unconscious level compared to the conscious level. We're not very conscious as human beings. The unconscious takes in all this data, just at the five physical senses level, say, and it manipulates it. It probably draws graphs. It probably makes plots. It probably then produces little kernels of information which it sends to the conscious so the conscious can experience what is going on but it only sends it along those pathways that the consciousness has given meaning to all the other seems to get dumped because the mean the lack of meaning to an individual at the conscious level is acts like a filter so that the information doesn't get through but if a mother with the relationship with their child reaches out to kiss a boo-boo with that love pouring into the child. Then the information gets through to the child, and the unconscious of the child heals the boo-boo. Wow. Wow. Information coming through love. I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that, but before we do, uh, Doug, you, you come from a, a business background. You have an MBA, and, and you were um, working for a large corporation as well, et cetera, et cetera. What drew you to this work? Certainly there must have been some kind of uh, something that satisfied your scientific mind. <laughs> um, yeah, as you say, my background is kind of like... Uh, uh, unlikely to be a healer. I have um, an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. <laughs> My very first job out of college was making diaper bags for Procter & Gamble. Um, <laughs> and then just to make myself less likely to be a healer, I went to business school and got a, a master's degree in marketing and accounting. Um, I mean, I thought I was going to be the CEO of a company like P&G and AT&T and Deloitte and & Touche and Walt Disney, and I worked for them all. And the universe had other plans. And, Instead, and you went woo-woo. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Uh, those other plans kind of uh, really just happened on a Friday afternoon. My CEO walked in, shut down my division, said, hey, Doug, you may or may not have a job on Monday, and smiled at me as he said, have a nice weekend. And uh, ironically enough, or, or maybe coincidentally, or maybe just flat out on purpose, um, the universe somehow uh, put some circumstances in front of me by which I met Dr. Eric Pearl the very next day, and he just happened to be looking for somebody to help out with the organization of his seminars, and I said, well, I just happened to be available as of 17 hours ago. So th that was kind of my introduce introduction to, to metaphysics and, and, and healing. And, of course, as you can imagine, being a chemical engineer MBA, I just kind of looked at him straight in the face and said, you know, I don't believe you when you say that you can heal other people or that you can help facilitate healings. And, and I certainly don't believe you when you say that you can teach other people to be healers. That's just crazy stuff. So eight years ago, I decided to just go take a look and see what his seminars are all about. And what I was amazed at was is when I walked into the room, I could feel something. I mean, there's a palpable field effect, for lack of a better word, and I'm kind of borrowing some of your words here, Bill, but there's a palpable field Yeah, because we can experimentally that, measure that now. Yeah, exactly. That, that anyone can feel, not just the people who are, you know, energy healers who have been trained or people who are medical doctors, but literally normal people, skeptics like myself, walking in with no training whatsoever, and I thought, oh my God, what is that? I can feel tingling in my hands, I can feel pulsing, I can feel vibrations, all of a sudden I gained this new ability just from sitting in this, this room that Bill has measured a number of times. Right, actually, I wanted so maybe to Maybe you can share a little bit about that. 
perfect time. Bill, could you talk about that? You've actually measured a room before anybody even entered it. Yes, we, uh, okay, our, our procedure is to use consciousness through a device to change the fundamental symmetry state of the u- of the room. It's called the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state. It's an expansion of group theory, and let's not go there because it's kind of complex. But the issue is that we can lift the symmetry state of the room to a level um, where you access another dimension of the universe, and the intention makes a change in the properties of that dimension of the universe, and it then allows you to change the properties of materials as seen using our normal instrumentation, which normally you can't access this other level of the universe. But the point is that we have developed, I've I've developed a mathematical theory to predict how this kind of phenomena can occur and how it influence the simple measurement like like the pH of water which is the acid al- alkaline balance of water and we use that as a detector probe so it's simple physical chemistry but altered in a very important way and we get a quantitative measure of the aqueous hydrogen ion um, in terms of milli electron volts and we can see how the room changes from zero excess value for the uh, hydrogen ion of the thermodynamic free energy and to very large values several hundred milli electron volts for example the first time eric had asked me to bring our instrument to one of their healing uh, seminars over in sedona and we did so and we found in fact that the space was somewhat conditioned towards this higher level of reality six hours before the workshop started. And when we measured it through the time frame of the workshop, we found that the this excess thermodynamic free energy of the room went up to a maximum and then just slowly decayed over the subsequent two weeks. Two weeks later, when you measure the room, there was nothing different about it at all. That's two weeks after look, people had left the room. So everybody had left, yes. And and when you look at the numbers, the numbers were really interesting because if you say, how much would I have to thermally heat this room to get this kind of measurement? And it turned out that we would have had to heat the room by 300 degrees centigrade. Wow. Wow. And And the issue was that the room changed only something of the order of at the very most, 5 to 10 degrees centigrade um, during the session. Now, what this told me was that it, well, okay, I need to back up one step. <clears throat> In nature, the there is something called the thermodynamic free energy of a material. Um, and that is what drives all processes that we know of excuse me, in nature. That is, if there's a difference in free energy between the point A and the point B, then there is a driving force to cause transport and reaction go in that direction. So, but in this function, pardon me for a little bit of mathematics, but it's important. There's a pressure volume term, which is what was used by Watt to make the steam engine run. Today we use it in the compressors of refrigerators there's plus an energy term the most familiar one that people are with is where physicists take particles and they throw them at a target at huge velocities and create a, create explosions of particles and we learn a lot about physics hmm. and there's minus a temperature times what's called the thermodynamic entropy with a constant entropy if we take a temperature difference between the earth and deep in the ocean or deep in the earth, then we get geothermal energy effects. Okay, that again is is a driving force energy. And the entropy thing is what's important here because in the normal processes in nature, 
entropy increases in almost all the processes we know of. However, there is a process which is the generation of information in a system. And when that occurs, the quantitative increase in information is equal to minus the quantitative change in entropy, which means that if you have a process like the reconnection healing process, where you are delivering information into the individuals and not just head information, but a workshop where they are getting it into their organism, then that increase in information reduces the entropy of the of the room. And that's where this huge effect comes from. So it's generation of information, which really becomes a lowering of the entropy, which means it restores the potential of our world. And we're building it into ourselves through this process of reconnection healing and all kinds of other learning processes that humans get involved with. Well, when we come back uh, in just a second here, uh, I want to ask Doug about this information. He's talking about more than, than just information as information here, obviously. Dr. William Tiller is. I want to remind everybody that you're listening to Filippo Voltaggio on Life Changes with Filippo. And you can learn more about us at lifechanges.ws. And hear us every Monday night at 7 p.m. on the BBS Radio Network at BBS Radio. Dot com, or, of course, you can connect via our website. want to uh, also let you know that you can connect with us on Facebook, <laughs> though I don't get on it often if you heard us at the top of the show, um, but some of us do, uh, like Dorothy Donahue who does uh, more often than I do, though she doesn't have that much more time. But uh, in any event, um, so do connect with us because we do not only enjoy hearing from you, but we, we learn what kind of guests you're interested in and, and what kind of topics that you uh, you're interested in and we appreciate the comments as well and we want to remind everybody that uh, we've been talking to and are still talking to Dr. William Tiller who is Professor Emeritus at Stanford University and to Doug DeVito who's got a bachelor's in chemistry and an MBA in, in uh, business and is the head of planning for the reconnection he's also an author of a book called The Upgrade, Fulfilling the Promise of Human Potential. So as we come back to both of you gentlemen, uh, Doug, this information that Dr. Tiller is talking about that was shared in this room as was this weekend, is you're not just talking about information uh, that we learn with our heads. That's correct. It's not just words. There's, uh, there's many different levels of communication that seem to be happening and have been documented to be happening both from the standpoint of the measurements that, that Dr. Tiller has done as well as many of the measurements that Dr. Gary Schwartz from the University of Arizona has done and Konstantin Korotkov and others. It, it's not just words. It's literally an energetic communication that transforms very likely our cellular and molecular structure and all of those people who are sitting in the room are literally soaking in that energy and being transformed by it. Uh, we, we see, with the, if I can just jump in, we see please. with the experiments that if you have, periodically, you have people focusing attention on the platform and then getting up and walking around and then sit down and then focus again, we find that when the people are focusing attention on the platform, we see the increase in thermodynamic free energy of the room. When they get up and walk around, we see a decrease. And when they change to sit down and pay attention again, then we see an increase. And we see these precisely. If we do this a dozen times, we see these differences occurring. And the information, <clears throat> I'm calling it infrastructure within some level of the self. The self is so much larger than we think it is. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no apologies necessary. I, I, I'm liking it. As a matter of fact, I, I, unfortunately, we have only about five more minutes here in this interview, and I'm thinking to myself, I can't wait to the next interview when I get to interview <laughs> both of you individually. Um, and maybe, Doug, for you, maybe that'll be when your book actually does come out. What is your book about, sure. if you want to share real quickly? Well, it's, it's actually talking about the experience of the people who are sitting inside the room. And as 
suddenly people become healers and, and master healers and suddenly they're gifted with abilities that they can feel and sense other inanimate objects in the sense of, you know, other human beings or, or animals. Of course, those are animate, but suddenly people are gaining abilities from sitting in that room. They can then help to heal others. They can heal themselves. But the biggest surprise, and this is why I had to write the book, was the people who are doing the work end up getting healings as well. So while they're there ostensibly in these healing sessions to learn how to heal others, and they do so, and there are wonderful results, they actually end up having physical and emotional and mental healings of their own on very significant levels. And that is the essence of the upgrade that's taking place. Wow. Uh, this is uh, this is exciting stuff. And gosh, uh, 40 minutes is just, just not enough. But Dr. Tiller, you, you, of course, shared a little bit of this information in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And I do encourage people to go out and see that if they haven't, get a DVD copy. Um, but uh, are you planning on doing any other movies or do you have any projects other than the Mastery Conference coming up, which we'll talk about in a moment, where we um, could hear you or see you? In general, the the only one that's definitely on the books um, is is the Mastery Conference. I do have something in November which is percolating in which I would teleconference be for eight or ten hours between... Uh, here in the U.S. and uh, Taipei in Taiwan. So that, then beyond that, there's I'm just doing work, other work. Yeah. We're, we're, we're glad you're doing the work and uh, sharing the information. And uh, you will be sharing information at the Mastery Conference this weekend. What will you be talking about there? Well, the title is called The Union of Logos and Mythos. Wow. Logos, okay. from the ancient Greek, logos means accessing nature by looking outwards. Uh, mythos is accessing nature by looking inwards. And the ability to, which is our next step of development, I think, is where we make a union between these two things. We're In the past, we've been either one or the other. And uh, it's time for us to be both. You, you know this this both business. Uh, are, are you? Some people have been saying that we're going to be bringing in the positive and the negative, and combining that, the feminine and the male, and combining that. It, it, do you get into that? It, well, the issue is, you know, nature, physics. Let's say physics. Physics is neutral. It can go in one direction or the other. However, you want to use it. You look for symmetries, but. There are all these possibilities, can occur, do occur. The data that comes from looking at reincarnation data means we've all been men and women at different times. We've all been children and parents at different times, different lifetimes, etc. So if you take that data and give some meaning to it in your life, then you'll see that this is the way in which we come, the soul, the human soul comes to a sense of balance in nature. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it's okay with me. Uh, what? When are we going to do this? Well, I'm 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 doing it on Sunday morning. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, I'm sure you are. But when are we individually going to do it? Well, the issue yeah. is, <laughs> it's coming whether we like it or not. But we can right. make it faster or slower. It's up to us. We are at the moment co-creating our future, and like everything else, it's really all up to us. There are calamities. If we fear calamities or we wish calamities, there is great joy, great wonderful opportunities if we adjust our mindset to be that, do that, become that, radiate that. It's up to us. So all of these things that have been written before us that say that there are, all, there are going to be these calamities and all that you just spoke about as well, you're saying that we can wish them away. Uh, no, well, wishing, it's a question of how, how your wishing comes about. The, the business of wishing, if you give great desire to an intention and you built yourself to become inner self-managed, so there's a lot of punch to your intention, then you can make changes. 
Mm. But just idly wishing, it isn't going to do it. it. It's building infrastructure into ourselves. We're the product of the process that we choose, and we become more and more and more so that eventually, way, way down the road in development, whatever we become, we become that which spins planets and stars out of ourselves. Mm. That's a long way down the road. Mm. But that's the potential that is within our evolutionary process. Wow. And that's to happen in our lifetime? No. Oh. No. I mean, that takes... Look, <clears throat> the there are avatars, all right, that we're heading along the path to move past becoming adepts to becoming masters and eventually avatars. Mm. We might be able to do... Some of us might be able to do that in this lifetime because we did a lot in earlier lifetimes. But these are slow processes. These are not quick processes. Mm. We are what becomes. It's making ourselves. Everything we do is an act of intention. Make the right intentions. Build yourself the right way. To me, consciousness is a byproduct of spirit entering dense matter. And spirit can only move into dense matter and attach there if we have built infrastructure into ourselves. You know, it's, the, it's like the issue of a radio station, okay? As you build yourself, then you broaden your bandwidth. Mm. And as you build yourself, you increase the amplitude of the signal you can send out. So eventually you get to be able to send out a very, very powerful signal over an incredibly broad band. That's what we become. Uh, I, I, I like it, and that's exactly what we're doing here, too, as we're building this network to spread this information to more and more people. Doug, you sounded like you wanted to chime in there for a moment. Did you want have something to say about that? Well, I would just say that it's important to recognize that there are also tools and, and, and bandwidths of, of information that are here now. There are things that are transforming people. Literally, people are suddenly getting upgraded and suddenly, you know, having their consciousness transformed from, you know, sitting in these incredibly energized rooms. And, you know, I think that ultimately the gift and the challenge of what we're facing is a, is a short term this lifetime choice that we're making and everyone now has a choice to step dramatically forward whether we all <laughs> suddenly become avatars or spin ourselves into stars i really like the way you say that bill um happens in this lifetime or not we can all take a huge tremendous evolutionary step forward now yeah i'd like to add one thing mm -hmm. it is at this point in time it is possible to create a technical future that reveals and, and is much much more joyful for humans than we presently have but the humans you have to pump the system to this higher level of reality and if humans are not willing to develop themselves so that they can automatically pump the system to this higher level of reality then you cannot have the scientific industrial technical society that can sustain that and it'll just collapse back to the kind of world we have at the moment. I, I, I'm beginning to understand that, and I appreciate you saying that. As a closing remark, Dr. Taylor, what would be to you the single most important action that uh, we could take to prepare ourselves for these coming changes? Well, I think the sing for me the single most important change is to begin to become a serious meditator within self to become inner self managed you become a meditator you go within you quiet the noise you begin to sense things you take advantage of things like the reconnective healing and other systems around I mean qigong is a way to increase power yoga is all so very beneficial in all of this sufism very beneficial in all this to seek to seek developing yourself within that's that's the single most important thing at this time because we're heading towards an, a change in the epoch several hundred years down the road if we don't blow ourselves up before then. Uh, but it really it's up to us. We have we have potential so vast. We're talking now about the physics 
of the physical vacuum. And if you take a cubic nanometer, which is something like one billion billion billionth of a meter, square, a cubic meter, that there is so much more energy in that little volume of the physical vacuum, which people think is nothing. There's more there than in all the planets and all the stars and all the cosmic dust in a cosmos of radius, spherical radius of 15 billion light years. So what we have been dealing with is trivial compared to what is there for us to work on by going within. Wow. Wow, that's exciting. Uh, Doug, in, in 30 seconds or less, so how about your response on that? My thought that, that I would like everybody to recognize is that probably the most powerful and evolutionary thing, the most healing thing that you can do for yourself is learning how to help to heal others. And that by doing so with these new frequencies of healing, you can make material, significant, substantial improvements in your own life. And you do that by actually healing others. And I think that is the next big secret that people need to know. Yep, I agree. Well, I think this has been incredible. And actually, you all could hear these gentlemen speak at the 8th Annual North American Mastery Conference, celebrating the reconnection of healing, science, and consciousness. Uh, joining them will be Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza, John Holland, Danian Brinkley, or Danian Brinkley, uh, Catherine Brinkley, uh, Terry Cole Whitaker, and Eric Pearl. So this is going to be a great opportunity to hear these 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 luminaries speak. Uh, you could go to thereconnection.com and learn more about that, and also to learn more about uh, our guest tonight, Doug Devito. You can also go to Tiller Foundation, T-I-L-L-E-R Foundation.com, to learn more about our guest, Dr. William Tiller. Or .org. It's .org. Tiller.org. Oh. Oh, sorry about that. That's it's, a simple one, tiller.org. Oh, okay, that's another one, and that's it's more simple. Okay, so T-I-L-L-E-R dot org. Uh, so with that, um, I thank you gentlemen, both Dr. Tiller and uh, Doug DeVito, for being on our show tonight and presenting all this great information. It was fun. <laughs> I, I'm glad. It, it was a pleasure having you. So uh, looking forward to actually seeing both of you this weekend. I believe I'll be interviewing uh, one or the other or both uh, on camera. So I look forward to that as well. Okay. See you soon. Yep, okay. Bye now. Bye. -bye. Uh, that's, that's a lot of fun. And, of course, if you didn't get those websites, you can always go to lifechanges.ws, and you can get the website uh, for each of those people there on our website. So, with that, we are now ready to bring on uh, Dorothy Lee Donahue with uh, Change Yourself, Change the World. And interestingly enough, uh, there has been a change in uh, um, uh, so, so many things going on in, in, in the world that I believe what she has to share with us will bring us to some of this. Shift is happening. It's happening all over the place. Um, as I mentioned, in January of this year, 2010 was declared the year of the shift for the light workers. And wow, what a shift it's been. For those of us who've been ready and willing to accept the responsibility for co creating our lives by shifting our consciousness from fear to love. And things just keep shifting and shifting and accelerating and accelerating for those of us who are choosing to step out of fear and into love. There are just not enough hours in my days and nights to process all of the information I've been downloaded with since September the 21st. And I want to share with the world all of the awesome and amazing gifts of unconditional love and magic and acceptance. Uh, that, that await our acceptance when we choose to love ourselves first and respect ourselves first. And then, and only then, can we love and respect one another as much as we all truly deserve to be loved and respected. Human beings are such 
funny creatures. We constantly search for love and respect from our parents, our siblings, classmates, relatives, bosses, business partners, neighbors, co-workers, lovers, wives, husbands, and others without realizing and understanding that it is impossible to achieve this without first loving and respecting ourselves. People are always asking me in sessions, why? Why doesn't he or she love me back the way I love him or her? Can't they see we're supposed to be together, they ask. I just don't know. I, I know, I know that he or she is my soulmate. You see it, don't you, Dorothy? In 999 out of a thousand cases, the answer is this. They can't love you because you're not loving you the best that you can. And sadly, no one ever argues with this. No one ever says, you're wrong about that. I love myself so much. However, every now and then, one out of a thousand will say, I'm working on that. Loving yourself is truly the first step to the happiness we all deserve. And if you haven't started a love affair with you, tonight's a good time to begin one. And it is the first step towards shift in consciousness. A classic example of not loving ourselves is a former client of mine, a woman who is head over heels in love, that's what she calls it, with another woman. The woman she's in love with is not only married, but she's also addicted to numbing herself out with sex, drugs, and alcohol because she's in denial about her sexual identity. If my former client would choose to love herself even a little, she could begin making more elegant choices instead of the very self-destructive choices she has been and is continuing to make now. She has been in this reactionship for over five years, and I only saw her once because it only took that one session for me to determine that she didn't want to take any responsibility whatsoever for her choices. She also couldn't or wouldn't tell me what it was that she loved about this other woman. Was it her addictions, her lack of sexual integrity, or any integrity at all for that matter? Her ability to lie to herself and to her husband and her children when she disappeared at all hours of the day or nights to be with my client? Or was it uh, all of the drama and all of the trauma associated with the reaction shift? I learned long ago that when people told me that they were crazy in love with someone, that the word crazy was more apropos than the word love. Besides loving ourselves first, we really have to be the first to respect ourselves. I have a very good friend who calls me quite often to complain about her business partners not respecting her. This is her usual rant. Why don't they respect me enough to listen when I speak? They ask me questions and then they cut me off. I've worked overtime for years and I've always put the company first. I never take any time off for myself. Why don't they treat me better? And my question to my friend and to all of our listeners who have similar situations is this. Why don't you treat you better? Respect yourself. Love yourself. Make the most elegant choices possible always. This, my dear friends, is what the shift is all about. And the simple truth is, we will never find love or respect as long as we continue to look outside of ourselves for it. However, the moment we decide we deserve the love and respect we have earned through becoming unconditionally loving and respectful, then and only then, shift happens. And the people who we genuinely love and respect will either shift with us or we will move on and shift without them and find the people who've been waiting for us and who deserve us and all we have to give. Please join me in shifting and expanding your consciousness. It's a wonderful world and we are moving so quickly. There's so much love. 
There's so much respect. There is so much happening. And until next week, please remember that you are the power in your world. And you are the guru you've been waiting and looking for. You're the only one who can end your suffering. And you can do this by beginning a love affair with you. Let us choose to become very conscious co-creators by making the most elegant choices possible. And let us never forget how powerful we are. We are powerful beyond measure. And we are love. We are lovable and we are love. Thank you, Dorothy Lee Donahue, with that change yourself, change the world. And so things are changing. And that show went by so quickly, maybe because we had two wonderful guests on at the same time. And I'm looking forward to our next week's wonderful guest, who's going to be uh, Daniel Pinchbeck, who is an author and also um, uh, the featured protagonist in a movie coming up, 2012, Time for Change. Uh, actually, we're going to be uh, doing a screening of that movie at Sunset Lamley in Los Angeles. Uh, I think it's at 7.30... Um, 7.30 um, on Wednesday the 13th. Uh, there's a lot going on this <laughs> this week and next week. We're actually uh, going to be at uh, the Mastery Conference Friday, Saturday, and Sunday interviewing these luminaries that we've mentioned throughout the show. And then, uh, gosh, there's something on Tuesday. I better look at our calendar. I don't remember. Wednesday, we've got the screening. And then on uh, Friday, we're going to be at the Conscious Life Expo at the Hilton in LAX. And we're going to be doing a Life Changes live event there. And we are going to have Alan Howard, who is uh, the guy that's responsible for bringing us scary music from uh, all the music in uh, Halloween and, Star and, 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 and movies like Star Trek and stuff like that. He's now doing raw music, music that cuts right through to the heart and brings the love vibration in and so much more. So you can learn about him by coming to our live event and also, and his raw music. And also um, our musical guest uh, is going to be Raspin Stewart, who is playing in all the Starbucks throughout Los Angeles. I mean, throughout uh, the country. So uh, more on all that, if you go to our website at lifechanges.ws. Uh, today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles, and Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit our sponsor page and click on their respective website links. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and it has been my pleasure being of service by hosting Life Changes with Filippo today. I, along with our hosts and producers Dorothy Lee Donahue and Mark M. Lejeure and our engineer Seth Hendrick thank you for joining us and being part of the show and being part of the change we all wish to see in the world ciao everyone you have been listening to Life Changes join us here every Monday night at 7pm Pacific Standard Time and visit us on the web at lifechangeswithfilippo.com that's Filippo F-I-L-I-P-P-O and follow our community on Facebook at Life Changes with Filippo. Join us here next week as we consciously embrace and explore the only constant, Life Changes.
The scientific world is now embracing the universal law that thought creates matter as scientifically authentic. There has been further acknowledgement of an unseen world that co-creates our reality, but it's been scientifically intangible. Now, however, we have Tellurian physics, with over 40 years of research behind him in this field. Dr. William Tiller became familiar to the public after his appearance in the explosive documentary, What the Bleep Do We Know? as humans. We know things deep inside, and yet our science has not caught up to that. And, and we'll see when we get to the theoretical part, it's very natural that it could not catch up to it because the present reference frame for viewing nature is totally inadequate to go where we want to go. That is to treat human consciousness as a significant experimental variable in physical reality. Having conceived a device which encapsulates particle energy waveform, this can now be released at a distant location. An effect, in fact, elevate the consciousness of those in the vicinity of the device to a higher level of physical reality. While energy of this kind is generally temporary, Dr. Tiller's most recent findings have shown that his device can be technologically enhanced from a distance and regenerated to keep the energy alive, constantly circulating at the point of placement, wherever in the world that, that may be. Basically, I will show you how we have to shift our frame of reference for viewing the universe. And I want to go back to quantum mechanics. One of the leading beginning points was de Broglie's particle pilot wave concept. Where that takes us once I make a couple of postulates, then go to Dirac's work on the origin of the electron, see what that tells us, postulate a bit more, and show you the multi-dimensional model for a view of the universe that would allow human qualities of mind, consciousness, intention, emotion, and spirit to be formally introduced to a mathematical structure, which would be an expansion of quantum mechanics. So we would have a paradigm different than the one we presently have. The present paradigm, there is no place in the formal structure wherein any human qualities can enter. And as my Russian friend is fond of saying, friends, that is Bolshitsky. <laughs> You've been applauded by many for thinking outside the box. Can you further explain this? Well, the issue is that we have a paradigm of science which, which has a reference frame of distance time and that particular reference frame and that particular science cannot say anything important about the wonderful human qualities of the consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, and spirit, because the experimental data that we've gathered so far seems to indicate that they are not distance and time dependent. And that's why we have um, great angst 
in the orthodox science community relative to phenomena uh, that are not just as a time to think. They had a tweet to it, but that's what the problem is. I mean, they had difficulty with parapsychology, as we would call it, for a century and a half. Because that category of phenomena is not distance time dependent. And what science looks for always is internal self consistency. So if you have a reference frame which is distance time related strongly, and you have a set of phenomena that are not responsive in the same way as the other category of phenomena that we have studied so well for the last 400 years, then Scientists, orthodox scientists, have to realize they've got a serious problem or they have to try to sweep it under the rug. And so orthodox science and orthodox medicine, because orthodox medicine depends on orthodox science, they have been trying to sweep these anomalous things under the rug for more than a century and will continue to do so until we expand the reference frame. In psychoenergetic science, I have expanded the reference frame to a duplex reference frame, which consists of two reciprocal four-dimensional domains, one of which is space-time, is distance-time. So all of our normal phenomena that science does so well with is present in that duplex reference frame. The reciprocal domain of distance and time are all frequencies. So it's a frequency domain, a four-dimensional frequency domain, in which we can deal with these qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, and spirit. At least that's my working hypothesis. And I should add to this because, let me go back to basically the question. This is the outer box boxness that I have brought to the table. I have articulated these things. I have done experiments to prove these things. And that's what the general public appreciates. The orthodox science community does not. They prefer to avoid it because it, can it, it creates a real conundrum for them. But once they understand that it's just an expansion of the reference frame because the reference frame that was, has been so wonderful for the last 400 years, it cannot capture these human qualities. And therefore, it is okay for them to expand the reference frame. They have to realize that there is at least one more reference frame in nature that is needed because there are sets of phenomena that are very important in our world that cannot be captured with their existing limited reference frame. So the work I have been doing has been pushing the boundaries to see what can be incorporated and what must be incorporated in an expanded reference frame. That's what other box means. Do you consider the objective goal of I think it is a valid goal, and I think that our technology can make the spheres appear sentient. Certainly, we can broadcast an intention to such a sphere that contains one of our intention post devices. And we can have an intent to radiate into the surround qualities that will lift the human spirit. Anything that can lift the human spirit and make people more aware and make them more loving, more compassionate, uh, more forgiving, more willing to cooperate with others, trusting others, recognizing the linkage that we have to each other. These qualities in principle can be radiating how much exposure is going to be needed for the people outside the sphere to really 
have that inside of them. I don't really know. But the more there is there, the better they will be. So we'll find out. We must do this job. It's valid. Do you feel this is interesting? You were saying that the federal discussion about emerging technologies and science to the best form the better off in our future. My answer would be yes. We're combining beauty, uplifting consciousness, reaching out beyond the norm, and integrating with expansion of technology in a healthy way because it reaches to humans, it reaches to the humanity. All of these other things are just training humans. The humans are the product of the process. We are built by the process. So this is a great step in such a process because it's full of aspirations and carries with it glory. So I'm happy to participate in such an adventure. Greetings. I'm Bill Tilly. For the past 35 years or so, in parallel with the traditional scientific research and teaching that I was doing at Stanford University, I have been seriously investigating the effects of human intention on both the properties of materials and upon what we call physical reality. Over the past 10 years, my colleagues and I have found that it is possible to significantly change the properties of a physical substance by holding a clear intention to do so. For example, we have been able to take a vessel of water and repeatedly change its acid alkaline balance, either upwards or downwards, by holding a clear intention to do so. This is very exciting for us, but even more exciting was the fact that we have found a way to take a simple electronic device and to store a specific human intention in its electronic circuitry. The importance of this is that now we can do the same kind of experiment anywhere in the world. We just send this intention host device that has been imprinted in a particular way to that location, plug it into a power source and turn it on. And then the people at that location can do the same kind of experiment. We have done this kind of experiment at 10 different locations in the U.S. and in Europe. And the results are consistently repeated. That's great. So how is it possible for us to do this kind of thing in our normal physical reality? And the answer to that question is our experimental research shows us that there are two unique levels of physical reality, not just one, not just the one that we are familiar with, that is the electric atom molecule level. We find that there is a second level, and it is this level that can be influenced by human intention. From our work, it seems that these two uniquely different kinds of substance interpenetrate each other. But under normal conditions, they do not interact with each other. And we have labeled this state the uncoupled state of physical reality. With the use of an imprinted intention host device, we reach the coupled state of physical reality, where these two kinds of substances begin to interact with each other. To illustrate this for you in a metaphorical way. 
let's look at this first figure. Here we see a set of black balls which represent the electric atom molecule substance. And they have black lines joining them, so they're interacting with each other. We also see smaller white balls. And there is no connection between them and the black balls. And that is meant to represent that they are not interacting. And this is what we call the uncoupled state. Now when we use the intention host device to change the space to the coupled state of physical reality, the black balls are still connected to each other, but now the white balls have dashed lines joining to the black balls. That is meant to represent that they are now interacting with each other. And this is the coupled state of physical reality. Now all of us sense our environment with our five physical senses, and we see it. We see our environment, and our technical instruments, traditional instruments, they also can detect our environment, and they can measure magnitudes of various things. That's what we find for the uncoupled state. But in that state, we do not sense this other level of reality, and our traditional measurement instruments cannot see or measure anything about that level of reality. That is because the second level of reality functions at the coarse physical vacuum level. However, when we use an intention host device to change the state of coupling, bring it to the coupled state of physical reality, now our traditional measurement instruments can partially access the physics going on in this vacuum state. These observations have really enormous implications for our work. Implications for humans, for science, for technology, for education, for business. Really everything about our world. When we turn to humans, our work is still a couple of years away, but very close to being able to produce a biofeedback device that actually measures the ability of an individual to intend and to display that information on a meter so that the individual can look at the needle at a particular measurement point and intend within themselves to increase the position of the needle, move it upscale. This is very much like an individual working in a gym to build, build their physical musculature. In this case, they will be building infrastructure at some level of self that will allow them to become much more capable in any particular area that they desire, whether it be music, art, drama, sports, science, technology, education, business, etc. It seems that what an in the individual intends for themselves with a strong, sustained desire, that is what they eventually become. you on the street and said, Bill, that was so wonderful. What's, I want more. I want, I need to, I want to sink my teeth into this, whatever this is, more. How would you answer that? Well, the, I, I think, I think it is really important for the humans, in, the general humans, to become more and more inner self-managed. The first step is that is to really learning and appreciating medita meditation so you can reduce the noise level inside. The second thing when that's accomplished is to really start to 
play with your own internal energies. That gets into the practices of like Qigong. And with that, then you now have a quiet inside. You now have ways to enhance your energy. Now what you need are biofeedback devices. So you can build your inner capacity. The, our work shows that all humans have their acupuncture meridian chakra system at this higher gauge symmetry state <coughs> that we produce with our devices. And what that means <coughs> is that your intentions modulate or entangle with this energy flowing in that system. And that's at a higher free energy state, thermodynamic free energy state, than our normal reality, where most of our organs are. And so, from this higher free energy state, that is able to drive all processes in our body and outside of our body, so that actors, performers of all kinds, people who really accomplish things in the world, they unconsciously use that system and they build that system. So now we need tools for the general public to build that system. And so those tools, uh, which we're working towards with our, our work, will allow them to go from a normal individual to an adept and then to a master and ultimately to an avatar. And all of us, I think, will ultimately take that path. So <clears throat> it, is, it is time to get about the business of really becoming. And uh, that's what I think is the next step. I mean, what the bleep has opened the door, it's, it's caught the public's imagination, the general public. They want to do more. They want to be more, be more. They want to know how. Uh, we now have device, which we're, patent hasn't been released yet, but allows us to measure the energy level of a conditioned space above our normal background reality, the human state. So we can have a quantitative measurement. So we can build an instrument that will do that. It'll be like a bolt meter, but it'll be we call it the size of H plus meter. But <clears throat> it would allow us to do that in rooms, and then ultimately if we shrink that down in size to be able to do it around the human body, we will be able to see what the level of chi flow is in and out of the body. And that then can become a device that the individual can use as a biofeedback device to build their inner strength in these capacities, just as the physical gym uh, is being used today for people to buff themselves. You know what they call the vibe meter? <laughs> Vibometer? I don't know what to call it, really. The, uh, as a scientist, I've got to be careful not to be too flip about it, mm. um, because I would ultimately like to reach that condition. But maybe it has to be called a vibe meter because the intermediate step to really awaken society is probably the transformation of the gender. Actually, now that I think about it, I think the vibometer would be better. Because if you say vibe meter, it's a little too, di -di, but vibe op, vibe yes. Um, From the world of marketing, that's my that's right. my input to the scientific world. I will I will meditate. On that. Okay. <laughs> so interesting. So you have a device, the vibometer, we'll call it, yes, just, for, just for fun, um, the condition, the condition space, the condition, yes. what, could you do, what is that condition space in, in very practical terms so the public you're talking about wanting to reach understands? Well, in, in, in practical terms, the way I'm presently describing it is that the normal reality deals with the atom molecule level. our space, our device that conditions the space, what it does, it allows the connectivity between the atom molecule level of reality and the vacuum level of reality to increase. In the normal reality, it, the connectivity is very, very small. In the theory, there has to be some in order for electromagnetism to exist of any form. But it in order to detect it, we must do very careful experiments and deep down in the statistics you've got to get to do that. But with this device, which is consciousness embedded into the device, that lifts, that consciousness seems to lift the symmetry state 
And in practical terms, it means that the connectivity between the atom molecule and the vacuum level increases. It's as if they're parallel universes, right? And you can only measure in one universe. So in the normal reality, it's as if this is unconnected because you can't get a signature with your instruments. But with consciousness, which lifts the gain symmetry state, which is also a higher thermodynamic free energy state, then it increases this coupling and we begin to access the physics of the vacuum, which appears to be very much related to magnetic monopoles, as well as a whole variety of other things. And accessing that new physics allows intention to bring forth effects you wouldn't imagine. Now, um, the zero-point energy field you're talking about, could you just very briefly describe what, you, you talked about that last night. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a, is it a zero-point energy field? Well, first of all, physics to define zero-point energy a long time ago, that's when you're at absolute zero temperature, there is still a vibrational state in the atom molecule level of reality, and because there are, there are these vibratory states, then as, as electrons move from one state to another, they'll emit photons. So the zero point energy is very much related to a spectrum of photons. The energy in that state, this photon energy, is smaller than the atom energy. And the atom energy is trivial in magnitude compared to the vacuum level energy we're talking about. So the zero point energy and the zero point field, people talk a lot about. Uh, and they're important, but in terms of the magnitude of the energies involved, they're quite insignificant compared to the energies that we'll discover in the vacuum, the vacuum level of reality and the deeper levels of, of that. So the, the one has to begin, one, one cannot use just a single blanket word of saying the zero point. As, as many, many people are doing. It's convenient, but it's, it, ultimately it gets in the, in the way of, exp of understanding these things deeply. It becomes a pop mm -hmm. kind of thing to, to say. And so I make in my new book um, and in others, um, I make a real distinction between these two. I don't mean to knock zero point energy. It's, it's going to turn out to be important in many ways. Um, but people have a real misconception. They think that that's everything, yeah, but it's not. So then there's the, the, the vacuum energy. Right, which yeah. is huge. What, um, you, you did an analogy last night about the, could, could you go? Okay, because that's so much, right. you know, one thing, let me just tell you, we're, we're, we're going to do this rabbit hole version of the, the movie. And as we do the rabbit hole version, <clears throat> talk about a concept, we're just going to basically go down smaller and smaller, more right. detailed, and let people blow in. Yep. And of course, the vacuum field is such a wonderful way of just describing that plunge into another reality. So it is. Well, certainly, in, in my model, as you go from normal physical reality, and you're going to shrink, you're going to go then to the next level, which will be the, va the physical vacuum level of reality. And if you keep shrinking more, you'll go to the emotion domain level of reality. When you shrink more, you'll go to the mind domain level of reality. When you shrink more, you'll go to the spirit domain level of reality. So they're all in this metaphorical picture you're describing of a rabbit hole. And so the one thing that could be said for, we'll, we'll come back now to the atom molecule where we have quantum mechanics on the one hand, relativity theory on the other hand, two to be internally self-consistent. And a sidebar is that science doesn't give you truth. All it can determine is internal self-consistency. That, that's all science can do. And for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent with the two of them, then the vacuum, the physical vacuum, is predicted to have a latent energy of 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, in practical terms, how do we grapple with that? All right, we, take, we can take a comparison, two things. We can take the volume of the known universe, that is like a sphere with a 15 million billion light year radius, and we can multiply it by the average mass density, which 
astronomers give us a number for. And so we have, we have the right hand number. On the other hand, we can take a simple, just a single hydrogen, which is mostly empty space, and say, okay, that's, that's, let's look at that amount of vacuum, and we'll multiply it by this 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeter. And we get a number. And that number is a trillion times this number. Now, the assumption in making this sum of calculation is you, you have to assume, or we assume, that the universe is fairly flat. Okay? The curvature is, is very, very small. And that's what astronomer, astronomers tell us is the case. But it's not perfectly correct. So this isn't an absolutely accurate comparison. But it's a good comparison, because it realizes that just that little bit of vacuum outweighs all the mass and all the planets and all the stars and each of those grams of energy are equals mc squared. So when you begin to really grasp this, you begin to grasp the enormity of the energy that could be involved in going down this route of ground. What is available for us to use in the future to take us to the stars, etc. The issue is we are perturbing this with consciousness. We are able to, with directed consciousness and intention, we are changing things at the vacuum level, which then allows to access new level physics. So we can do that at that level, not so much at the atom molecule. That's a secondary effect. So, so we, we're already doing it, in essence. We're already getting into the rabbit hole by using intention. As you go down, you're going to successively higher gain symmetry states. And as you do, the thermodynamic free energy of unit volume goes up and up <coughs> until you get to the place of what caused the original Big Bang. So it seems like if there's that much energy in that small space everywhere, it's I mean, is it almost like um, <coughs> we're sitting on, on top of a huge wave, or, or it's more like there seems. I mean, why, why doesn't the whole universe just explode then? Well, it's, it's potential. But it's not. <clears throat> it has to be unlocked. It's there, okay? It's just, just as if you have, if you have an atom, okay? The fundamental particles are in a combined state, and what their interaction, combining into a stable mode, an emergent property, it is a potential well. The, the atom resides at the bottom of a potential well, otherwise it would explode apart. Well, it's the same sort of thing as you go down here. And if you take it as a metaphor, that there is a kind of substance that is, you can think, if you like, you can think of a cosmic atom. The simplest part is what we know of, right? the electrical aspect of that. The next part would be the interaction with the magnetic monopole aspect. And then the next part would be the aspects that relate to the motion theory, and then the mind theory. And so you, you build a more and more complex interacting thing, which is, which is doing a divine dance. And so the stored energy is in this unit. Okay? So in, in essence, that's what you would have to unlock if you want to release and use that energy. Well, if you have your vibrometer, and that can measure uh, condition space. Is the next step to build a device that actually directly modifies that condition space? In other words, first they had thermometers, and then people figured if you light a fire, you raise the, the uh, <coughs> temperature, which of course the thermometer. So in your plans, do you see a uh, um, the equivalent of something where you can a device is built that you can change your symmetry states? Um, the first level for us is to build a standalone kind of device. At the moment, we have to take three streams of data and we have to work with the computer to convert them to the theoretical construct we've developed for this particular potential, which is called the magneto electrochemical potential energy. And it's just an expansion of conventional thermodynamics. Um, and having that standalone, it'll be like a voltmeter in essence. Then, then anyone could just, you know, plug it into the wall uh, or whatever, and it would register, continuously register what's going on in the room. And 
that will be the first step. And the, f the second step will be you can use our work seems to suggest that you can enhance the capabilities of every bit of technology that we have in the world today by having that technology run in a conditioned space. Okay, because now you're accessing another level of physics. And, and that can augment. I mean, the intentions, just as we can change pH up or down by one full pH unit, and in living system, you go plus or minus a half a pH unit in either direction, you're dead on both ends. So these are very big effects. Uh, so, for example, in terms of, of healing, one of the things that we ultimately expect to do is to be able to broadcast this so that we create an environment where people are 500 or 1,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away, wherein they can use their intention to enhance their health. So, it, so you can begin to see how you can influence various technologies. In a, let's say in a, a chemical plant or pharmaceutical plant, you, they want to make a particular product, and the product has isomers, so there are other things that are created at the same time, and the yield of the one they want is very low. Well, one uses intention to enhance the yield of the one they want and diminish the yields of the others that occur, so it's much easier to extract the one they want. A lot of savings. Uh, you can consider it in terms of, you know, in, in artificial intelligence. That has not been a big success because it doesn't have intelligence beyond what people put in the software. This stuff we're doing seems to have an innate intelligence in the sense that it, it not only lifts the gauge symmetry state of the space, but it tunes it to a specific intention. That, that requires intelligence. It just does that. It doesn't do all these other things. The ones that we, the devices we create for affecting fruit fly larvae, their ATP to ADP ratio, or uh, liver enzyme, or water, they're all different. One doesn't do the job of the other. So that's very interesting. And the, the really key interesting thing is, is that when these processes are used, and the gauge symmetry state of the space is raised, the thermodynamic free energy per unit volume of that state is raised. So for the very first time in human history, we see a process going on very different than the normal one, which is increase of entropy and degradation of potential. We see the reverse. We see increase of potential, which probably means reduction of entropy. There is a dictionary version of awareness, awakeness, so on. That's trivial. It's, it's true, but it's trivial. The, my own working hypothesis is that consciousness is a byproduct of spirit entering dense matter. And spirit can only enter dense matter if one does work on themselves, inner work, to build infrastructure into self. And as you build infrastructure into yourself, more spirit enters and therefore more consciousness exists within you and you become aware of things you were never aware of before. Right. And then you do more work on yourself and you become more conscious and you unfold step by step. Right. All of us have within us the capability of doing that. All of us have the infrastructure. Our experiments show, I can relate how and why, but they show that the human acupuncture meridian system is already at the coupled state of physical reality, which means that humans using unconscious intention or conscious intention can move chi. Chi in my modeling is magnetoelectric energy, the counterpart of electromagnetic. It comes from the higher gauge symmetry state. Human biofield builds this space around them. It becomes a sacred space, becomes them. We can do all things, ultimately, as humans. As humans, we become the receptacle of everything. I look at this outside of us as just a classroom created for our development. We are the product of the process. We're not aware of it, but we are the product of the process, and we're built by the process. But we have free will, and we choose our process. Uh-huh. Yes, indeed. We choose what, what to believe in, what not to believe in, what to test 
and fond of saying, if you don't see the traps in life, you have to go through the tricks, the crap, until you see the traps. Uh, because that's you've decided that's your only teacher. Right. I mean, if you're not going to really think and reflect about things, then this is nature. This is why it takes it such a long time for humans to evolve. There's been a, a book written by a man by the name of a Dane, name of Tor Noritrander, oh, yeah. called The User's Illusion, mm -hmm. Cutting Consciousness Down to Size. And one of the important things I found there was the awareness that the human unconscious is about a million times the information handling capacity of the human conscious. The human conscious is less than 50 bits per second, whereas the unconscious is more like 50 million bits. Just at the five physical senses level, nothing deeper than that, just at that level. Really? And what the unconscious, so unconscious is doing all of the work. Right. It's gathering all the information, it's processing it, it's doing all kinds of things, and it feeds little kernels of information to the conscious, but of a size that the conscious can digest so it can have an experience in life and awareness. But if the unconscious has not given meaning to certain things, the, if the conscious has not given meaning to it, then the unconscious will not wrap those up in kernels to send to the conscious. So it's like a filter that an individual does on their own unconsciously and so they only get become conscious of things as they give meaning to them. And what we give meaning to, we become. And the more in experiments, the more you condition a space with your meaning, the more it becomes. But then isn't like, that an arbitrary application? Of course it is. But that's what our growth is. That's why our potential is so great. If people don't do work on themselves inside and really treat each other as brothers and sisters, and you know that I mean it's been said many many times many many times yeah uh, what we have to do and it's really so simple but you have to get past your own ego the ego is a good thing okay but it's usually in service to self but if you can put your ego in service to the larger whole then you have a chance of really contributing to the world and the growth of the world and what we can be. I remember I asked the numerical question once, what does it mean if just one soul adds to the coherent being of what we'll call God? And let's just say that's a billion souls, let's say, that are coherent. And Generally, we find, at least at this level of reality, that things go as the mathematical square mm -hmm. of, of the field. So, so let's take a billion plus one. I'll be the one, say. And you, so as you got a billion and one, and you mathematically square them. So you get a billion squared, that was God, before I came along. One squared is one, that's, that's me. But the cross product is two billion. Hmm. So you can begin to see what, some idea of what it means as we evolve to the place where we join the all.
back when I decided that uh, the psychoenergetic science approach um, was more beneficial for humanity than the orthodox science I was doing every day. And I was well regarded around the world for my orthodox science, and I needed to keep my day job to feed my family. But I could give up being department chair in my government committees and my professional committees to have the time to do this other area of activity in, in uh, my life. Um, and so I did that. Uh, people were shocked and surprised, etc. cetera, but um, to thine own self be true, as far as I could see. And, and from my perspective, this other was very, very important for humanity. So back in 1971, I made that decision. And ever since, I took the extra time and I divided it into three parts. Um, the first one was continued experiential development of self. The second part was continue to theorize how the universe might be constructed to allow this crazy seeming kind of stuff to naturally coexist with orthodox science. And the third, third was to design and do experiments to keep the theory honest. And I've been doing that for the last, uh, what is it now, um, 40, 42 or 43 years. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, it's interesting what you're speaking in that um, real power true peace. The reason I developed this is and made the focus on embracing your mastery is to look at our potential and to begin moving into it in all the different ways that are possible which also of course in alignment with what you said in my understanding is that we've got to wrap in that experiential wisdom with the intellectual knowledge without putting that really at the forefront we're just going to keep spinning around but I had a, get, um, a teacher, Robert Greene, he's an author, and he um, sp you know, spoke about the mastery, and his whole book is on mastery, and he said he really wanted people to understand about you know, when you have that inkling of what you feel passionate toward, don't just walk away from it. You know? And what I hear you just did is you straddled the boat. Because like you said, you had to pay for your family, but you still opened the door to the other work that you were passionate about. And it's given you the extraordinary life that you've lived and the information that you've brought to light that no one else has in the way that you have. I, I think that's, that's true and you have nailed it pretty well. I, I think this is one of the weaknesses of our present educational system. It's focused very much on Mm, plowing over knowledge, um, having a channel of communication which is mainly knowledge-based, and there is almost no experiential development of self. I think that a properly balanced society would divide the time between experiential development of self and the infusion of knowledge uh, to build into the organism of the human being so that the human then can develop and plumb the deeper depths of reality. At the moment, our orthodox science, well, let me go back one step. I like to look at a picture of nature as it unfolds, as we need to build a ladder of understanding, which goes from sort of where we are at any point in time and the higher and higher levels of reality. And the Orthodox Science community, which began this path called the Logos Path or the Science Path, um, about 500 years ago, uh, in the days of Galileo and Kepler and Newton uh, and Copernicus, of course, and that was the transition from a theocratic society to the beginning of scientific society. And the key reference frame for studying nature was distance and time. And we have done that for the last 400 years, basically. And we've been very successful 
But the dilemma is that science and thereby medicine have taken the attitude that it was a distance time only reference frame and that everything in nature, the expressions of nature had to fit into that reference frame, which the work that I've been doing on the side for these last 42 or more years um, shows that that is not correct and that there are there's huge new physics to be sought out for adventure. Uh, right. Is this what you did with your um, with the white paper research and everything on the mythos and logos? Yes, basically that's that's it. Ultimately, we'll get to the place where mythos and logos will unite. I mean, mythos is looking inward for knowledge. Logos is looking outwards for knowledge. We are well. We have reached the bottommost rung of the ladder. We've completed the bottommost rung of the ladder. And we are now reaching for the second run. It's taken us 400 years to fill in the bottommost rung of the ladder, which is the distance time reference frame. And the science and medicine that we know are really all tied to that. But the next rung of the ladder deals very much with what we would call the physics of the physical vacuum, where the domains of substance that function there all seem to go faster than light, and none of our instrumentation can perceive that information. Yes, so, I want to go deeper into that because this is some of the this is some of the most important um, information that I have um, gathered from you that I think it's really really important for people to understand. But before we go there, I, I just want to go back for a moment. And if you could give me just the simplest explanation of mythos and logos, what do those two words mean, stand for? Well, mythos is generally thought of as the mystical path, um, but in fact, it's the inner path. Um, let's say examples of mythos would be the, those we would call Christs who were uh, teaching us, we start with Krishna. We could go to uh, Melchizedek. We could go to Moses. We could go to Lutzal. We could go to Confucius. We could go to Buddha. Mm -hmm. We could go mm -hmm. to Jesus. We could go to Mohammed. We could go to Abdul Baha and many others. These right. are elder brothers for us who have walked the path and shown us the way. That that basically is the mythos path. The logos path is the path of science. Um, the previous paradigm was an, uh, basically those the theocrats. They had a particular vision or version of nature, which they followed, and they thought they knew everything. Because they thought they knew everything, they wouldn't look through uh, Galileo's telescope. Um, because if they had, they surely would then find what mistake they were making. And their prime mistake was, of course, that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth. That's kind of egocentric. Um, but it was the paradigm of the time. And science very quickly showed uh, through that work of Galileo and Kepler and Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus, of course, didn't reveal it, or did, had made sure it wasn't revealed till after he was he had passed on, uh, because otherwise he would probably have been burned at the stake for being a heretic. Being a heretic. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. interesting word, isn't it? It shows up again. It is an interesting word. Fortunately, in today's uh, world, we no longer burn heretics at the stake, but you do. They do take laboratory space. We do mock them. You, you, you. They do make it difficult for you to get research support. They won't yeah. publish certain papers that you would like right. to have published in major journals because they say, "Oh, our readership is not interested in this kind of material." That's right. Like, so, 
I mean, it is the way it is. So the yeah, and it is the consciousness. It is the consciousness of those who aren't ready. You know, and in that same way, um, you know, what I what it caused me to think about on a very you know simplistic level, in a sense, is like uh, Orville Orville and Wilbur Wright. Yeah, well, people said they, they were completely loony, you know, with their ideas, and yet they, you know, if they didn't, you know, push the envelope we probably wouldn't be still flying around today. That's so it seems that those who are the head of the curve, you know, and I would say that a lot of people listening here have experienced that in their own lives, that they have found that when they get insight and they want to share it with others, that depending on who you're sharing it with, you could get a blank stare <laughs> or, you know, that there's still, you know, not that wide of an opening, and yet it is changing all the time. The unstated assumption since the days of Descartes by orthodox science has been that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. We imprinted consciousness into a little electronic box. Wow. And then we used the electronic box. We switched it on in a space where we were gathering background data, experimental data, and it had a specific intention. We did it from a deep meditative state, four people. We have an unimprinted device and an imprinted device um, we can separate them by 100 meters, turn them off electrically, and in three to five days, the unimprinted device picked up the imprint. Okay? And, and it could influence an experiment just the way this other one could. But the boxes were off electrically. So there was no information transfer by electromagnetic radiation that we know of. Right. Right. So therefore... Therefore, there has to be another communication channel in the universe that orthodox science is not aware of. For the past 30 years, he has been pursuing serious experimental and theoretical study of the field of psychoenergetics, which he thinks is a very important part of tomorrow's physics. This is a whole new arena, and he's published over 100 scientific papers and two seminal books. With our prompting, and that's Robin and Cody's prompting, Bill has engaged the orb phenomena and will be lending to us the benefits of his research into both the physical and metaphysical aspects. He was a featured scientist in the film, What the Bleep Do We Know? And following, uh, his presentation, he will be doing a book signing at the ARC and um, at the ARC bookstore in the next room. And there's a lot of other great authors there at that bookstore. So thank you very much. We we'll welcome William Tiller. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here uh, with you, and thank you very much, Lane. Um, oh, okay, I'll just use this, good. Um, minor correction, the, in my conventional science, I have published about 260 scientific papers and three books, and in this new area, um, it's now about 150 scientific papers, and three books out, and the fourth one uh, showing in the bookstore, which will be, it's just being printed now, it'll be available in a month. So, orbs. Are they a psychoenergetic phenomenon? And the thing that I find interesting is that if I look, if you look at the background picture, what you would see is, um, yeah, I am going to need a pointer. Um, oh, it's here, pardon me. Uh, that's pretty fast, indeed, right. All I have to do is figure out how I'm going to work it. Ah, oh, it's that end, right. Yes. The, what you, this, this model that I'll be, you know, you're not going to get 
very much of it because there isn't time. But the theoretical model I use to quantitatively assess these class of phenomena is something I call a duplex space. There are two reciprocal four spaces, one of which is space-time, and it's conjugate, uh, is, a, is a basically a frequency domain. And so, because of the mathematical connections between such things, if you have a quality in direct space, that's space-time, then you can calculate, in principle, a, uh, the conjugate equilibrium quality in the reciprocal space-time. So basically, I decided to do the situation with a series of gold dots in a spiral form in our direct space-time, and then calculated all this stuff in the background, which is in the reciprocal space-time, an unseen domain for most of us. And it looks remarkably like some of the orbs that we have been talking about. So we'll get to that. Anyway. The thing you need to know is my personal bias as I enter this. It's always sort of been there. To me, we are all spirits having a physical experience as we walk the river of life together, or we ride the river of life together. Our spiritual parents dressed us in these bio body suits and put us in this playpen that we call a universe in order to grow in coherence, in order to develop our gifts of intentionality, and in order to become what we were intended to become, which is co-creators with our spiritual parents. It's a very long path, but it's a very interesting path, and you will not be bored. So, so don't think of instant mm, manifestation of all these wonderful things that you will eventually all manifest and eventually all go through the same process as you choose. It's free will. There's no growth without free will. Okay, the second thing I want to say, I was asked to speak at this conference by Robin and Cody, not because I had done great experimental work in the orbs. I haven't. I don't even, I don't even use a camera. And I don't use a computer. Others do it for me. My wife gets um, unhappy with me at times because I don't take pictures. But that's the way it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> However, Jean and I have been walking this path for, well, we'll be 55 years married next month. And, and she has been my very valuable partner on the path. Not because she's scientific, but because she's loving and compassionate and she puts up with my crap. <laughs> but we've had a lot of experience of unseen domains as well as seen domains. And my science has tried to bridge these two. My goal in this lifetime is to build a reliable bridge of understanding that seamlessly joins with conventional science that we've learned over the last 400 years and bridges, passes through the subtle domains, the domains of psychic phenomena. It's also a forest of great entanglement of psychic phenomena into, the, into and through the domains of emotion and mind and becomes firmly locked in the bedrock of spirit at the other end. And the goal is to build this bridge reliably and in a structurally sound way so that all of our family will want to walk across that bridge. So that's, that's my purpose. Um, Basically, I'm going to break the talk at three points. There will be the one at the last, and I'll open it for questions and answers for five minutes only each time. And I would ask you to be, that your questions be relevant to the material and that they be concise, because we, I don't have enough time as is. 
Um, and if that, if you cannot follow that, I will have to not allow any questions. So be warned. Okay. First thing is, what is what is psychoenergetic science? All right. Traditional science is the place to start, and the metaphorical reaction equation for traditional science is this mass with arrows back and forth to energy, with the connecting link being Einstein, the main one, there are many, but the connecting link is Einstein's E equals mc squared. For the last 400 years, traditional science has basically all of the things we've done can be somehow put into this equation in at least a qualitative way. And the unstated assumption of this since the days of Descartes have been that no human quality of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. Now, there has been abundant data for the last 150 years, practically, that there is something going on beyond this, okay? Um, the experiments that we've done show that in the vernacular of my Russian friend, it's Bolshitsky. <laughs> but but it, has, it has served a very useful purpose. It has used, it served a very useful purpose. And for the last 400 years, using that unstated assumption, they have, the scientific community has structurally built the lowest rung of the ladder of understanding. The work I will talk to you about, about a little bit, is the second rung of the same ladder. And as we move forward, as we ride the river of life, um, through epochs yet to come, the various rungs of these ladders will be built and be built reliably and quantitatively by perhaps many of you in a future lifetime. So it's important to understand the perspective. I mean, this work was good work, okay? But because the phenomena we're talking about could not be understand, understood within the model that's presently used by traditional science. It's been more comfortable for the scientific community to sweep things under the rug, very much as the priests did in Galileo's time. They would not look through the telescope at the data. It's a very human thing, okay? So, I'm saying that our present science is wonderful and inadequate to go forward, all right? So the psychoenergetic science, I think, is the next step. And the next step, in fact, is to take this starting metaphorical equation and add consciousness to it, all right? Now, the, our dictionaries have a definition of consciousness, meaning awareness, awakeness, so on. It's very, very small in, in that perspective. I think consciousness is much, much more. It's on par with these in terms of being something unique in the universe. My own personal definition is, my working hypothesis, let us put it that way, is that consciousness is a byproduct of spirit entering dense matter. And as we build ourselves to build infrastructure into the many layers of ourselves, now spirit can attach. And as spirit attaches, we become more conscious. And as we become more conscious, we see things and understand things that we never could see and understand before. And so this bootstrap process goes on. Self-building, more spirit enters, more conscious do we become, more do we see what is behind us, with us, and ahead of us, and so we go forward. Now, oh, I should go back one step, because basically, so I'm asking you, 
not so much to ask what consciousness is. You know, if you ask the question, what's an electron? We don't know the answer to that one either. What is space? We don't know. What is time? We don't know. So the issue is, instead of asking what consciousness is, let us ask what consciousness does. And as soon as you do that, you begin to see, oh, consciousness manipulates information. Whether we're talking about a, a sum of numbers or multiplication of numbers and so on, the manipulation of numbers, or whether we're taking alphabetical letters and assembling them into words and into sentences, um, and we see that information in those sentences, whether it's a set of symbols that a mathematician puts together to make a grand equation, like Einstein's E equals MC squared. There's huge information content in those things. And if you're like myself and my wife on a, on a Sunday where it's kind of drab and dull, we pull out a table and, and get a jigsaw puzzle and put it on the table and start assembling some beautiful picture. So it's all the creation of information. So, and now let me describe why information is the important connecting link here. The, we have found, we've known for the last 60 years, since the days of Shannon and Brewan, that if there is an, in a process in nature, if there's an information increase, then what that means is that there is a decrease in entropy. There's a decrease in disorder in the universe. And if there's a decrease in disorder, it means you're restoring potential to the universe. It means that there's not going to be a cold death to the universe, as people have thought. Because the potential, once you create information, okay, in our lives, in our processes, then we get this quantity called a change in the entropy. So that instead of entropy increasing in all processes in nature, those that generate information, the entropy actually decreases because you're making more order. And it turns out that this change in information is a negative change in the entropy. It's given by Boltzmann constant and times a logarithm of the ratio P0 to P1, where P is the number of microscopic distinguishable states in the system. Okay, it's all complex mathematical googly ook, but nonetheless, it's very meaningful because it allows you to get to numbers, all right? And, and it becomes quantitative and therefore becomes very, very useful. Actually, you see, it isn't energy that drives the processes in nature. It is the, we've known for 150 years, it's the, ma the master, it's the thermodynamic free energy potential. So we've known this, the master potential is a function. It turns out it's in one of the great uh, men of the last uh, two centuries ago is Gibbs, Willard Gibbs and another Helmholtz. And they have, here's a representation of Gibbs. This is energy. This is pressure times volume minus temperature times entropy. So we see that in this equation, entropy is on par, when you take the temperature into account, on par with energy. So you can begin to see now why information is the appropriate next term in this expanding function. I'll just drop it in. In my view, the term beyond consciousness actually is love. That's the creative force. So, but we won't get into that today. Um, so the point is that in nature, processes can be driven by a change in the free energy. So long as in the process, the we have a thermodynamic driving force from state one or state zero to state one, and it's greater than zero, then the process will occur. And so it can occur by changes of energy, changes of pressure, by changes of volume, by changes of temperature, or changes of entropy. And the analogy in your mind is think the following way. In the last century, Physicists learn a tremendous amount about nature, fundamental particles in nature, by generating beams of particles and shooting them at targets, which may be other beams going in the other direction. And there's huge explosion of, of new particles and stuff that they have to track. And out of looking at this fallout, they are able to learn a great deal about particle physics. 
All right, that's where we are now. And they went through that, but they really worked in this thermodynamic free energy, they worked the energy game. I'm saying now, as we come to the information aspect, and you go deep within yourself, and in our processing, we meditate and we imprint intentions into devices which then can make changes in the world. We, we can do likewise by going into ourselves and building infrastructure into ourselves, and then spirit enters, etc. So that becomes information. So it's an entirely different way of trying to extract new knowledge of our world and other worlds. But it's, it's working on a different part. It's working on this S part rather than this E part. It's just another way of revealing things in nature, okay? Now, what we have done over the last mm, 10 years or more, um, we, have, we have looked at this unstated assumption and said, if it was ever right, you know, or wrong, it may be different now. And so now let's really check out this unstated assumption of science, that consciousness is not a meaningful experimental variable in our physical world. And so what we did is we designed four target experiments. The first one was to take the water of a particular kind, generally pure water was the easiest way to do it because you can purify it. Um, and the intention was to increase its pH okay, in equilibrium with air with no chemical additions and the intention was to increase it by one full pH unit and our measurement accuracy was one one hundredth. So the intention was to have a result that was a hundred times the noise. That's a, you gotta have a lot of faith to do that. The second experiment was to take the same water and reduce the pH by one full pH unit, okay, in equilibrium with air no chemical additions. So up and down, same water, but, di but a different intention, a different experiment. Um, and as you probably know, all biological organisms have an internal pH, um, well, at least in the blood. Um, but in our case, the stomach acids are very acidic. Other parts of the body are, are definitely not. So you have to be careful what pH you're talking about. But if you take the pH of blood and you increase it by a half a pH unit, you're probably dying or dead. If you decrease it a half a pH unit, you're probably dying or dead. So one pH unit is a lot, okay, for a biological system. And then the third target experiment was to take a particular liver enzyme, alkaline phosphatase in vitro, and to, the intention was to raise its thermodynamic activity by just being exposed to we'll call it a condition space, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, for 30 minutes. Um, and then it's analyzed. And then the fourth is to take a living system, an in vivo study of fruit fly larva, to, and the intention was to increase the energy storage molecule, ATP, in the cells of fruit fly larva, uh, compared to its chemical precursor, okay? And the fruit fly larva cells the ATP and the ADP, the chemical precursor, are the same as in our, our body, okay? So, and the, and the idea behind that was that if you make the, uh, if you do that, then you make the larvae more fit. And if they're more fit, they'll have a shorter development time to the adult fly stage. All of these four experiments were done, and they were robustly successful. We, um, increased, well, we, we did the pH of the water up, we did the pH of the water down, um, we did the uh, alkaline phosphatase, an increase of 25, 30% with an exposure of just 30 minutes to a conditioned space. And in the fruit fly larva, the increase of the ATP of the order of 20%, and we reduced the larval development time to the adult fly stage by 25%. And there appears to be a genetic carryover, which we're now studying. 
which is interesting. Now, how did we introduce the consciousness into the experiment? All right? We basically had, what we did is we took four meditators who sat around a table top, and on the table top was a simple little low-tech electrical device. It contained a memory system, an EEPROM, and an oscillator uh, oscillating in the megahertz range, and a few, dio a few diodes, a couple of capacitors and resistors, and a power supply. That's it. Um, and so we would plug the uh, energy converter into the wall socket and plug the, the converter into the, uh, this device, which we'll call a UED, an unimprinted electrical device. And we would turn it on, and then the four of us would go into meditation. We would connect with each other and with the unseen, and we would mentally try to cleanse the territory of this tabletop and create a kind of sacred space. And when we felt that it was ready, um, one of us, usually me, uh, who had designed the imprint statement, I would state the imprint statement. And each of the members would hold it in their consciousness um, at that level of reality and would hold it for the timeline is the order of 15 minutes. And when I felt that the device was sort of cooked in a metaphorical sense, I would say, so be it, thy will be done. And every, then all four would just release it, just let it go. And the, then there would be a subsidiary intention statement which was designed to seal the primary imprint into the device so that it wouldn't mm, leak away so that we couldn't do experiments. And then we would usually do that twice, you know, just to be sure. Uh, the whole process for a particular one statement, one device, which we now called an IIED, Intention Imprinted Electrical Device. Um, we would do it twice. The total time would be maybe something like an hour to an hour and a half. Right? Um, and then what we would do, well, one of the things we learned very quickly is, when we did this is we would take an unimprinted device and an imprinted device separate them by 100 meters, turn them off electrically, and see what happened. Well, they're off. There's no electrical energy in them, so there's no way they can communicate with each other, right? Wrong. <laughs> Within three to five days, the unimprinted device had picked up the imprint from the imprinted device, and we'd lost that control, which meant we really couldn't do any experiments that would make any sense. And I was having fits. <laughs> and then I realized, wait a minute. There's another communication channel, information passage channel in the universe that we don't know anything about. Wow. So then one thought about, all right, how am I going to do experiments with this? And I reasoned that, all right, if, if indeed with it off electrically, somehow this communication is connected maybe with electrical, electromagnetic energy. So we wrapped it in aluminum foil to shut out any optical range of electromagnetic radiations. And we put it in an electrically grounded Faraday cage, which would basically screen out most of the gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz uh, frequencies. And we were stuck with a very low frequency range we couldn't do much about because in order to have a, a Faraday cage that you could lift and move around, um, we had to live with that because it takes a heck of a lot of copper to go into that low range to really screen it. But we then found that by doing this, we could maintain the intention statement in the device for three to six months. Whew, we could do experiments. And so the experiments were set up, in fact, in, in a laboratory in Minnesota, and they were running continuously to get baseline. And we imprinted the devices in the Palo Alto region of California, near Stanford. And when they were ready, we would wrap them in foil and do all this stuff. And then we would send them by FedEx, one day, not on, on separate days, to the laboratory in Minnesota. And they would just plug it into the wall and, and place the IIED close to the experimental apparatus. 
could have been put anywhere in the room, but we thought, let's start with a close. And, and uh, then we got all these results. So that's the, that's the story there, and it says that at least at this point in time, if you do it at least the way that we did it, um, consciousness can be a very significant variable. And so what this boils down to is looks like the following. If you're, if you're looking at, at the measurements from one of these experiments, the, uh, the properties, then you start at, and you're exposing it to this IIED. Generally, you, you have a baseline and nothing changes for the order of the first month. And then you start to see the trans, some transition, always moving in the direction of the intention. And so the measurement property is going up and then it plateaus. Um, if you take it away before it gets to the plateau, then it very slowly decays. I mean, very slowly, months. But if you get it up to the plateau, then you can remove the IIED and it stays there. It can stay there for years in some cases. Um, and so it's at this upper level, and usually the magnitude difference between this upper level and this level is very close to your intention, the quantity of the intention. So we see that we're going from our conventional understanding through this domain where things are mixed into a place where new physics is seriously entering. And I, I don't have time to tell you about it, but basically we then did a bunch of experiments to try to figure out what, what is some of this? What, what is this domain? What's going on here? And we learned three things uh, from our experiments, or at least the way we interpret them. First one is that we have somehow accessed magnetic monopoles. Now the world has spent billions of dollars trying to access magnetic monopoles, but from this state of the system. This one is a new state and magnetic monopoles uh, can coexist with electric monopoles if the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state is raised. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a very important aspect. The second thing we found was that the phenomena, this change, wasn't in occurring in the atoms and molecules of this world. They were occurring at another level. They were occurring because of changes in the stuff of the physical vacuum where there are no electric atom molecules. Okay, so that within, if you look within an atom, okay, we got a nucleus we know of and we got electron shells and, and such, depending upon how you want to analyze it, whatever model you want to use. But the issue is there's a huge amount of empty space in there. The stuff that's in that supposedly empty space is what was causing this phenomenon. And the third thing we noticed was there was a kind of, there was really an information entanglement between sites that were at this new level of physics, even when they were thousands of miles apart. Okay? Those were sort of the three things that, that dropped out of it. There are more, but they're sort of secondary. So the bottom line, the way we interpreted this, was that there is a second unique level of physical reality. It's always there. But if it is not coupled to our conventional level of physical reality, we do not ph detect phenomena going on in that level of reality. All right? It turns out when you come to some theoretical considerations, it's because this stuff appears to be going faster than the velocity of light. And our instruments can only detect things that go slower than the velocity of light. And so if there's no coupling between these two, then it's invisible to you. So this is the beginning of the invisible worlds. And what we do by this conscious, use of consciousness to create an IIED, that the IIED conditions the space to be at a higher electromagnetic gauge symmetry state, different than Maxwell equations uh, work on. And so, and, that's, and so are the instruments that are in this world. All our instruments are in this electric atom molecule world. But there is some stuff that becomes the coupler between these two. And once that stuff is present, it brings about the coupling and it allows the instruments 
to access this faster than light phenomena. So that stuff has to bridge between slower than light and faster than light phenomena. Right? And I'll come to the postulate of, of that. And, and it's that aspect that is so important. Okay? Now the second feature that is really important is we decided, well, well this aspect is higher gauge symmetry state means it's at a higher thermodynamic potential energy, three energy, than our normal reality. So if we somehow could connect from that level of reality to our normal electric al uh, level of reality, we could do useful work of all kinds, all kinds, mechanical, chemical, electrical, optical, etc. And so then I thought, what if when we're born in this bio body suit I talk about, into this realm, there is an organ or a system in the body that is at its higher gauge symmetry level. If that were the case, then human intention, oh, and I didn't say this, okay, we got these two worlds. Human intention affects this world, not this one, not our familiar one, or, or at least not much, but it can affect this one big time. And so if they're coupled together and the instruments measure the sum of those two effects, it can measure the intention effects. And so we did the same kind of experiment with respect to the magnetic aspect of in humans. We did muscle testing with a world-class expert and then brought a, one of these little bar magnets into the muscle group being tested and the South Pole increased the strength and the North Pole decreased the strength. Well, you cannot have that kind of behavior in our normal reality because all you have there are magnetic dipoles. So again, it's accessing magnetic monopoles, magnetic currents in the human body, which the intention of a human can drive, okay? In my modeling, it drives and creates flows of magnetoelectric energy. The general other way of putting it, it creates an enhancement of chi and the flow of chi, which we've all heard about. And so this is what makes the great performers of the world, all right? They unconsciously work with this within themselves through their intention, through their desire, through their feeling state to make something important happen. And all the great performers of the world, I think, unconsciously do this. But now that we begin to know about it, everybody can do this. If we can bring some kind of biofeedback device and we have something on, on we're developing to do that, which you can set in front of you and you can look at it and you can intend and you can measure the increase in this energetic state by your intentions. And as you pump that kind of iron in your internal gym, then you change from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and from a master to an avatar. All of us have the internal apparatus to be capable of doing that. And in so doing, we will bridge these other domains because nature is radiating all the time on many, many bands. We have, can, are only really detect with our sensory system, the five physical senses and our instruments, the electromagnetic band and, and the other aspects of the four fundamental forces, but basically that band. But as you do this work within and you build yourself, then you begin to access these other bands. And of course, that orbs is all about that kind of stuff. Okay, I get carried away, so forgive me. I mean, let's move on. All right. So the bottom line is that this is, this is the way I see it. I think this is the way it is. That relative to these two levels, we, any measurement, any quality that we measure is given by our electric atom molecule level, that's our conventional reality, plus this coupling coefficient alpha effective times the magnitude of, the, of what the measured value will be in this vacuum level of reality. And so if, if, if we don't have any coupling or much coupling, very, if this is very small, then you can just forget that. You just have your normal reality. But if you use your consciousness to create this stuff that becomes the coupler, then this term goes up to the order of one. That's, that's a bad, badly written thing, but, but basically the order of one. Then you access all of this. 
Okay. So these are the definitions of the various terms. Deltron, I had to invent this substance from the domain of emotion and having the qualities that it can go slower than light or faster than light and the slower than light part can interact with the electric stuff and the faster than light part can interact with the magnetic information wave stuff and that allows this whole system to work and so that's still a postulate but it allows us to explain all these phenomena that that we are finding okay now we've also devised the uh, an experimental measurement system. We not only have a source that can lift the gauge symmetry state, we have a detector which will tell us how much the thermodynamic free energy excess is for the hydrated proton. That's just a hydrogen atom in water. Uh, but it reads it out to us. So we can begin to see that. We, these are, this is in some of the uh, sites around the US that we've made measurements. Um, the numbers are they're relevant. They're in milli electron volts. I'll come to a more meaningful statement. Here's one from within our laboratory in Payson. Um, the, uh, this one, P, P7 and P1. And here's one uh, in England and here's one in Italy. Now, we've used this device to do measurements in, in various uh, alternative and complementary medicine laboratories. We've used it um, at Eric Pearl's uh, Reconnective Healing Workshop. We've only done it once. We'll be doing another more exact experiment in a couple of months. But in the one month, what the, we did do is that we measured, and it took place here in Sedona, um, we measured the increase in this excess thermodynamic free energy from the day that the process started and through we saw an increase to a peak and then it just decayed uh, after the the uh, workshop was was over I won't tell you all the details but the difference in the magnitude between the peak and the starting place was a doubling of the average energy in the space now, what does that mean? If I, if I were to say I had a normal space and I was going to increase the temperature, how much would I have to increase it to make that change equivalent to what was seen in this experiment? And the change was 300 degrees centigrade. Wow. And there was no change in the measurement temperature. So the thermodynamic free energy changed, but the temperature did not. And it was not in the usual form, it could be indeed entropic. We don't know those details yet, but it's a significant effect. We have in certain sites around the country, we've conditioned them to a place where it's three times the average temperature. So the equivalent of like 900 degrees centigrade, that, that quantity of energy that's in the, norm, in the molecules in the normal level of reality, because it's the temperature that is the indicator of how much kinetic energy is stored in the molecule. So it's a big effect, can be a very big effect. Well, I think I've said this, that basically the bottom line is that the human consciousness is capable of allowing us to couple to another level of reality. And this level of reality may have its own set of life forms. And we may be able to image them through things like digital cameras. Digital is interesting because there's much more information content in the digital than in the analog. So, anyway, again, it's, it's this. Um, let's see, have I gone? Oh, I know what I'm missing. Um, this is where I'm gonna take the first five minute break so you can ask some questions uh, if you wish. And there are microphones at the back I repeat, make them relevant, make them concise, please. And uh, if you will cut me off in five minutes. So you're gonna to have to get up and come to the mic. You're first, so let's go. Uh, before the uh, uh, aluminum foil Faraday cage yep. um, solution to the problem, right. how did you know that the second 
imprintable device had been contaminated we, by the first. We, we looked at the water experiment. You can immediately know if it's conditioned, if the device is conditioned, because just in the behavior of the pH versus time curves. If, we, if you use an unimprinted device, they are really jerky and they, they displace from each other over time. Uh, whereas in the condition one, they're just beautifully smooth, rising, and they're all, over a number of days, they're all sequenced day by day. So we just, we've, we'd had that experience, and that was our indicator. And then, basically, we were able to do experiments like this with the unimprinted device, and we got effects. So there was a lot of that, but in terms of, you know, down to the very nitty-gritty, it was just so obvious to us. That, that the conditioning had changed. Would you please define gauge symmetry state? Oh, this is very hard, okay? Um, the, I've laid it out in the various books, uh, and these experiments, by the way, are, are written up in detail in Conscious Acts of Creation and also in some science adventures with real magic, because it was the, the science adventures with real magic is where we did the replication experiment on the water uh, with the IIED uh, pH going up by one full unit. The, the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state going up is, one way to see it is in our normal reality the undetermined parameter is the phase angle of the electron wave function. It, it can have any value in a circle, okay? Um, The issue is when you raise the gauge symmetry state from what's called the U1 to the SU2 level where you have coexistence of electric monopoles and magnetic monopoles, you now have this elect electron, let's say, moving in this orbit. It has its phase angle. The, now you've introduced the coupling with the magnetic monopole. It takes a perpendicular orbit because now the two are coupled. So now there are two uh, un undetermined parameters. And because there are two, that becomes the two in the SU2 gauge symmetry state. It's lifted to a level where now you have a much more complex dance of the charged particles. And uh, there are many other ways that I can say this, but that's the simplest that I've come up with. The, the way you can think of it is the following. If you look in that space between a nucleus and the electrons, all right, in an, in an atom, and you bring about the coupling, so the stuff in the, in the vacuum, the em supposedly empty space, the magnetic monopoles start to circulate. And now, with our present devices, we see the paths of the electron changing, or the probability of them being in certain places changing. And so you say somehow there's an attractor that's developed. And people call it dark matter and dark energy, but it really is the magnetic monopole in this vacuum stuff that's doing it. And, and so the gauge, it says you now have a system richer and it's a higher gauge symmetry state and it's more complex. And because it's more complex, it is at a higher thermodynamic free energy per unit volume. Thank you for saying that in the simplest way possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just drop it in. The, when I don't understand things well, I can only say them in a complicated way. When I eventually get to understand them well, I can make it simple. But this one is tough for anyone. Next. Let, let's take one over here. What is the response of mainstream science to this type of experimental uh, Mainstream approach? science are a reincarnation of the priests of Galileo's time. <laughs> they, they, they choose not to look through the telescope with an open eye. It would be wonderful. I would just love it if they would just take the time to seriously look. But they're, they're boggled by this. They're still stuck with the issue of the unstated assumption. And poor guys or girls, uh, it's, just, it, it's just the way it is for them. Uh, they will change. I mean, these things always change, but it may take 20, 30, 40 years. One funeral at a time. That's what, that's what Mark said. Yep. Mark was right about that. Sorry, say it again. In terms of the uh, words you were using, consciousness yes. and intent, yes. where does the body, brain, mind, mind, thought, and consciousness as you're using it? Well, the con consciousness as I'm using it 
um, it's really outside of the electric atom molecule body, the layer in the bio body suit. Um, our unconscious uh, that functions and is the dominant thing in our, in our bio body suit, it primarily functions at the magnetic information wave level, which is the layer inside the body. Uh, my, my view of the, uh, of the whole person is like a sphere with three segmented zones in it. The outer zone is made of two layers, electric monopole substance and magnetic information wave substance. And that's what we take on when we're born, that's what we shuck off when, we're, when we seem to die. Um, the middle zone is the soul cell. That's really what's evolving. That's pretty much fairly indestructible. And that's the emotion domain, the mind domain, and an aspect of the spirit domain. And the core is the high spirit domain, the creator, or the God self. So we are all those things. And it's a question of developing the coherence of mm, information passage from one to the other. I mean, the outer, the bio body suit, the outer layer is well designed in order to interface with space time phenomena through the five physical senses, developed by the, really by the, what is a horse there now? That's interesting. Where'd that come from? Just, just close that up. Just close that up. The, uh, uh, <laughs> the, um, close it, Josh. So, so in any event, the, I sort of lost my train of thought, so have I answered your question? <laughs> um, Bill? Yes. Um, I just want you to know that the five minutes that five you minutes. asked for is up if you want to. Sorry, I think I need to go on. Yes, because this, you're, Will you sit down and maybe you can be first up the next time, the next break, and you can ask your question then. But you may have more questions too. So uh, let me go forward. You know, we could talk all day, but we don't have time. The, the model that I use to, uh, is this duplex model, and the way I see it, uh, or visualize it, and I'm only, I had two pictures, but the, the other one doesn't come out. So here is space-time representation of a quality, and behind it is the reciprocal space-time. It's a conjugate. So, and it's really a reciprocal space so it's one over distance and one over time, and one over distance is number per unit di distance. So it's a spatial frequency, and one over time is number per unit time, it's a temporal frequency. So this um, bio body suit, the bio aspect, has two layers. We really only know about this one, and this other layer is waiting for us to get it seriously in touch with it. Um, the, uh, and so if you have a frequency domain, okay, let me go one step. If you go back and you, if you have a quality, or like an object in direct space, it has an equilibrium conjugate information pattern in reciprocal space. And so if you couple these two together, then the, this pattern builds up in reciprocal space. Once it is truly in reciprocal space, you can access it from anywhere, here or Mars or Saturn or anywhere in the world, because it's in a frequency domain. It doesn't, it's not limited by distance nor time. And if the higher dimensional ones, which are behind this, this uh, duplex reference frame is embedded in a higher frame, the domain of emotion, the domain of, of mind, and an aspect of the spirit domain. So these are dimensions. This one becomes a sort of an eight space. Not quite, but I don't want to get into the details. Uh, and then a nine and then a 10, etc. These, if they're all frequency domains, then an intention from this level gives a pattern in the frequency domain and, and you can have a resonance in this domain and a resonance in this domain and therefore a resonance in this domain. And if you have the deltron coupler, it's in this domain. So this is how, for with intention, can come from the highest aspect of yourself, the spirit level, and ultimately manifest in the earth. So, and I'm sorry I don't have the other one, but it basically is you can put this into a, um, a what's called a band diagram. But let me pass by. Let me give you an example of an individual with a remarkable human biofield. Some work I did back in the 1970s um, 
with a man by the name of Stan Ojak. He wasn't a doctor. In fact, the work that we did together, uh, he, he got a PhD for it in psychology at the International College in Los Angeles. Uh, so he was, has been a practicing psychologist for many years. He's retired now too. This was the mid 70s. The equipment was, he would sensitize a camera with his biofield. That is, he would hold it, he would take it to bed with him, sleep with it kind of thing, do this for a couple of days, and then he could get remarkable pictures. And this was not a digital camera. And so he put the camera on a tripod with a shutter release, he used Kodak film and Kodak processing. And then when I, he showed me this, and I thought, this is pretty interesting stuff. And so I said, okay, let's do a dual camera set of experiments. One which was sensitized and one which was not sensitized. So that we could get the normal and we could get the altered normal. I'm going to show you what these things look like. They're in the first chapter of my first book, Science and Human Transformation. So here we can see uh, people on the stage with uh, these things rising from the chairs and from the people. And here, this was a rock concert out in the air, and you can see these little, look like seahorses on, on contrails. Um, and you can see all this energy being generated. It basically was a dark system. So, uh, if you, I guess you have to be pretty close to see the contrails, but I can see them here. And, and I thought they were very, really very interesting, and now I think they're very much related to orbs. Um, and here, so that was 30 years ago. Um, so basically, where am I? Here it is. Um, and then these were some other pictures that he'd taken. You, this, and I think of that as an open book that's sort of flying in the room. And he's got uh, a friend who's taking, it was a friend's birthday, and he, he was taking a picture of him in front of this. And you got all this other stuff. And here's more of the same. Um, and by that time, I said, hey, let's do a dual camera experiment. And so the top, the one on the left, is the unsensitized camera. Unfortunately, it, we couldn't get the same kind of camera. They no longer made it of the kind he had, which was a plastic Kodak. Um, and this was a Minolta camera. So this is the unsensitized. It's a faster shutter than this one. But you can see, if you can look back here at, the, at this man, you can see right through his body and see the things on the wall behind it, and he's getting pretty transparent. If you go to the bottom one, here's Yuri Geller on stage with a couple of ladies and a blackboard, and here you can see some stuff going between one of these ladies and Yuri, and you can see through half of his body to the blackboard. And here, this was at a, a conference I was at with uh, Doris Kubler-Ross down in uh, Monterey, and uh, so here's the, the uh, uh, Minolta, and see, you can see the light wells, and here is the Kodak. This stuff, these beams, these bands, these ribbons of light uh, manifesting. And here in the bottom, uh, we take, he could take pictures uh, with a lens cap on the camera. And, and this, this is the, if this was in the, uh, the church at Stanford, inside and this was with the lens cap off and this was with the lens cap on. Yeah. Um, very interesting stuff and Stan's uh, primary intention was to reveal God's universe. He was a marvelous man of the Baha'i faith and he he was really built inside uh, and so his biofield and, and he could basically once he sensitized anyone's camera, then and he passed it to them, then maybe for the first uh, hour they could take pictures and they would get uh, good results. But uh, the entanglement with other things it eventually leaked away. But when he was there using the shutter release, his biofield kept working with the camera and kept lifting its gauge symmetry state. That's how I see it anyway. And so, and I think, so he lifted the gauge symmetry state to this uh, SU-2 level of seemingly an inert object in front of him. And that becomes very important when we say a little bit later about the placebo effect in medicine. Because they also assume that things are inert, inert, inert. That's also Bolshevsky. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, 
I wanted to say something about this, but basically I don't think I have time and I'm going to pass over it, but I think you should at least hear it. I'll read it. Every change in the human physiological state is accompanied by an appropriate change in the mental emotional state, conscious or unconscious. And conversely, every change in the mental emotional state, conscious or unconscious, is accompanied by an appropriate change in the physiological state. And this is why biofeedback works so well. And I had some three wonderful experiments and some interesting data, but another time. Um, so this duplex reference frame that I talk about, I want to say a little bit, just a tiny bit about it. Um, they are reciprocals, and so the coordinates are not distance and time, they are frequencies. And you know, I can label them with numbers K. They, they would be wave numbers uh, in solid state physics. Um, and there is a reciprocal mirror, pins with, with this thing, that, and it comes through the mathematics, that there is a quality in one, and there's a reciprocal quality in the other. Um, which can be remarkable in the sense that from, let's say, here is the origin in, in uh, direct space and Alpha Centauri is a, a, quite a distance away in direct space. Well, Alpha Centauri in the reciprocal space has a low frequency. It's very, very, in the very low frequency domain of reciprocal space and the origin here is at infinity in reciprocal space. So if you have that kind of loop you see, you gain an entirely different perspective on things. And ultimately, we have a sensory system latent within us, which allows us to access that reciprocal space. And we will do that as we go forward into our future. That's my working hypothesis. I, I'm, I, you know, I have these intuitive things, and, they, and they're working hypotheses until I've proven them experimentally. And then I think we can accept them as, as being real. But that's a requirement, at least for me as a scientist. Um, so what we see are the subluminal electric particles in the direct space and the magnetic information waves going faster than light in reciprocal space. Now both of these come in when you want to talk about um, the Broglie's particle pilot wave picture, which was really the cornerstone of quantum mechanics. And so you have a particle and you have a, a pilot wave which is supposedly guiding it. He won the Nobel Prize for this concept and some of the mathematics that went with it. Now the interesting thing is when you apply simple quantum mechanics and relativity theory to this, you find that the product, mathematical product, of the particle velocity, which is always slower than light, and the wave components which make up this uh, pilot wave, that has to equal c squared, the velocity of light squared. And since the particle velocity must always be less than c, that means the magnetic information wave components must always be greater than C. All right? So that has hung there since the 1930s. And the physicists of the day said, oh, we're going to have problems with relativity unless we call them information waves, because information can't really do anything. <laughs> However, what I try to tell you in the beginning is that information waves make negative entropy and negative entropy is in the thermodynamic free energy function, and it's the thermodynamic free energy function that governs all processes in nature. So they were wrong, but the magnitude of the effect is so small it couldn't be detectable in their instruments. But now, at this point in time, when we look at it, it says, hey, here is something which is going faster than light, and it has to be interacting with the particle in order to be a particle pilot wave. And it turns out people doing quantum mechanics, uh, Walter Harrison at Stanford, his book says, if you can assume the existence of particle and wave, you can calculate everything in today's quantum mechanics, all the predictions. And so the old concept in quantum mechanics is the wave-particle duality. That is that somehow this stuff can on some occasions act like a particle and other occasions act like a wave. Well, if they're simultaneous in this kind of format, and you bring in a coupler, now consciousness can couple with the coupler, and now you can see how consciousness comes into the rock bottom building block of, of the expanded quantum mechanics, and you can begin to see how everything can start to make sense. Slower than light, faster than light stuff, in essence what happens is the, the uh, 
magnetic information waves have to be coming in the, the components like from this side and they pass through this which is a moving wave packet that's moving at the velocity of the particle but the things that make it up are waves coming in to it new waves and old waves going out that's the way it works so that's where we're going in the future and here's the issue of the just a little piece of this uh, mirror principle so we have positive energy particle to the velocity of light can't go up to the velocity of light because it's got mass and therefore takes an infinite amount of energy um, if, it, if it went that far but the mirror principle part is the pilot wave branch the magnetic information wave branch comes from minus infinity and keeps going and, and it means that quality in one has a one domain has a conjugate quality in the other and so here you have gravity there you have levity so here it's positive energy there it's negative energy so there's whole kinds of things that we now can begin to explain or rationalize it's not until there's experimental proof uh, you know got to be careful so let's see what have I got here I think uh, all right I think we've done that um, the issue of we, we see in our experiments that when we have a part of our system, experimental system, uh, in, in the case of the water pH, we do an experiment in our laboratory. Uh, young people in Milan, Italy, wanted to do some work with us, and we said, okay, set up, buy this equipment, and set up this measurement system uh, for measuring pH. And we will not send you an IID, we just want you to do background for three months, and then we'll send you one. Well, within a week of them setting up their apparatus, they began getting the same kind of results that we were doing in the Payson laboratory, which was conditioned. So there was information entanglement over 6,000 miles. And the way that this particular thing is meant, what the way it's meant is, is that you can have, uh, should have, these are the two sheets looking at, at our electric atom molecule world in this one and the magnetic information wave world in this one. And you start with the measurement apparatus here and the measurement apparatus there. But this one will never have an IIED. But this one has an IIED with it, which now couple, produces coupling between these two. And so the information pattern gets into reciprocal space. And once it's in reciprocal space, it's everywhere. So it's right outside this one in Milan. And now thermodynamic equilibrium requires that because there is a coupling here, there's a trickle of deltrons across here, and then a tri trickle becomes a stream and then becomes a flood. And before you know it, this becomes a totally coupled region as well. And thus the information generated here goes 6,000 miles away. Doesn't have to be through space time, doesn't have to be electromagnetism. The data suggests it's not electromagnetism. Uh, anyway, this is, if, we, if we happen to have some time, I'll get back to this. But you can, you can using, oh, that's, that's even worse. Uh, but, the, but the issue is, yeah, the issue is that you can begin to be quantitative. You can begin to predict things. And, I, and it was to help you understand the placebo effect and a variety of other things. I didn't mean to scare you. But I realized when I was, I was going over my notes that I'm just never going to have try to explain it simply. But we'll see. Maybe, maybe there'll be time, but I doubt it. Anyway, there was an article in Science Magazine by the man by the name of Enserich, and he pointed out that in 15 years earlier, uh, double-blind experiments um, with uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder uh, showed a placebo response of the order of 15%. Very, very little. However, 15 years later, in 1999, the same experiment done in many places had a placebo response uh, now 75 to 80%. And of course, pharmaceutical companies like the, they don't like this. And, and academicians like to sweep that under the rug because it can't be understood easily in the conventional framework. Um, and so they did. But the, the issue is, we have to ask ourselves, why has the magnitude of the placebo effect increased so remarkably in 15 years? In the same time frame, we might also ask, 
Why in the last 15 years have we detected that there's acceleration out at the edge of the expanding universe, not contraction? And why have we started to see dark matter effects and dark energy effects in the last 15 to 20 years? So the possibility is that the concentration of this coupler su substance is perhaps increasing in our local universe and it's been increasing for some decades so that this coupling coefficient alpha effective is becoming larger and as it becomes larger everything starts to be linked together we start to be connected more and more and we begin to see the attractor aspect of the reciprocal space stuff on the direct space stuff which because of the reciprocal nature, the mirror, mirror principle aspect, we will see the kind of phenomena people are starting to talk about. It's, it's nice to think about because it may be relevant very much to orbs uh, for us here. I mean, it's not, not proof, but it's internally self-consistent with the kinds of phenomena that, that has been occurring. Well, th this related to the mathematics I had. So the issue though, um, well, okay. I'm going to say something that relates to, to this uh, double-blind studies because um, of an inert object actually becomes a very dynamic thing through this information entanglement. And, uh, okay. Um, this is in the magic book, Some Science Adventures with Real Magic. I came to realize that the fundamental, the simplest communication system that we have. If you're a practitioner and you have a client, you think that's all it is, but it's not. You also may have a device. Um, you may be doing electrodermal measurements. Um, but you also have gauge symmetry state of the space that you two are interacting through. And you also have the unseen universe that may be involved or may not be involved in it. So the, if, if you're lifting the gauge symmetry state, you and the client are very much coupled. And the value of the effects that occur in that interaction depend very much upon the uh, phase angle of electron wave functions and magnetic monopole wave functions when you have lifted the gauge symmetry state. If it's not lifted, you're in the U1 state and you have less to work with. Let me say something about why this is so important. And I call it the garage inventor effect, okay? There's this guy with a tolerant wife and he has a garage and he wants to do some free energy experiments in the garage to make efficiencies greater than one for a device. And his wife lets him go to the garage in the evenings and he works assiduously on this and he works on it for years. And because he is so intent and focused on that, he is broadcasting in his biofield into this garage. And after a couple of years, he suddenly gets, he starts to get the, getting the effects and he gets the effects and they're stronger and stronger and he says, wow. So he calls all his friends in and, and uh, demonstrates to them that it's real. And they think, this is terrific. Let's make a business. And one of them said, well, wait a minute, before we rush to doing that, we need to we should have this tested in a testing lab, okay? And there's one in the next town. And so they send the equipment there to the testing lab and a month later the data comes back and they, it's just normal. And the guy in the testing lab wonders, is, is this try, guy trying to perpetrate a fraud, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing they didn't, come, didn't realize was in fact that they did not replicate the gauge symmetry state of the space. In order for that laboratory to make any money in the real conventional world, it had to be a U1 gauge space. So it wasn't conditioned to an SU2 and the, and the gauge space is part of the system. Hal Putoff in Texas uh, is very proud of the fact that, that 35 individuals that supposedly these special devices with efficiencies greater than one that he's tested and none of them passed the test. And the reason is his laboratory is a U1 gauge laboratory, not an SU2 gauge laboratory. Makes a big difference. So if you're in this game of working in your garage with a, you have a patient wife, uh, you need to remember that that's a very important part of the system.
See, the system can be remarkable at, at these levels. I mean, we found this by these Italian folks and the folks in England uh, wanting just to, to get involved somehow. But as soon as we agreed, they were part of our system. And because they're part of our system, they became coupled because of the reciprocal space aspect or vectors. And that's what's in the mathematics. Uh, and, and that makes it very difficult. Because you, that's, you can see the information entanglement always is there when, you're, when you bring in this reciprocal space. And if you think in terms of a simple medical experiment with a doctor and a treatment and a placebo, the system is these three parts. Okay, in the reciprocal space aspects, you have an amplitude and a phase angle effect, but really what you can experimentally measure and what is manifest is the intensity, and that's the square of the amplitude. And in order to get that, you have to multiply the sum of these three vectors times the sum of the complex conjugate, just same amplitude but, but mirrored phase angle effect. And when you do, you get the kind of part you get a mathematical thing with two terms in it. One, which is just what you'd normally have if they weren't vectors, they're just scalar thing quantities. But then you get a complex thing, which is the entanglement, information entanglement, and it's always the pair, the doctor and the treatment, plus the doctor and the placebo, plus the treatment and the placebo. They're multiplied together, and so you cannot separate the treatment from the placebo in this kind of duplex space that where they're coupled together. And it's that as the coupling coefficient goes up, the placebo effect goes up. It just drops out of the mathematics. So that's important to realize, and it's important for everyone to realize that these five parts are part of the system. And I, I put this thing in with the device. For example, if, if you're a practitioner doing electrodermal testing of, on people, the biofield of the practitioner gets embedded, the deltrons from that get embedded in the device, and the device eventually has a lifted gauge symmetry state from this, and now these two things are a hybrid system. And they can access information in the universe that is not capable of being accessed in the, when they're in the separated state. Really important, and it really is relevant when we want to talk about orbs and the, and the digital camera. It's the same system, except now we have an experimenter and we have a camera and we have orbs as the client. And so the issue is that the camera, just like in Stan Ojak's case, can become potentized through the biofield of the practitioner or the biofield of the world. And digital cameras doesn't, doesn't take as much to make it happen. Okay, some people can see these things. Stan would be able to see these things with his eyes because his, his biofield is so tremendous that, that uh, he doesn't need uh, training wheels to see these things, experience them. And there are, there are a variety of humans that are that way. So it's a question of how far do things have to be pushed, you know, to, to lift the camera to the place where it can manifest in supposedly an inert thing, like a camera, something from another dimension, All right. which I think is what orbs are. And so if the, so the, the, the involved, of course, are the biofield of the individual, the biofield of the, the, the conditioning of the space, the help of the unseen, yes or no, etc., and the eventual conditioning of the camera you use so that it's easier to get the phenomena you are desiring. And of course, if you're dealing with a conscious uh, biological entity that wants to cooperate in the uplift of these slow humans, this world, uh, not very advanced, then, then of course you'll, you'll see all kinds of interactions. And, and down the road, the possibility of really doing meaningful things with that bridge, that is very likely to get traditional scientists out of the box. And because there, it's the issue of, of the information entanglement. So, you, so it, is, it is the two levels and the higher levels of reality that become coupled. And once they become uncoupled, then they're entangled. The mathematics of, 
of the dual or triple system, etc., is is entangled. And now, with enough of the coupler, you can have instruments which can bridge. And so you can begin to see these things, and you can begin to become part of the whole, which is what we are at the core level. Okay? So, I don't think they're creatures of space-time. And I think when uh, Klaus shows you some of the dual camera experiments he's done, he will agree. I won't steal his thunder. But it's great. And, and basically because if I postulate that the higher dimensions are also frequency domains, okay, then you can have resonance. And so if you can have resonance and their frequencies, then they can be everywhere. They can do all these things we think about as these higher dimensional reality and these higher dimensional beings and UFOs and so on, who have learned the physics of how to deal between these things. Um, then you can find ways to reveal them once you open your mind to the meaning of these things. Your unconscious will find ways to feed you kernels of information small enough that you can digest. Okay, um, and do, let's, can I have five minutes? Have we, are we done? Five minutes for questions, come on guys. As you join information systems, now it's a higher order information, so there's more entropy effect, etc. And as you do these things at higher dimensional levels, the reason it's a very small magnitude effect at the electric atom molecule level is because the change is multiplied by Boltzmann constant. It's very small. I think the next level is up at least 10 orders of magnitude, the corresponding one. And the higher level, still higher. So you go high enough that you now speak a word and you move a mountain. I mean, I think it's all built into this kind of system. Okay? Next. Hi. Um, one difficult experimental aspect of this is uh, measuring the amount of intent that you put into a device. Sure is tough. Would it be at this possible point. to uh, take photographs along the line of the orb photographs and Maybe. try to uh, put intent into the device through yes, orbs? And we're already talking about that. Monitor that way? Okay. That Klaus and nice. so, so tune in to Klaus as time goes on. Yeah, thanks. Young lady? Um, so on, in your study, um, I didn't quite get the, um, the act of the quartz crystal after you turned it to 90 degrees. Oh, in, yeah, that's very interesting because it says that quartz crystal was a tuner. In essence, that was I, what, what I pulled out of that. This is in Chapter 6 of Conscious Acts of Creation uh, book. And, and, the, and the thing we found was that, that uh, we had a line of measuring instruments that were measuring the, the oscillations in temperature in, in the room outside of a Faraday cage with, with a uh, water bottle and a measurement of pH and temperature in, in the water. Uh, and eventually, we, we, when it was a condition, we were able to remove that and we still saw the oscillations. They decayed very, very slowly. And they had a certain waveform. And as we put the quartz crystal in the place where the uh, Faraday cage had been, and it put, put the C-axis upwards, okay, whereas the line of thermistors were along there over an 11-foot dimension. Um, when you did this, it turns out that the amplitude of the oscillation increased slightly, and the decay rate decreased maybe a factor of five. So very slowly decayed, like over months. Uh, but then if we just laid it down, so the C-axis was pointing along the line of the thermistors, almost immediately the waveform inverted, the amplitude was reduced by a factor of two, and the frequency was increased by a factor of five, something like that. But it was instantaneous, and so rather than its normal decay rate, we, we came, I came away from that saying, we'll get back to this, and that's going to be a tuner procedure. So, anyway, next door here. A little louder, please. I don't think it's on. Oh, excuse me for my layman terms, but my brother-in-law has an earthquake machine. He uh, measures... Is that relevant to this, this yes. subject that I uh, talked about? He measures... Excuse me. He measures earthquakes with this sensitive machine, and yes. I tried to ask him about measuring electromagnetic fields around person, but he says he can't. No. Is that because the instrument isn't the, the uh, advanced in, enough? Uh, no, the instrument is designed to measure uh, sound waves, basically. I mean, that's, that's, what, it, that's what is uh, 
propagates through the earth when there are earthquakes. So he believes so, people don't have them. So what would be well, my people, answer perspective? Well, the issue are two things. People, whenever an electromagnetic wave is generated in a person, you also generate a sound wave because most of the tissues are piezoelectric, which means that they, they electric, a, a sound uh, vibration will give rise to an electric signal and an electric signal will give rise to a sound signal. So he can convert his instrument to make it also uh, measure electric uh, signals. So that, that would be the path he would have to do, to follow, to do this. But it takes, a, you're now talking about a lot of instrumentation and detection equipment. Uh, in principle- So it's just an adjustment of his machines and then not a simple, able to Not a simple detect. adjustment. Okay. I mean, if, if I were he and, and I could just turn a knob, I'd be happy, but I'd probably have to take the whole thing apart and rebuild it with the other intention in Thank mind. Thank you. You're welcome. A little louder, please. Yeah. Not on? Yeah. Is it on? Is it? Go ahead. Try again. Uh, matrix energetics. And I, I oh, yeah, the matrix preface, energetics. I saw some pieces yeah, from right. that. So yeah, I wrote the form. Um, what's your opinion about belief system and intention, how it affects actually this uh, uh, invisible world? The limb system? Real. Belief system. Oh, belief system. Yeah, because... Belief um, is terribly important. I mean, the issue is you've got to, we've got to come to realize that nature responds in three ways, or can it respond in three ways. What you get from nature is if you have no bias at all, you get a certain set of phenomena responses. If you have a positive bias, you get an expanded set. If you have a negative bias, your biofield is diminishing the effect and is changing it. So this is something we just have to realize. As you start bringing consciousness into it, you have to realize that the mindset that you hold, your belief system, is in fact being broadcast from you in your biofield all the time and, and, and through reciprocal space part of yourself as well. So it, it, the ball game is different. And so in the, in the experimental design, one has to say, all right, we're going to do it this time with a neutral bias. No bias, just suspend judgment, suspend belief. And then we're going to do it okay with, with belief. And that can vary depending upon how strong your belief is. Okay? And then we're going to do it like Randy would. Okay? Be very negative about it. Just the Vogel effect is zero. You can't, can't possibly be tolerated, etc. These These next two questions will be the last. Okay. This lady is this next, lady and, and, that and then lady I'll come to to the red-haired lady. Okay, yes. please. I'll, I'll, please put it on. My question is about the uh, human biofield yes. and people like Stan who affect right. the cameras so right. amazingly. Is that genetic in your opinion, or do you think anyone can raise their Anybody. vibration through? Anybody. Well, there are genii in every field. We know that. We'll accept that. Uh, all of us have the apparatus to do it. Okay, it, you. He had to work, he practiced and prayed and did all these wonderful things for many, many, many years of his life in order to manifest these abilities. So it, it is a possibility for every single one of us. Now, at every layer of self, we radiate. The easiest one for us to pick up in today's world with today's instruments is the electromagnetic part of the biofield. That can be done straightforwardly. Equipment is expensive and complex, but still can be done. The, Next level will be this magnetic information wave level. I call it magnetoelectric energy. And then, then there'll be higher levels. And they're all manifested in our biofield. People who are good at seeing auras will see shells around yourself, um, etc. So it's all there. It, we'll get better and better at it as we go forward. But you have to give these things meaning because it's the unconscious that does most of the work. Okay, if, you, if, you're, if your mind doesn't give a thing a meaning, then your unconscious will not feed you information to enrich your understanding of these things. Okay, Thank you. last Hello. one. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you've done any experimentation with the concept of the multi-sensory human and the five-sensory human in, in respect to the right brain activity and the left brain activity. And when you're a multi-sensory person, you use right brain before left brain, and then you talk through the right brain to the left brain and manifest. That, that kind of thing is all beginning to be 
a doable thing. Yes. So people who become, who are expert in, yes. in that, as they open up yes. to this other level, because the really, the magnetic information wave yes. level is the template for yes. the growth yes, in exactly. the electric level. And so we are now have the capability to meaningfully start doing experiments because to I answer your because question. Because I work with this level yep. in yep. my daily work and what I've seen, because I can see through the body yep. and I see okay. the brain and how it works, yep. it's connected to the DNA. Right. Uh, and the uh, energy uh, helix of the DNA connected to the two physical walls is actually connect the energy uh, well, e le level in the right brain goes through the DNA okay. and then it goes okay. through the physical side. All right. That, that, that's, that's your theory. Yes. Um, and I accept theory. Right. The, but the issue is that the instruments you're using can only see the electric atom molecule right. aspect uh, of this. So truth is in the experiment. And where we can screw up is in our interpretation. So you, you have to be very careful not to get too far ahead um, of, of, that, of that circumstance. But I, I think we'll see in the next decade a tremendous growth in the possibility of doing the things you're talking about when you bring this other into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm certainly talking uh, to people involved with brain state management. And, and we're talking on uh, these levels of how to get at these things experimentally and how to get at them from a theoretical perspective. So we haven't gone very far yet, but it's, we've made a beginning. Thanks very much. All right. Let's give Mr. Tiller a hand. We are now privileged to hear a presentation by Dr. William Tiller, who's a very popular Stanford scientist, and who has spent most of his, his career uh, scientifically validating the phenomenon of intention and intuition, which of course are the centerpiece of, of these tapes. Um, Dr. Tiller's presentation is necessarily technical. They might even use a few terms that uh, would be unfamiliar to, to many. That's okay. His presentation is quite clear and serves to punctuate the very important subjects that we are exploring within these tapes. Here's Dr. Tiller. Can we have a hand for Dr. William Tiller? I say, can we have a hand for Dr. William Tiller? <laughs> so popular, Bill. Oh, what an awesome group. <laughs> In part, which illustrates how powerful mindset is. And many of you will know about these experiments done in the 30s by Slater. Uh, so forgive me if I repeat them for the others. Slater built these glasses called upside down glasses, which are made of, of a combination of lenses and prisms tied together and, and uh, so that when you put them on, you see everything upside down. Uh, and he took uh, 10 or a dozen individuals and asked them to do this. And of course, that's a very destabilizing thing to see people sort of uh, hanging upside down on what should be the ceiling. Uh, but he asked them to stay with it and keep wearing the glasses. Uh, and they did, uh, albeit with some difficulty. And somewhere between two and three weeks, one after the other, suddenly there was a flip with the glasses on. They saw everything right side up. And if they took the glasses off at that point, flip, they'd see everything upside down again. And they'd have to wait another two or three weeks before, flip, things would go back to normal and they'd see everything right side up. Well, I think that's a remarkable observation, one that should be taught to children in grade school, because it says our mindset and belief system is so strong that it creates a force acting on the 
neural dendrite system causing them to grow in such a direction as to build an inversion lens in there or a prism. I don't know what the geometry is, but the body does it. And I think we do this all the time. And of course, these days people are dealing with neural learning to try to get around various difficulties, taking advantage of that. But we're amazingly adaptive creatures. Okay, our bio body suits are. And this is how we build structure into our bio body suits. Okay? And this is why the jail is so difficult for us to get out of. Because we're building the bars by our belief structure. Now the final example on this, which I found interesting, goes back to something that Darwin wrote about in his diary. When he uh, sailed his sailing ship, the Beagle, into the harbor at Patagonia, and the Patagonians were on the shore, and they could certainly see everything that was in the harbor, but they couldn't see his sailing vessel. Pretty strange. The shaman was there, and he could see the vessel. I presume he had more elevated consciousness. And so he spent some days, some time, talking to them, explaining this piece was like that in their experience, and that piece was like that in their experience, and this piece was like something else in their experience. And after doing this for a while, suddenly the beagle just faded into view, and they saw the beagle. Okay. So it says on this path of cognitive development for us, we need building blocks that have meaning for us. See, it's meaning that we, we deal with. Right? In order to understand something, we have to translate it into a meaning and a framework. So we, if we want to do movement in new domains of cognition, we have to lay a foundation. We have to build some structures, some little building blocks or toy blocks or something. The same kind of thing we do with, with children. We put them on the floor and we give them these blocks and we say, go ahead, assemble something. And in the act of trying to assemble some things, they gain cognitive development within themselves, as we, most of you know. Um, and they build something. Well, I think that's the way it is for us with respect to these other domains. Aloha, we are with the Professor Meritas, Dr. William Tiller from Stanford University. Welcome and aloha. Aloha to you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to have you in this state. Good. You have been very famous from your knowledge and research on intuition and intention. I would say that's probably true, but there was a time when I was famous for my orthodox science. <laughs> what is the difference? Can you explain the journey? The, and the, difference, the difference is that orthodox science has a hangover from the days of Descartes. That is that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And that may have been true in the days of Descartes, but it is no longer true. Our experiments show that that is very, very wrong. It says that our science is very limited. It, it is able to do some use, some interesting things, and, but it's missing the point relative to humans. Mm -hmm. right. So this weekend, you will be giving a workshop. I will be giving basically a workshop, uh, th certainly Thursday night, at Spalding Auditorium. Between what will that be about? That will be the same general topic, but trimmed down. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I'll be talking with Q&A um, for two and a half hours on this general topic, showing how our orthodox science community uh, went astray and what is needed to get it back on track, mm -hmm. how to change the paradigm to one that is more human-oriented, uh, more consciousness-oriented, and more hopeful. And for the world will be the oriented. weekend? The weekend will now expand that picture to give chapter and verse. Much, much data, lots of explanations, how we're on the threshold of opening a door to a new universe of understanding. 
and it will be a lot of fun for orthodox science when they open their eyes and expand their wings into the new area. And, and will there be like some kind of exercises or practical application? The practical application is we have shown that all humans have their acupuncture meridian system at what's called a couple level of reality. The couple level of reality, there's two levels of physical reality which normally do not interact with each other. But using intention, it's possible to bring about that interaction. And it is the new level, which functions in the physical vacuum, that is influenced by intention. And thus, it only enters measurement reality in so, real so life. Can you help us understand and yes. practically use our yes. intentions? Yes. Because I have noticed in my yep. work as yep. emotional freedom coach, I noticed with people that they really want to learn yes. how to use the secret yes. to manifest things, to grow. I think of the secret, by the way, as preschool. Of course. Yeah. But it was very important yes. For, yes. for masses that it was. move yeah. people yes. towards. I was surprised at how many people were there. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and so will this workshop that you will give us, will this help us in our life in some way that we can move if, to if the next step or learn the, the people, how to touch yeah. intuition? People, people already have the infrastructure in themselves. They just need to practice, practice, practice. And they can change themselves from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and from a master to an avatar. Is that All of us can do for it. everyone? Yes, but maybe not in just one lifetime. I will certainly put it in front of them in, in very rich ways. Um, it's there for everybody. We all can do it. We have to care enough. We have to give it meaning. We have to be disciplined. And we have to practice. The, we have been able to we build a device to measure the change in the energy state of the room when one of these condition host intention host devices is operating in the room and ultimately we want to turn that into a biofeedback device so excuse now, me, what is intention host device it is what we do is with the intention we imprint it into a little electronic Box. Do you bring it to the workshop? Uh, I will show it. I didn't bring it. I'll tell people where they can buy one. Um, but they have to imprint it themselves. The, uh, um, and I'll show all the data. I mean, it's how we do it, how, how we imprint these things, mm -hmm. how uh, we put them to work. So there are many ways to do it. We have found a pathway which is very straightforward. Um, good science um, if one pays attention and uh, as I say it from our measurements everybody has the capability and this is the pathway for our evolution over the next we'll call it epochs of our evolutionary process um, because you soon get out of this space-time domain and into domains that are not temporal and so you can't quite use time. But if you were to count it in time, it, maybe you'd be talking about the next several million years of your existence. You will change a great deal. Which is nothing. Which is nothing. From another perspective. It, from another perspective, yes. exactly. And, and will you be able to explain maybe scientifically to people how come that Reiki works? How come that no. tapping works? We, we can, what if, is the science behind it? If people ask the questions I have, I will be talking about some of the healing work from the reconnection healing, the Eric Pearl work, because I've done measurements uh, on that and have very good data, very important. Uh, so it relates to all healing aspects. So um, I'm willing to respond to any question the audience wishes to ask. So if, if, I can. Anybody, if anybody has a question related to your personal growth, related to techniques you are using, yeah. come to this workshop on Thursday, Saturday, Saturday and, and Sunday, Sunday yes. all in UH. 
Personally, if I can ask you the question, how come EFT works? What is your research behind tapping? Why tapping works? Well, it's complex, but the issue is that tapping is producing a stimulus like succussion in uh, homeopathy. And you're tapping acupuncture points. The acupuncture meridian system is the template upon which the electric body is built. So when you tap the acupuncture point, you're going to the source of physical events in life, mm -hmm. of the body. So um, once you start, and the, and the important point is that that level of reality is already at the coupled state of reality. And I'll explain what that means in the, um, not, not right here. I have in, to use in diagrams the, in the workshop. In the workshop. More time. But, yes. but basically, when you are tapping, mm -hmm. you have an intention to make a change. Mm -hmm. And you are touching the source. Yeah, let's say for the headache. Right. Mm -hmm. You're touching the source. And so your intention becomes very strong because you're putting it into the acupuncture meridian system. And therefore, the intent, because that's the level upon which intention works in our devices. And therefore, it gets yes. to Gary the body. Craig, Gary Craig said once, he said, it doesn't, the tapping itself, yeah. it doesn't make much right. difference as the intention. And he said, you will see in few years, yeah. Yeah. nobody will tap anymore. Yeah. You don't need to. Because we will tap into inside. Exactly. You, you can hold, that's the whole point, is to hold the intention in your mind. Ultimately, we humans are the device. Everything gets built into us. We don't need training wheels. We have the capability, and when we build it into ourselves, build the infrastructure, etc. And when you build infrastructure into the body, more spirit enters. Professor Tiller. Hello and good afternoon. <laughs> I'm in Hawaii. Where, where are you right now? Now I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Oh, love Scottsdale. Beautiful place. Mm 